What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to the remastered version of What If I Was Reborn as White Hunter Smoker? Path to True Justice. Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Hum, a tall marine officer with short orange-red hair and thick brown moustache, Vice Admiral Jonathan squinted his eyes in confusion. After all, in front of him and his division lied the seven pirate ships containing the subdued Blaze Pirates, and one marine ship floating triumphantly in the middle. Jonathan, upon receiving the message that the newly established 24th Division was about to clash with Hell Blaze Diego, who was considered the head runner among the five rookies in the paradise, immediately sailed his way to Banaro. He, in truth, was expecting the complete defeat of the 24th Division, and yet, the scene in front of him suggested the exact opposite result. Vice Admiral Jonathan, Joan, standing strictly on her ship, saluted at the tall Vice Admiral. We hereby report that Hell Blaze Diego was executed on spot, and that all members of the Blaze Pirates are arrested. The Marine soldiers of Joan's division cheered loudly, though their gestures expressed exhaustion. Without a doubt, this battle was their complete victory. Jonathan, crossing his arms and tilting his head as the confusion lingered in his eyes, said, Did you really defeat Hell Blaze by yourself, Joan? It wasn't the first time that Jonathan came across Joan. And he, the man of sharp mind, was aware that her strength isn't enough to pull of a win against Diego. Joan immediately shook her head in honesty. No sir, it wasn't me, but Captain Smoker. Jonathan's eyes widened in realization. Ah, God sends disciple. Right, I remember hearing that he's returned. Then looking around, he asked, So, where is he? Joan pointed her finger at Banaro Island. He's currently leading an investigation at Banaro to determine the number of casualties and ensure that all the Blaze Pirates are caught. As Joan led the Marines to inspect the pirate ships and watch over the tied up pirates, I, taking a remarky, Cancer, and a few marine soldiers along, was currently checking up on the state of the island. Dam and Cancer, gazing at the numerous burnt corpses that were laid out all around the town, grimace isn't this too much. Aramaki, gazing at the scene with contradicting impassiveness, raised his eyebrow. First time coming across situations like this. It's pretty common since Pirate King's death, you know. I, standing silently in the middle as the marines busily moved back and forth to find those who were still alive, landed my eyes on one old woman who lied still in her own pool of blood. She, judging by her pale appearance, seemed to have died already. However, any last words? I could still feel her intent. Though it was fading away, and her upcoming death was unpreventable. Her will was latching onto her life with extreme strength as if she didn't finish her job yet. ECH, let her rest, smoker. Don't mock the dead. Cancer, frowning at my words, took out a cigarette from his pocket with his shaky hands. He attempted to light it up with his lighter, but his shaky hands didn't allow him to do so. Aramaki eventually snatched Cancer's lighter out of annoyance and lit up the blonde cigarette, ignoring Cancer's words. I lock my eyes on the old woman. However, even after some time passed, no response came. I eventually closed my eyes as I turned back, before signaling to the surrounding marines, called Joan, we're heading out kek 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 g-a-h-h-h, and all of a sudden, a hoarse laugh came from my back. All surrounding marines except me jumped back in fright, and cancer, who was trying to prevent Aramaki from stealing a cigarette from his pocket, froze in disbelief. The source of the voice was none other than that old woman. Though her body didn't move, her mouth surely did she was at her last struggle. Young snake, the time for you to soar is approaching kekeki. I shifted my eyes to my back, gazing at the old woman with narrowed eyes. Are you ready to bear the weight of the world? Marineford, October 29th, 1504 at the ever-peaceful headquarter of the Marineford, five marine warships returned triumphantly in an orderly fashion. On the ship that stood in the middle, the Marine's prides, Marine Hero Garp and Sengoku the Buddha were standing with confidence. Behind the two, there was a huge, muscular, and red-skinned man. One whom many came across a feeling of fear upon first glance. E. Douglas Bullet One Marine. Watching Garp and Sengoku's return, gulped with amazement, they actually did it. They actually caught the demon heir, the man whose strength was estimated to rival Dark King Silver's Rayleigh. Hey Sengoku. Garp, munching on his rice cracker, said to Sengoku in annoyance, Why are we bringing Bullet here? Just crash him in the impel down already. Not yet. 
Consider the public garb. Sungoku, looking ahead as their ship stopped at the port, then walked out of the ship, leaving Gart behind. The other marines, taking the hold of Bullet who was shackled all around his body by the numerous sea stone cuffs, followed the fleet admiral from the back. Immediately as Sengoku landed, Commodore Brand New who was standing at the port, saluted, We welcome the safe return of Fleet Admiral Sengoku and Vice Admiral Garp. Well ha ha, were you all worried? Garp, not bothering to get off the ship, laughed while leaning on the rail. Sengoku, on the other hand, nodded strictly before beginning his walk. Brand New, immediately walking alongside Sengoku, began his report, Fleet Admiral Sengoku, during your absence. The newly established divisions 24, 25, 26, and 27 sailed out in compliance with your orders. While the 14th Division was to target Hawkeye Dracul Mehik, and the 15th Division was to target Hellblaze Diego, the former suffered a complete loss, while the latter was attacked by Martini Hook. Both divisions had no reported survivor. Sengoku frowned, but nonetheless continued walking without a reply. On the other hand, the 24th Division, though they lost track of Red Hair Shanks, managed to land a complete victory against Hellblaze instead. The 25th Division succeeded in winning against Sir Crocodile and his entire crew, but Sir Crocodile was found to have escaped at the last moment, and his current whereabouts are unknown. The 26th Division 2 won against the overflowing Sasaki, however, was then attacked by Martini Hawk, just like the 15th Division. Finally, the 27th Division is still under the operation of tracking down Heavenly Demon Don Quixote Doflamingo in the North Blue. Sungoku, who seemed to have entered a thought of his own based on Brand New's report, then asked gravely, though his nuance suggested that he already know the answer to his question, and where is Martini Hook at the current moment? Be that, Brand New adjusted his sunglasses, expressing his nervousness, before he finally replied, along with Hawkeye Hook was found to be entering the upper stream of Red Line we speculate, that they are currently in marriage war, for the reason unknown. Sengoku's eyes were filled with many emotions, moving the huge pirate crew from Banaro all the way to the Impel Down, as well as restocking the necessary supplies for sailing at Water 7. We only managed to arrive at the Marine for just now, shortly after the arrival of Garp Sensei and Sengoku. And currently, I was standing in front of the hospital bed where two friends of mine were bedridden along with the other present colleagues of mine. One of the two, Bastille, was currently sleeping soundly, with his metal mask placed on the nearby table. There was a diagonal gash that spanned all the way from the left corner of his lips to his right eye. On the bed adjacent to his, Maynard had his entire body wrapped around with the bandages. You two, I, inspecting their state with my own eyes, muttered, what happened? Cancer was leaning against the wall, with his arms crossed. Akahand and Shu gulped at the sight of Bastille and Maynard in nervousness. Hina and Dol, standing at the back silently, gazed at two patients in a calm manner. Ain and Bin stood next to Hina and Dol, exhibiting anger at the current situation. Kof Maynard opened his mouth through the bandages, we defeated Sasaki pirates just fine. Kada was too much of a wimp, but four of us had it. Then, while we were sailing back here, they Martini pirates, suddenly attacked us out of blue. Tried fighting, but they were too much for us to handle. So we ran, and Dalmatian and Masterson died. Maynard, then clenching his bandage-covered fist, asked with an underlying anguish in tone, Smoker, if if you were present there, would all of us have survived? I, raising my head up to the ceiling, replied, I don't know. Dalmatian, he was to become the Vice Admiral in the future. Masterson, he was to quit the Marine and live as the Bounty Hunter, Daddy the Father. But at present, they were killed even before such a future came. But something is strange. Then, Hina spoke up from the back, earning everyone's attention. As I turned around to look at her, she stated, Why did the Martini Pirates travel from the New World to Paradise? Ever since their move, all that Martini Pirates have been doing was hunt down our divisions. And if you consider that his past two consisted of nothing but killing Marines, the fact that the title of Marine Hunter is given to Dracul Mihik instead of Hook Hina. I, interrupting Hina calmly, said sternly, that's enough. Everyone in the room seemed shaken by Hina's words. Martini, Hook, I thought to myself, the fellow who ended many Marine divisions in past years. Everyone speculated that he held a deep grudge against Marine, and two years ago, Fleet Admiral Sengoku wasn't able to oversee this any longer, and ordered Admiral Anastasia to hunt down the pirate. And the result was a complete failure. Hook somehow survived, and Admiral Anastasia lost her life instead. Sengoku, trying to limit the fear that the title of Martini invoked, classified him as one of the seven rookies. But that action had no effect. Judging by how Hook manages to locate his target in this fast sea every single time, there is a chance that Hook is connected with someone in the Marine. Coincidentally, all his targets are firm believers of moral justice. I shifted my eyes at Hina, who paled in the realization of what she just said out loud. Hina probably thinks that there is a betrayer in the organization, but that's not the case. As far as I can see Martini Hook works for the world government. I couldn't help but let out a dark chuckle, 
the prototype of warlords, a eh? After leaving the hospital, the first thing I did was claim my rightful bounties. 320 million for Nightmare Gecko Moria. 448 million for Hellblaze Diego. However, they are dead, and thus, your bounties were deducted by a certain portion. In total, 500 million barely. Take it or leave it, you young and rich bastard. Though I was ripped off, it wasn't of much concern to me. Exiting the building with the jealous looks of a marine who was a part of the finance department, I recalled Joan's words. In my hand were five suitcases, each containing 100 million Beely, which were given to me on spot. I suppose that this means of paying served to motivate the marines to work hard. Coupled with the income every month and the permission to move one's family into the Marineford, there were many incentives for people to join the Marine. And this was probably the reason why many adopted absolute justice as well. After all, everyone knows where the money is coming from. Ha, huh, whatever. Getting rid of such thoughts, I, now standing on the peaceful street of Marineford, stared at the setting sun. I'd rather not think about those matters right now. After the two-year-long abduction by Gup Sensei, the time has finally arrived for me to start my own division. Dark in the night, on the topmost floor of the Marineford Tower, one light bulb was still lit up. Below the bulb lied a simple wooden table that had a bottle of sake laid out on top of it. Centering the table were two men, Sengoku and Garp. I received the file that issued the establishment of your disciples' division, Garp. Sengoku, with his cheeks slightly reddened from the effect of alcohol, muttered, he really is something I have to admit at this point. Garp, letting out a light chuckle, exclaimed day by day, he improves. I still remember the day I met him four years ago, on that fateful ship where nearly all marines were wiped out. Within four years, so many things happened, and here we are, the 16-year-old marine commodore the prodigy who's given the highest expectation among his generation. Then, Garp fell into silence with his smile having died down, gazing at the table with the unusual powerlessness. Garp seemed to be reminiscing over something. Sengoku, catching this, asked knowingly, he reminds you of your son, doesn't he? Garp snorted with a small smile. Eh, as if. Dragon was always a boring fellow. And I always wondered how someone like that brat can be my son. But, I guess that they do share some similarities. Raising his eyes up and looking back at Sengoku. Garp asked, and speaking of son, don't you have one as well? That homeless boy whom you found years ago. Rosenante you mean. Sengoku too smiled before grabbing the bottle of sake and pouring it into his glass. I've hidden his surname out of fear that he may be condemned. And Rosinante, considering that his brother is the notorious criminal at the North Blue, adopted the name Rosie instead. The two of them, the ones who's been supporting Marine since Sebek's era, they've already aged to this extent. Though their bodies still held strength, the continuous waves crashing upon them eroded their will, and they knew how important the succeeding generation will be. Speaking of Rosinante, he desired his wish to join Smoker's division, Garp. And perhaps I may grant his wish. Garp expressed his interest. Oh, the two continued their heartfelt chat. Though the night was cold, they conversed with warmth and liveliness. Within the blink of an eye, October was over and came November. Having been given the time to repose and prepare myself, I was now fully energized, ready for the sea filled with unknown dangers and wild adventures. Marineford today was the same as any other day. The sun, shining above the island, provided warmth. As the clouds lazily floated by, the seagulls playfully flew around, occasionally defecating on poor victims' heads. As the gentle wind breezed past me, I felt the tickling sensation brushing on my skin. How peaceful, I couldn't help but remark inwardly. So you made a decision, eh? Gup, sitting next to me on top of one rooftop, said without a hint of his usual mischievousness. He then spoke softly, this is the real start for you, smoker. My teacher, at the current moment, seemed old like someone of his age should be. His sunken eyes contained a hollow gleam, as if showing just what kind of trials he came across throughout his life. The sea, since the past, was full of pirates even before Roger's death. And in this wild sea, sometimes, just sometimes, you find yourself lost. Within the storm, you come to wonder, what is right? What is justice? What is the point of being hailed as marine hero? For my entire life, I've been questioning myself. Garp said with a hint of sadness in his tone, and ultimately, I failed to find my way back home. I've drifted too far away, and the vigorous motive in which I joined the marine for I don't remember anymore. He then placed his huge hand on my head. Though my height was tall, he still was taller and broader than me. I thought that maybe, I will never be bigger than my teacher physical-wise. Watching you reminds me of my younger self, Smoker. Harboring an ambition larger than any other in this world, you will constantly be challenged. You may want to give up, and that hockey of yours. The world government, without a doubt, will block your way. But know this, Smoker. Gut grinned, you are my one and only disciple. And as long as you continue to identify yourself as such, removing his hand from my head and bumping my back, 
Gup stated, you aren't allowed to give up, no matter what. I grinned in response, I won't. Standing up, I adjusted the white justice coat on my shoulders. Against the wind, they, along with my white hair, fluttered gently, straightening up my back and puffing up my chest. I filled myself with determination, promising myself that canon or not, I will change this world for the better. Gup, still seated, chuckled, then go, white hunter. Stay safe, Gup sensei. I jumped from the rooftop, leisurely walking through the sky with the use of Geppo. I inspected the peaceful scenery of the Marineford with my eyes. The newly attached badge on my justice coat, which serves as the indication that I belong to the rank of Commodore, glinted brilliantly upon receiving the sunlight. And now, I landed on the deck of one adequately sized marine ship, one that will belong to the newly established 31st Division from now on. And 31st Division this was the one that I will be in charge of. Commodore Smoker. All Marine soldiers presenting strict salutes welcome my presence. Among them, there was one ten-year-old girl of short height wearing the standard Marine cap just as any other. Seaman Apprentice Arobi, upon my personal request, was placed under my command. Looking around at all my subordinates, I said in a friendly manner, is everything well? Mad Bull Aramaki, recognized for his bounty hunting works in the past as well as the victory over the Vice Captain of the Blaze Pirates, received an incredible promotion all the way to the rank of Ensign. Though we've only met each other for the short time, there was something that made us get along. I gladly welcomed him into my division, as he expressed his wish to do so. Then, there was one man with wavy blonde hair, the Marine whom I didn't get a chance to meet face to face yet knew who he was. Don quicks at Rosinante. He, introducing himself as Rosie, had the rank of Master Chief Petty Officer. I speculated that Sengoku himself placed Rosinante in my division, deeming that I, who learned from Gart, was trustworthy. And finally, there was a questionable fellow. Igar. No, no, Commodore Smoker. You got to be strict with these idiots, you know. The man with a shrewd looking appearance. He had a skinny physique and a short ponytail. Though he was much younger than is shown in the canon, without a doubt, this man was. Oh, Lieutenant Commander Condoriano Lieutenant Commander Shepard, or commonly known as Condoriano in the canon. Eh, who's Condoriano? I go by the name Shepard Commodore, Condoriano Rahaha. Aramaki, repeating after me, let out a burst of laughter. Shepard, growing a tick mark on his forehead, immediately barked at Aramaki. Are you mocking me, Ensign? Aramaki raised his eyebrow. What do you mean mocking? Can't you see that I'm greeting you in a genuine manner? Genuine Maya, so, Kandoriano, I, interrupting Shepard's outburst, asked casually. I heard that you were transferred from Vice Admiral Jonathan's division. Is that correct? Shepard, immediately straightening his pose strictly, replied immediately, Yes, sir. Jonathan, the man who becomes the commander of the Marine Base G8 in the future. If there was one detail that I recalled, it was that he was Sakazuki's protege. In other words, the one who wished to watch over me by sending Shepard may have been none other than Admiral Akane himself. Vice Admiral Jonathan is the man whom many Marines look up to. Under usual cases, I would have welcomed someone from his division. However, erasing the smile on my face, I said, that doesn't seem to be the case this time around. After all, as the commander of this ship, there is one rumor regarding Lieutenant Commander Condoriano that I cannot ignore. Taking my feet off the platform, I began to walk at a leisurely pace. Stopping in front of the still-standing Shepard, I stated, the rumor in which you attained your current rank by nothing but briberies and stealing achievements of fellow Marines. Though I didn't have complete control over who will be joining my division, I ensured to look through each and every person who was going to board my ship. As the commander, I have absolute authority over every Marine within my division, and this means that I am able to kick anyone out of my ship at any time. And I don't plan to carry a blatant deadweight like Kuzan did with Captain Happy. E pardon. Shepard expressed his nervousness. I, ignoring the man's concern, claimed a week ago. I issued a claim to the higher-ups regarding my suspicion regarding Lieutenant Commander Condoriano. Though the review is still ongoing, the blatant dislikes shown by many Marines suggest your lack of leadership. Shepard moved his mouth as if trying to refute. However, not giving him the time to speak, I asserted, henceforth, you are discharged from my division from this moment, and should you be dissatisfied with this, you are welcome to place a complaint. He seemed to be a quite famous fellow among the Marine soldiers, in a bad way. Upon my statement, I saw the brightened expressions of many on my ship. Shepard stood with a dumbfounded expression. He didn't say anything, but simply gazed at me in disbelief even as he was moved out of my ship and back to the port. Rahahaha. It was nice meeting you, Kandoriano. And as Aramaki waved at the man with an amused smile, I ordered the rest 31st Division, set sail. Everyone on the ship replied with strength in their voices. Yes, sir. Marijua. The collapse of Blaze Pirates, Crocodile Pirates, and Sasaki Pirates. When coupled with the arrest of Demon Air Douglas Bullet, and the capabilities that Admirals showcased in the New World against the catastrophes, 
The feats that Marie managed to achieve within a single month far exceeded our expectations. The five elders were seen standing up in front of the table containing various foods and drinks. Marine is needed. However, a dog who bites on its owner surely isn't. We stand in the middle of this dilemma, and as long as Marine doesn't recognize its justice this conflict will never reach a resolution. They fell into silence, with each one of them having entered a deep thought. Then, as the sun momentarily hid behind the clouds, one among them spoke. It is inevitable, it seems. Yes, another said gravely. The warlord system the world government needs another source of power that can explicitly represent our capability. As this continues, both marines and pirates will grow once more, just as rocks de Zebex era. Then, a voice suddenly spoke through the Den Den Mushy, earning the elders' attention. Why? One elder, checking his watch, remarked, They are just on time. All five of them raised their heads and stared at the huge door ahead. It slowly opened before two pirates were revealed. Welcome to the sacred land, dear pirates. Now, why don't you two take a seat? And from there, two pirates were deemed as the warlords of the sea the government-bound pirates. You are to deal with other criminals, in return for having their bounties frozen and revoked? Elders, how can this be true? Allowing the pirates to get away, I don't understand what this has to do with justice. Sungoku, hearing this outrageous news, will personally contact the five elders and complain. Yet, the only answer he will receive, is that the all-out assaults of Marine this year, accentuated the organization's limitations in restricting the influence of the catastrophes, and that additional force is needed to restore the balance though. In truth, the purpose of the Warlords is to restrict the influence of Marine instead. Damn IT and in the hospital of Marineford, Maynard will let out a fit of rage, with the target of his vengeance, Martini Hook, having become the Warlord. The Steel, having regained consciousness, will become doubtful of the world government's incomprehensible action. Hina's suspicion of the world government will deepen. And meanwhile, November 5th, 1504 G2, I'm back. In front of my site lied Marine Base G2, which was restored after the tragedy two years ago. However, unlike the last time, I was the leader of this ship. Rahahaha. What's with you tripping all of a sudden, Rosie? Oh, the floor is too slippery, Ensign Aramaki. Ignoring the ongoing chatters at the back, I thought to myself, there was the establishment of warlords, though the number only amounts to two at the current moment. Also, judging by the continued stalemate in the new world, Sengoku may soon order a withdrawal there especially, with the marine slowly losing control over paradise. Assistant. Robin, wearing a standard marine uniform, a cap, and fashion glasses, stepped up, yes Commodore Smoker. What's the situation of Lelusia Kingdom? Robin replied calmly, the small revolts from here and there have suddenly arisen. Though the specific detail is unknown, the marines dispatched from G2 were wiped out. This brought the complication of G2 lacking enough force to deal with the continued flux of pirates, as well as the growing resistance at the Lelusia Kingdom. Lelusia Kingdom, in proximity with G2 and Mamwaro the island, that contains Kamabaka Kingdom under Emporio of Ankov's rule. Resistance. Revolution. Revolutionary Army. Emporio of Ankov. If so, Monkey D Dragon. Hey! I found myself grinning. Things are about to get interesting. Welcome, Commodore Smoker, or should I say, welcome back to the Hell Hole. Within G2, I stood in front of the current commander of the base, Vice Admiral Kommel, the middle-aged man with a hairstyle that reminded me of Hahachi. The eyes, which were headed at me, were filled with exhaustion. I lowered my head slightly, Vice Admiral Kommel. We don't have much time to relax around. I'll get straight on point right away. Kommel turned around and glanced over his messy office table. From the pile of papers, he picked up one specific sheet of paper. I'm sure that you were given the gist of what's going on right now. Nodding in response, I stated what I know of G2 is facing the horde of pirates from the front with them looking down on this base, due to the incidents two years ago by Goldtooth Vane. Simultaneously, Lelusia Kingdom is showing signs of rebellion, and as per the request of King Barnan, the force from G2 was stationed there who were all found dead just a week ago. Victorious. That idealistic fool. Even at death, he's nothing but a nuisance. Those simplistic pirates. Looking down on the might of G2 the situation currently is troublesome, really. Kommel muttered with a frown, with his eyes locked on the paper in his hand and requesting an additional force even after that. You are fucking kidding me. Kommel angrily ripped the paper into pieces, before throwing the scraps away from his hand. Then, shifting his eyes on me, he growled, forget about helping or subduing Lelusia whatsoever. Your role is simple, Commodore Smoker, Vice Admiral in front of me seemed full of rage. And it wasn't the rage based on injustice, but rather, on his tarnished reputation. Investigate as to who took the lives of my men and punish them. Without exhibiting any emotion, I replied, yes sir. November 7th, 1504 broken and withered such was the state of the empty port in which we docked our ship onto. The Lelusia kingdom that lied ahead of our sight, seemed lifeless with the scrawny civilians powerlessly walking across the street. 
Their eyes revealed nothing but starvation, and even after sighting our arrival, the commoners their demeanors remained the same. What a strange scene it was, for in contrast to this lifeless world, the lively vegetation and sunny weather suggested nothing but peace. What's going on? The report indicated only the small revolts, and not this horrendous state how can a dystopia like this be considered a kingdom even? Robin, standing behind me, muttered with anguish. This is stupid. Aramaki bickered, was Luluja Kingdom ever attacked by the pirates? The answer to Aramaki's question was no. Luluja Kingdom, being in proximity with G2, wasn't susceptible to pirate invasions, after all. Examining the scene and grabbing Rosinante by the back of his uniform to prevent his fall, I ordered 31st Division spread throughout the island and retrieved the staffed ones. An investigation is to follow only after the civilians are given the necessary treatments. Meanwhile, I will be away to visit the king, and should any complication arise, report to Ensign Aramaki. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I didn't speak any further. Receiving firm replies from my subordinates, I immediately dashed off to the huge castle that lied right in the middle of the kingdom. And traveling by air, I glanced at the blurry scene around me with narrowed eyes. While doing so, I noted that the layout of this enormous kingdom is unnecessarily messy and complicated. The lack of investment led to this pitiful state, which ironically provided the rebels with good sights to hide. Then, I stopped on top of one roof upon sighting one man wearing a black cloak. He, standing in the street afar from my current position, clearly had his eyes placed on me and the emanating haki from his body. It suggested that this man wasn't a normal fellow. Then, he turned and walked away, as if telling me to follow. I briefly looked at the castle that I was heading to, before changing my course and dashing toward the man. With Smoker's departure, the rest of the marines quickly dispersed throughout the kingdom, except for Robin and Rosinante, who remained to secure the ship. And Aramaki, who initially ran forth with excitement, was currently standing with a raised eyebrow. In front of him lied numerous royal guards, who all draped exquisite-looking armors around their bodies. And behind the royal guards was a huge wooden door. They were currently guarding the big warehouse where the food was stored. And currently, something seemed strange in Aramaki's eyes their demeanors. Hey, ha 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 marines again, go back, idiots. All of you were so laughably weak there's no difference whether you come or not. They spoke in a regal and unkempt way. And Aramaki, having traveled across various areas of the world, knew that mannerism is an important aspect of royal guards, for they are the face of the kingdom. The royal guards, laughing and wildly swinging their weapons around, joked among themselves, you remember that time when I placed an apple on that guy's head? You tried to hit it, but failed horribly. He he he, I bet that those marines never experience a fun like that. One royal guard then grinned, revealing his missing teeth. This served to increase Aramaki's suspicion. Seemingly young, yet missing many teeth already. As far as I can see a symptom of scurvy. But scurvy was commonly seen among the sailors and adventurers, but not among these royal guards who are usually well fed. Oi, Aramaki finally spoke up, with many marine soldiers standing behind him. Are you guys really the royal guards? One of the royal guards snorted. What, are you blind? If we aren't the royal guards, then what are we? Another simply sighed with a feigned disappointment, before rotating his index finger around his temple for the purpose of mocking Aramaki. Ignore them, buddy. There are all sorts of people in this world, and some tend to be unbelievably stupid. Aramaki, growing a tick mark on his forehead, bumped his fists as a grin slowly made its way onto his face. Commodore didn't say anything in regards to beating up some pompous bastards, right? One marine soldier, who seemed nervous by Aramaki's evident anger, answered warily, E. Ensign Aramaki, I'm not sure if this is the safe choice boom. Then, a cannon was shot from nowhere all of a sudden, crumbling down one side of the warehouse. The nearby royal guards have all knocked away from the site, and as the smoke rose from the area of impact, few few finissi shot. One big-headed man with curly blue hair, wearing a very revealing attire and feminine makeup, laughed while supporting a cannon on his shoulder. On his left stood a huge man with bear-like prints on his palms, and behind the two of them stood many civilians, who were holding weapons of their own. ECHU weirdo thieves again, after all those failures. The big-headed makeup man then clenched his heart, out your words damaged my heart I I. The huge man simply stared forward emotionlessly, having been used by his companion's antics. I'm fine, not bothering with the strange action of the big-headed man, the royal guards, immediately grabbing their own weapons, locked the newly generated hole into the warehouse. One among them turning his head to Aramaki and the other marines, shouted, Hey you marines help us as well. The huge man, then calmly turned his eyes at Aramaki and narrowed his eyes, Marine wasn't supposed to be part of our plan. Aramaki, with his hands in his pockets, frowned. Tilting his head in displeasure, Aramaki turned his head and asked his subordinate, Hey? What do you think we should do? I, I, the Marine stuttered nervously, um, help the Royal Guards. Hum. Aramaki closed his eyes as if thinking, with his arms crossed. Then, he sat down on the ground. Nah. 
Opening his eyes, he stated, until Commodore Smoker orders, I'm going to do nothing. But watch Aramaki had to stop. Boom. Boom. The earth vibrated as a ridiculously muscular man made his way from afar with a great sword on his shoulder, while wearing a golden armor. This man was even bigger than the huge man with bare paw-like prints on his palms. And Aramaki, with his eyes widened, muttered, warm of the big force. Aramaki immediately stood back up with his fists clenched, unable to comprehend the scene unveiled in front of him. Captain General Warmog. On the other hand, the Royal Guard's faces brightened up in relief. Oh ho mad bull. Long time no see. Warmog, snorting in amusement, said while slamming down his huge greatsword, since when did you become a marine? Rahahaha Aramaki growled, and since when did you become a general? Things happen, my friend. Warmog, as if uninterested, turned his head away from Aramaki. Facing the rebels, he then said with his deep voice and a piece of advice, Know that I'm in the right at the current moment, and not these criminals in front of me. Upon Warmog grinning devilishly, the big-headed man and bare poor man revealed a serious gleam, and the atmosphere suddenly became intense. We don't have much time. I stood in the dark alley, as the man wearing dark cloak muttered with his back facing me. He, turning his face slightly, placed his black-colored eyes on me. Sifa poles are deep in this kingdom, and soon enough, they will come to question my whereabouts even with my friends buying some time. I, with my hands in my pockets, said impassively, then speak. What is it that you wish to relay? The man fully turned. On the left side of his face lied a strange tattoo pattern, and straight from one glance. I knew that the man standing in front of me was none other than Monkey D. Dragon himself. He then opened his mouth, White Hunter Smoker, recently promoted to the rank of Commodore. I've been monitoring you for a while, and deemed you credible to some extent. I am the leader of the Revolutionary Army, and that's all that you have to know for now. Dragon stated seriously, currently, this kingdom is rotten. The previously wise king, Barnan, has fallen into the world of pleasures, and pillaged all wealth and goods from civilians for his entertainment. And the royal guards who you will soon come across are the pirates. I listened with an equally serious demeanor, as Dragon continued speaking, the War Mob Pirates. They are affiliated with the huge underworld organization that has been rising recently. The leading figure of the organization goes by the alias of Joker, and his main means of profit is none other than the human auction shop where King Barnan is one of the known VIPs. These pirates were provided by Joker as the service, but I am sure that Joker has an ulterior motive. Joker. Dragon's words made me surprised. So Don Quixote Doflamingo is behind this. I asked, what is it that you want from me? I want you to hear the pleas of those civilians. Open your eyes and see for yourself Dragon turning around, then began to walk away of what it truly means to be righteous. In one room, a man wearing a black tuxedo held onto a dial connected to the Den Den Mushi. From a Den Den Mushi, a voice was spoken and the location of the base. The man asked, basement of the building named Hank's Funny Drink. Then, the Den Den Mushi suddenly seemed nervous. Why, of course, Seeky. The man replied coolly, we aren't some scums but the agents serving the world government CP8. Rest assured. Bam. Robin sighed as she saw the blonde man, Rosanante, falling for the NTH time. It's as if you live in a world entirely different from mine, Master Chief Petty Officer Rosie. Robin deadpanned, the world without friction, that is. Rosanante, scratching his head as he sat up, said, don't mind me. Happens from time to time. Without Robin willing to take the conversation further, the silence returned to the ship. A ten-year-old girl, was she? And now, Rosanante watched solemnly as Robin grabbed the binocular and climbed up to the crow's nest TCH. Isn't that damn too much? A kid should be playing and laughing around instead of acting like an adult here. He took out a cigarette from his pocket and lit it up with a lighter of his possession. Taking a puff out of it, Rosanante thought, and as I expected, Celestial Dragons my lineage is evil, and now you've set yourself aflame. E-A-H-H-H. Rosanante let out a shocked cry upon hearing Robin's remark. His attire was burning in hot fire, and he, unable to bear the sudden heat, jumped to the ground and began rolling in a comedic manner. Robin shook her head before bringing the binocular to her eyes. And subsequently, as Rosanante finally extinguished the fire, she informed Henson. Aramaki and the rest seemed to be returning, along with the civilians as ordered. Rosanante, lying on the ground with smokes rising from his body, couldn't bother himself to remark. Robin, ignoring Rosanante's state, muttered, the civilians behind them are quite numerous, but within the expectations. Now, the question is why is Ensign Aramaki being carried by others? Desolate. Such was the word that appeared in my mind as I traveled across the empty street. Though the building stood in the bright sunlight illuminated the aesthetic scenery from high up. There existed this sense of hollowness within this kingdom. This world surely is vast I couldn't help but think there are countless islands and the world government isn't omniscient. They deemed that rather than taking over control over trillions of people, setting up the rulers above them, 
and grouping them together under the name of world government is more efficient. And currently, here I was inside the castle filled with luxury in contrast to the kingdom as a whole. Lul, welcome to my kingdom, dear Marine. In front of me, at some levels above, there lied a huge throne. On top of the throne sat an obese man wearing an exquisitely designed crown King Barnan, the ruler of the Lelusia kingdom. However, Barnan wasn't what gained my attention. Rather, my attention was on the numerous women with collars around their necks. They were kneeling in two rows, filled with despair and expectation that nothing will change. Ah. I see that you've taken an interest in my slaves, Lulul. They are of the finest grades attained from the infamous human auction shop in Sabadi Archipelago. A plebeian like you will never have enough to enjoy something like this, Lulululululul. Are you jealous? Barnum laughed boisterously as he raised up the left side of his hip and let out a loud fart. Then, he snatched a bottle of liquor that lied nearby him and said, Meh, but let's get down to the business. You see, I've heard a good deal about you. People call you White Hunter, eh? Pretty cool title, I'm not gonna lie. But do you know what title I go by? It's much cooler than you. Not bothering to reply, I stood silently with my hands placed in my pockets. Barnan, after a moment of pause, said, It's White Sprayer Lululu ha 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 ha. As if trying to please the king, all the royal guards and slaves laughed in an exaggerated manner. In contrast, my lips didn't move a single millimeter. Anyway, the previous marines were freaking weak. That that, uh, Kommel was here. That Jude kept sending me defects, for fuck's sake. I really hope that you're different. Barman took a gulp from the liquor before continuing. Sifa Sifa Polo. Those Judes came over recently, so work with them to kill off every single leech out of my kingdom, you got that? I didn't respond, but stood still. Barnan, upon waiting for a few seconds, raised his eyebrow from my lack of response. Then, oh, my bad, what did you say again? I, having woken up from my days, asked, I followed until welcome to my kingdom part, but lost my concentration after W. R. Barnan, growing a tick mark on his forehead, barked, that's right from the beginning, before aggressively throwing the bottle at me. I casually took a hold of the flying bottle, and took a whiff of it, thank you, but no thank you. I shouldn't be drinking during work, before throwing it back at the king. The king, not managing to catch it as I did, had the bottle smash into his face. The smashed bottle then shattered into numerous shards, and from the impact alone, the king fainted with a bleeding nose. H H H H, King Barnan. The royal guards who stood at the edges of the room, had their jaws dropped and eyes popped out. The female slaves too turned their faces and looked at me in disbelief. I, rubbing the back of my head, stated casually, that wasn't my fault. King could have caught that. That's definitely your fault shrugging. I turned around and began to walk out, I'm done reporting my arrival. We'll get going now. The previous marine divisions were wiped out by the Revolutionary Army Revolutionary Army began their revolt based on the king's corruption and tyranny, and the world government began to recognize the rebellion. Coupled with Doflamingo's involvement there surely is a lot going on here. Exiting through the huge gate, I was met with the sight of one huge fellow, holding on to a greatsword. He was wearing shiny golden armor, and right from the go, I recognize him, warm of the big fools. Wanted dead or alive for 50 million Beely. Unlike his bulky outward appearance, he was an expensive hitman who worked in the underworld, and a bounty of 50 million. It was given to him after the well-known clash against Aramaki a year ago. The clash that also brought Aramaki to fame as the Mad Bull. Why? Aren't you that Commodore Smoker, the talk of the world? Warmog, leaning down on me, chuckled in amusement. Then, he held his huge hand out to me. I'm General Warmog, the protector of this kingdom. I really do look forward to working with you, friend. However, I didn't accept the man's hand. Ignoring his presence, I instead resumed walking. Then, Warmog spoke once more. Oh, and by the way, do make sure to keep the leash on your ball tight, you heel heel. It seemed a little loose this time around, you know Warmog stopped his words. I, turning my head slightly, was gazing at him coldly. And there it was the rising surge of Haki which rendered Warmog petrified on his spot with a subconscious fear within him. Finding it worthless to even speak one word, I turned and resumed my way, leaving Warmog by himself. Nearby the shore where one marine ship was docked, many people were found. Most of them were civilians who were gobbling up a certain portion of food that was freshly cooked by the cooks of the 31st Division. For the first time in a long while, they were laughing and letting out tears of joy as they filled their stomachs full. How much did we use? Rosinante, standing next to Robin, whispered to her. Robin, adjusting her fashion's glasses, looked down at the paper in her hands and replied, All. But it's fine, Commodore Smoker said, we can rip off from the kingdom. Robin raised her head up, and speaking of the devil, 
Here he is, Commodore Smoker. The Marines, recognizing their commander, saluted strictly. Smoker, walking through them impassively, inspected the civilian-filled scenery around him. Currently, the sun was setting by, and through the orange light that illuminated the gradually darkening surrounding, Smoker's eyes landed on the green head subordinate, Aramaki. A Commodore Smoker, Aramaki waved his hand with a tired grin on his face, mission accomplished, Rahahaha. Smoker, leaning down to inspect Aramaki's injured state with narrow eyes, asked, what happened? Aramaki, sighing with the grin still intact on his face, explained, the executives of the rebellion made their appearance. One looked like a huge bear, while the other one was big-headed. They briefly clashed with General Warmog before fleeing. Hey, my words are getting long, isn't it? He nodded his head at one boy who was eating on his side. I didn't intervene in the fight between the royal force and rebellion. After the fight was over, when this boy accidentally stumbled upon their way, those so-called royal guards were about to kill him. I had to intervene. I found myself grinning as I heard Aramaki's explanation. Standing back up, I patted the injured man's shoulder. Well done. Take some rest. Moving away from him, I walked to Rosanante and Robin both, who were concealing their true identities. Commodore Smoker. Rosanante and Robin both saluted upon my arrival. Upon my nod, Robin dropped her strict act and casually handed me the paper. The words of civilians all match. All previously arrived marines were killed by the rebellion as we expected. And these people consider themselves as strays, with them despising the king for his tyranny, as well as the rebellion for their cruel deeds of murdering marines. Robin stated in a monotone, but there was an error in our information as well. In contrast to what the king said, the marines were all captured alive and executed yesterday instead of weeks ago. Murdering marines? Huh? I, returning the paper back to Robin, raised my head up and gazed at the night sky, full of bright stars. Kommel said, and according to that order, my target should be the Revolutionary Army. However, such were the words spoken by Dragon. Righteous, you said, Dragon. Righteous, the ideal to which I adhered by. I acted according to what my mind told me was right or wrong, but I knew that in the end, there is no such thing as absolute righteousness. Then what exactly does it mean to be right here? To listen to the pleas of civilians as you say and kill you. But, I feel that something is missing here. It was as if Dragon himself wasn't aware of his current reputation. By telling me to listen to pleas of civilians, he probably meant to persuade me not to oppose him. Back then, I could tell that he was being genuine. Executed yesterday who benefits from killing the Marines. Then, ten individuals, all wearing black suits, appeared within my sight. They, walking with silent steps, were approaching my division and me. And from first glance, I recognized Sifapol, the ones who publicly gained the justification to attack the Revolutionary Army. Until previously, Revolutionary Army was in the righteous with their goal to overthrow the corrupt king's rule. And now, they were instead portrayed as lawless murderers, and the world government was in the right. They, stopping in front of me, bowed elegantly, Commodore Smoker. I watched them with sharpened eyes, and I was quite certain that there are spies in the Revolutionary Army. In front of Smoker, Marines, and civilians, the men in black suits raised their bodies up. We belong to Sifapol number 8, and currently are in process of restoring order to the Kingdom of Lelusia. The one in the middle who wore round glasses stated, and I, currently in charge of leading this operation, go by the name Garfield. Please, there is no reason to be cautious of us. Placing his hands on his back, the man, Garfield, looked around him. Many marine soldiers visibly relaxed. The civilians initially seemed confused. But after seeing that the marines around them relaxed, they too followed the suit. However, not the same could be said for the four. Smoker, Aramaki, Rosanate, and Robin. They, maintaining impassiveness, didn't let a single slip of emotion. Garfield eventually resumed talking, for... A few weeks, we've been investigating the grim state of this island. The revolts, the anguish of citizens, and the pirates who claim themselves to be the royal guards. We've seen the harsh treatments that people were receiving and deemed that the King Barnan has corrupted beyond the point of redeeming. And, said Smoker, the world government sides with justice, and so do the Marine. Naturally, we will aid the rebellion. However, there lies one complication. Just as Garfield said so, one agent next to him walked forth and handed Smoker three pieces of paper. On those papers, there were rough sketches of three individuals, Dragon, Ivankov, and Kuma. Though we are yet to know their specific background information, those three are the Nishon-level terrorists who claim themselves to be the so-called Revolutionary Army. They, for nothing but gruesome satisfaction, murdered all Marines that were caught by them and were in process of manipulating the citizens to lead this kingdom to absolute destruction. 
A lie smoker immediately thought, there is no reason for Dragon to kill the Marines. Instead, keeping the Marines caught and treating them well would be better for him, for he can appeal his goodness. Garfield, adjusting the glasses, spoke through Smoker's thought, therefore, there is the need to oppose both the kingdom, protected by Warmog the Big Force, as well as to catch Dragon, Ivankov, and Kuma. And, I admit the strength of CP8 isn't enough to handle such powerhouses at once, we require your help. Smoker lowered his head, seemingly in deep thought. Then, after a brief moment, he raised it back up with a calm demeanor and asked, What's the plan? Oh, the plan already has proceeded. Garfield finally expressed a smile after hearing Smoker's implied acceptance. The rebellion space changes every day, and in this maze-like kingdom, locating it is nigh impossible. However, we've received the intel just today of their current base, Hank's funny drink, and have begun the operation to catch a Den Den Mushy that one of the other CP8 agents was holding, suddenly cried, cutting off Garfield's words. My apologies. Garfield, who seemed puzzled by the sudden call, reached his hand out to the dial of the Den Den Mushy, and brought it up, CP8 Garfield here. Sorry. The information that Marines were killed by the Rebellion was supposed to be the device of lure. We've set up in such a way so that when the additional Marines arrive as the backups, we'd be able to showcase the still alive Marines, and publicly spread that we are the ones in the right. Yet, dark in the night, at the back alley, four individuals were present. One among them, Siki, was trembling in fear as he received the glares from the other three. Dragon, Ivankov, and Kuma. Dragon, trying to suppress the rage within him, whispered, someone decided to kill them all of a sudden, for no reason in particular. I was already aware that there is the possibility of spy infiltrating our revolutionary army. However, to think it would be you out of all, Siki Dragon was the man with a good hunch. The first whom he came to suspect after discovering the Marine's deaths was none other than Siki, the executive of the Revolutionary Army, along with Dragon himself, Ivankov, and Kuma. And Siki, being the citizen of this kingdom, knew the ins and outs very well, and therefore was responsible for determining the daily base for a brief gathering. Every day, he was to determine a base and report to Dragon, to which Dragon will then relay to Ivankov and Kuma, and ultimately, the civilians. Tonight, Dragon didn't follow such a procedure. Even after receiving the information regarding the place determined as the daily base from Siki, he didn't relay it to anyone. And there it was, the abrupt influx of CP8 agents into the building meant to be the base, ultimately confirming that Siki was the spy. Siki, you bastard of Ankov, expressing raw anger, was currently struggling under Kuma's hold. I will fucking new to you, Uru. Calm down, Ivankov. But having spy this close to us means Kuma said gravely, our identities must have been revealed. Siki, the blonde man with a skinny figure. He, whose eyes teared up from fear and whose bottom half was drenched from his own urine, forced a grin onto his face. Why you you guys can't kill me? Dragon, whose eyes gave off the murderous gleam, walked towards Siki upon hearing his fear-filled mockery. Siki gulped, but nonetheless continued, Our revolutionary army. Screw that all that we W wanted was the better life, and not tee this this sort of fighting against the entire world. D do you think we are dumb enough to follow your plan? Dragon froze. He then muttered, We. Yes, we Siki cried with his fists clenched. I'm not the spy everyone in the rebellion is with me. They decided to make me the king of Lelusia and the Sifopoles they promised me that Leluja will still be allowed to be a member of the world government Siki met his eyes with dragons. Forcing his grin to a greater extent, he said, so who's in the wrong here? Who's trying to disrupt our peace by bringing a life into the greater battlefield? Who's trying to make us fight against the world government and bring us into the inevitable doom? He pointed at Dragon and growled, you it's you, Dragon Dragon, Ivankov, and Kuma stood still, not replying to Siki's outburst. However, in contrast to their still outward appearance, their inner side was in turmoil. Currently they felt nothing but disgust toward humanity. So you can't kill me. Siki whispered once again. If you are the self-righteous revolutionary army as you claim, you can't kill me. The king who will bring this kingdom to peace. Ivankov has long stopped thrashing in Kuma's hold. Kuma, turning his head to Dragon, asked stoically, What now, Dragon? Dragon closed his eyes with a grim expression. Then, opening them back up, he muttered, We retreat. Has Siki been discovered? Garfield, ending the call, whispered to himself. Then, as he adjusted his black hat, said to Smoker, Our apologies. It seems that something has gone wrong. But it is only trivial. Smoker, without any word, silently sat down on a rock. And as he supported his chin under his hands, his eyes were shadowed from Garfield's point of view. Tomorrow, a huge revolt will arise, and all civilians, along with us, will attack the castle. King Barnan will be arrested for the crime of joining hands with pirates. If Siki is alive, he will be nominated as the new king to represent the Lelouja kingdom. Dragon, on the other hand, are you capable of tracking them down? CP8. Smoker then asked, cutting off Garfield's words. Garfield's eyes narrowed, truthfully speaking, no. But based on your nuance of speaking, 
I assume that you must have a way to do so. Smoker, raising his gaze, met his eyes, which were flashing in crimson red with Garfield. They are currently on the run, and in due time, they will be gone. Smoker said seriously, However, just as you said, letting them go like this is unfavorable. Aramaki. Upon Smoker's call, Aramaki, who stood back up while unwrapping the bandages around his body, replied with a grin, What's up, Commodore? That warm of the big force you will be in charge of dealing with him tomorrow. And this time around, do ensure to go all out. Aramaki bumped his fists together, Roger that. The rest of you are to follow Ensign Aramaki's command. And meanwhile, I... Then everyone saw the wisps of smoke rising from Smoker's body. We'll be chasing after Dragon. Before swoosh, his form blurred out from the scene. Peace. A Dragon, filled with emptiness, walked forth with Ivankov and Kuma by his sides. Each step felt heavy to take, yet he continued to walk. The moon was shining above them. However, even the moon itself seemed gloomy. The starry night it gave Dragon many thoughts. The revolutionary army its purpose is to end the world government's tyranny. Their unreasonable crimes are gone ignored, and they claim themselves to be the justice dragon sometimes felt as if everyone had a different view than him, that they were looking at the world too optimistically. Luluja Kingdom. How laughable dragon thought, King Barnum was once a good man. He rose to the throne with the intention not to repeat the evil deeds of his father, and yet, he eventually turned out to be worse. And Siki, I doubt that you possess the will to resist the world government's corruption. But what happened has already happened. Dragon, in the end, decided to leave Siki untouched. Yes, it may seem foolish. However, Dragon was a kind man by nature. The decision to build revolutionary army was based out of noble intention to prevent the world government's tyranny, such as the Ahara incident. If the people of Luluja decided that they don't need him then so be it, he thought. Well, it surely was a wild experience, Dragon muttered causing Ivankov and Kuma to look at him. And few few for you aren't wrong about that part. Ivankov chuckled in response. Kuma, Though he didn't say anything, let out a slight smile. Dragon, gazing up at the bright moon, said, I suppose that it's time for us to return and take some rest. Not so fast, Dragon. A masculine voice was heard from the back all of a sudden, interrupting Dragon. The three of them immediately turned back and sighted, Smoker, the white-haired man with the justice coat draped around him. Cher, Ivankov, along with Kuma, immediately lowered their postures in caution. Dragon, on the other hand, gazed at Smoker impassively, who looked back at him with an equal amount of calmness. Smoker, Dragon said solemnly, Are you here to catch us? Smoker, in response, smiled as he shook his head. Then, with his hands in his pockets, he said, No. Instead, Ivankov and Kuma, confused by Smoker's lack of hostility, raised their eyebrows. I've come to bargain. Hey, bargain, you say. The wind, it slowly began to pick up around us. It sure is interesting to hear such words from someone whom I've only met once before, and from a 16-year-old youngster. Dragon's eyes were locked with mine, and though it was the dark night time, I could clearly see his eyes filled with conqueror's might. I found a slight chill down my spine. Monkey D. Dragon, his haki stood a few levels above mine. However, the marine is no different than the world government. By telling you previously to seek righteousness, I meant to imply the wind brushed past me and my coat flapped wildly from it. It felt cold and dangerous as if trying to remind me of whom I am facing right now. That you forsake your status as a marine. The wind ferociously swirled around us, and I could feel the overwhelming pressure from the leader of the revolutionary army. Whether the wind was the manifestation of this man's will or his mysterious devil fruit I had no idea. Marine is incapable, smoker. Your folks relentlessly chase after the crimes cited from afar, yet turn a blind eye to ones that occur right in front. You may be a good man, but still, Dragon stated firmly, with Ivankov and Kuma standing on his left and right, I have no intention to work with a group of hypocrites Dragon. He must have traveled around the world. He must have seen many cases where the world government exerts tyranny over civilians, while claiming that those acts are done under the name of justice. And I, sailing and combating the pirates for a few years, was also aware of how broken this world was. In essence, Dragon and I were quite similar. Within the wind, wisps of smoke were seen. They, slowly immersing in the wild wind without any resistance, began to swirl along. A strange phenomenon, Dragon seemed to be thinking. Then Dragon and his friends realized that I go by the title of White Hunter Smoker, the user of smoke smoke fruit. Paz. Dragon's eyes widened. That subtle yet jolting sensation he must have felt it, of what I was hiding within me. You Dragon's eyes narrowed, you possess an ambition of your own, even when you're a marine. There is nothing absolute in this world, Dragon. I said while grinning slowly. Though Dragon's haki was ferocious, it failed to make me yield against, there is only so much that a person can do, and a change is inevitable. And in this world, there are no gods in this world, but instead, pretenders. Those pretenders aren't capable of resisting the flow. I raised my hand up and pointed at the dark sky. And I will be blatant as the moon, which was shining brightly, was momentarily covered by the clouds that floated by. I declared, 
I plan to bring down the sky. Ivankov and Kuma flinched in shock. Dragon's eyes widened in disbelief. I don't seek justice. I don't look for ways to justify my calls. I simply walk according to the direction in which my heart guides and it tells me that this world can be improved. The wind died down, and the whistling sounds in my ears disappeared. The sky, still hidden by the clouds, rendered my surrounding even darker. In this state, Dragon said, in this state, Dragon said, a bold statement, young Marine. A plan to break through the ranks and end the world government as a Marine of all possibilities quite daring. Aren't you Dragon seem to be contemplating? Ivankov and Kuma, not saying a word, stood silently by. And after some time passed, he finally asked, what bargain are you here to offer, smoker? I grinned as I replied, the issue that I considered to be of greatest concern at the current moment, the despair-filled eyes of those shackled women. The upcoming slavery of Boa Hancock and her sisters if I were not mistaken. Joker or Dom quicks at Doflamingo pulling strings from the back. I believed that I could prevent them from happening. Slavery. Next morning geez. What a wild night it was, Rosanate. Leaning on the rail of the marine ship, mumbled while looking around the kingdom. Strange. That sudden storm was quite extreme, to the extent that most of the noises were muffled by it. I expected huge destruction, but everything seems fine. Down the deck, on the solid ground, the marine soldiers were standing in an orderly manner. In front of them, Aramaki was found yawning. Next to them, there were a group of men wearing black suits. EP8. Their leader, Garfield, was found talking over Den Den Mushi. Then, he finally ended the call and stood up before notifying Aramaki. Still no sign of Commodore Smoker. We can only hope that he's fine. Aramaki snorted, of course he'll be. Throw away those useless words, he already told me to handle the operation on this island after all, meaning that he anticipated a long battle. Garfield sighed while placing his hand under his chin. Anyhow, this serves as a proof that the combined strength of Dragon, Ivankov, and Kuma reaches the level of Nightmare Gecko Moria and Hellblaze Diego. The rise of new criminals at the current state of the sea the age of the great pirates is gruesome to deal with. Rosanate, dropping down from the ship, said seriously, there is no point waiting then, is there? Garfield nodded silently. Aramaki, grinning excitedly, said, Rahahaha, nope, we're heading out. Now, Robin, who was standing among the marine soldiers, thought, replacing the king who has become corrupt. King's main source of entertainment is purchasing slaves from the human auction shop. Human auction shop is run by Joker, the rising figure in the underworld. But the thing is, she gazed at the Cipherpole agents with a well-hidden contempt. The main customers of that human auction shop are the Celestial Dragons themselves. And by supporting the rebellion here, you, the world government, are admitting that slavery is wrong. You know that it's wrong, but continue nonetheless. Hypocrites how disgusting. The Marines began to march along with the CP-8 agents, with their weapons held in their hands. As they entered the street, one among the agents whistled. Upon the signal, many civilians revealed themselves from various buildings, filled with determination. It was a fascinating number, and some became awed at the grand gathering. By the time they reached the castle, the number has become countless. Good to see that you're fine, Siki. And in the front, next to Aramaki and Garfield, there stood a skinny blonde, Siki. He laughed haughtily, C.A.C. Asia. Of course I am. Facing against them were Warmog the Big Force, and his crew the ones who currently went by the title of Royal Guards. Warmog narrowed his eyes at Aramaki and Garfield. How? Come you folks are siding with the rebellion. Garfield stepped up and unscrolled a paper scroll in his hands. He then read, For years, King Barnan has forsaken his role as the monarch. He committed the unforgivable and atrocious acts of working with pirates to plunder the goods of his very own citizens. The world government expresses its grief that this injustice was only discovered only recently, and henceforth we declare that King Barman is to be dethroned and arrested. Warmog fell silent as Garfield stated loudly. Then, placing his hand over his eyes, he, ha, began to laugh loudly. Ha 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 Warmog muttered. Oh, Joker, it went just as you predicted. I can't believe it ha 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 the Marines, CP8 agents, and civilians watched Warmog's demeanor in confusion. Warmog, ignoring them, then took out his greatsword and pointed it at them. Eh, pretty amusing, isn't it? Warmog smiled devilishly. I won't speak any further. Since you dared to do so, come all at once, puppets. Unknown location under the bright sky. At the shore of one mysterious island, one tall man with short blonde hair with flamingo-like attire and sunglasses was lying on a lounge chair. On his left hand was a glass filled with cocktail, while his other hand held onto a dial connected to the Den Den Mushy. Heavenly demon Don quicks at Doflamingo. He was one of the well-known seven rookies but at the same time, the enigmatic Joker of the Underworld. Currently, he was chatting with someone. Ah, so the war has finally begun. Doflamingo expressed his delight. Fafafafu did Warmog ask for any support. Hey, good. Doflamingo grinned after taking a sip from the glass. Then, Warmog will keep the war in a stalemate. It will be elongated, and placing the glass down, 
Doflamingo then hummed in deep thought. He then asked with slight concern. But I have a bad hunch treble. Mad Ball was already proven to be inferior to Warmog a year ago. However, that white hunter he's the fellow who defeated Moria and Hellblaze before. His strength seems a little threatening to us. Good, good, Doflamingo nodded. And with the Celestial Dragons taken care of, any further involvement of Marine isn't of a concern for Fafafu -fa -fa Doflamingo. Finally ridding the last shred of concern, laughed boisterously. Now this is getting interesting, isn't it, Boom? Boy, in Knockdown Island, one pirate gulped in disbelief, is, is this for real? Knockdown Island. It used to be an empty island, but recently with the start of the Great Age of Pirates, the pirates took over in order to safely bypass the marine base G2 rendering this place quite similar to Jaya. Therefore, though the marines didn't have an eye on this place, the pirates did. On this island, there was one single marine with a white justice coat on his back. Smoker. Uncaring of the countless pirates who spectated him from all around, he combated one black-haired man with a tattoo on his face. Dragon. Boom. A punch was intercepted by a punch. A kick was countered with a kick. The battle between the two was intense and incredible, such that the pirates felt nothing but fear. Tap. Dragon, landing on the ground casually, looked at Smoker who did the same. He then said coldly, when will you give up on me, White Hunter? I already told you. Haven't I? You cannot defeat me. Smoker, while cracking his neck, growled, until the yearning souls of my dead colleagues are satiated with your blood. That isn't happening. The ongoing clash of wills between the two seemed intense and genuine such, that no one realized that they were acting. Dragon's hand, which were bent to resemble a dragon's claw, rushed toward where my head lied. I tilted my head at the last moment to avoid it before immediately forming the intensely swelling white ball on my palm. Before my white ball crashed onto Dragon's torso, Dragon showcased the rapid movement of his hand that was about to grip onto my wrist. I, thinning out my wrist by morphing it into smoke, wavered around Dragon's grip and blasted the white ball at his body. Boom! Dragon grinned at me. His abdomen, where the cloth was shredded apart due to my attack, was coated by the armament haki. Dragon lowered his body and embedded his dragon claw-like hand on the ground. Dragon's breath. The ground underneath us burst into pieces, losing my footing. I quickly jumped up to the sky, just as those pieces began to swell within the abruptly generated wind. Then, one by one, those huge chunks of ground were thrown at me, morphing my body into smoke. I effortlessly dodged them before placing my feet on the final chunk of the ground. Propelling myself, I flew at Dragon, who was already ready to receive my blow. White blow. Slash Dragon's claw. Boom. Two Haki imbued attacks collided, and the pressure generated from such collision knocked the spectating pirates off their feet. It was initially an equal clash. However, as the struggle continued, I found myself gradually being pushed back by Dragon's attack. Then, whoosh. His black-coated hand that pushed against my smoke-filled hand suddenly developed a vibrant energy around it. My eyes widened, armament Haki emission. Haki, it is the manifestation of one's willpower. The ability possessed by those who stand on the apex of the world. For the past two years, I learned the basic concept of Haki from Gart Sensei, of how to focus my will bring out its best potential within a battle. And I truly tell you it was far harder than the mere physical training. Haki, it is difficult to gain a substantial improvement in this aspect, through the training alone. It is the strength attained by going through the gruesome battles that invoke despair out of many. The moment Dragon brought out the emission the advanced technique of armament Haki my loss was guaranteed. Boom. I was driven into the ruined ground, and the clash or the show between the two of us ended. Here's my gift. Ensure to use this when you contact me. As the dust covered the two of us from our spectators, Dragon whispered while placing a small, white den den mushy in my justice coat and finally, watch out for a small fly around you. Turning around, he began to walk away. Dragon, I, with my eyes shadowed by my ruffled hair, muttered, say hi to Saul for me, will you? Dragon momentarily froze with his back facing me, before resuming his walk. Is that all you got? Warmog stood with a wide grin on his face, as he faced the numerous foes in front of him. Cipherpole agents, marines, and civilians all alike, they were huffing in exhaustion. The royal guards, though their numbers severely paled in comparison to the alliance, with Warmog's imperative strength, the battle was still ongoing after hours. Damn it. Rosanante mumbled to himself as he clenched his fist. His form was filled with bruises, and he, currently sprawled on the ground, was unable to stand and back up. The other marine soldiers and Cipherpole agents were still ongoing the never-ending clashes against the royal guards. Bang. Robin was standing among them. She grew multiple arms around her body, and with each of them gripping on a gun, she managed to snipe numerous enemies at once in the chaotic battlefield. Garfield, who was found sitting on the ground, said to Warmog while sweating profusely, Half half this strength I must admit, I am unable to match you. Hey, good to see that you've regained your senses. Warmog, shrugging casually, then began to sprout 
but I'm a generous man. If you give up your weapons and retreat, I'm willing to spare you. Garfield's eyes lit up upon hearing Warmog's statement. This man seemed to be considering the enemy's offer with delight. Then, Rahahaha, Aramaki, whose body was painted with blood, stood up from the lying position. Warmog expressed his annoyance upon sighting Aramaki, but stood silently. Aramaki, grinning, then said astutely, I remember that a year ago, when you and I fought, you used knuckles as your weapons instead. And the reason why I lost back then was due to those knuckles containing sea stones as one of its materials. So Warmog's smile died down, and Aramaki asked with certainty, Since when did you eat a devil fruit big force? Rosanante and Garfield both widened their eyes in surprise. Warmog stood silently for a moment, before chuckling once more. Eh, I see that you're sharper than I expected, Madbull. Warmog's form began to transform. His body began to grow, and his arms turned into legs. His nose became longer and longer, and ultimately morphed into a trunk. Just as you said, I'm the elephant human, having eaten the elephant elephant fruit. Though I no longer possess the sea stone weapon due to its risk, I've acquired the strength worth the trade. Garfield, overwhelmed by the fact that Warmog didn't even dare to go all out, unconsciously trembled on his spot. He, with his jaw dropped, watched as Warmog raised up his trunk at them. He whimpered, D dear marines let's retreat. We need to bring more to fight this man well. This is getting interesting. However, it was a different story for Rosinante. He, ignoring Garfield's whimper and standing back up, then raised up his hand. Turns out that I too am a devil fruit user. Then, just before Warmog let out the loud noise through his trunk, Rosinante snapped his fingers, silent. And nothing happened. Literally nothing. Warmog, the one whose trunks should have produced noises so loud that everyone around was knocked off their feet, generated no sound at all. Well done, Rosie. And Aramaki, cracking his knuckles, grinned before jumping at the huge elephant with his fist cocked back. Around the said fist, the trees rapidly grew all of a sudden, earning awe from many who sighted this scene. Then, Aramaki shot out the wood-covered fist at Warmog per tenacious forest. The punch didn't slam onto Warmog in elephant form. Instead, the trees began to spread all around the huge elephant, before the latter could do anything, before each root poked through his body. I've been waiting for this moment, for you to use your devil fruit. Aramaki said with his eyes locked with Warmog, you were trickier to deal with a year ago, big force. Warmog seemed to be speaking something. However, Rosinante's ability rendered him completely silent. Then, Warmog thrashed his huge body. The latched up roots of the trees were immediately ripped and separated, due to his sheer strength. However, to Warmog's surprise, the roots regrew from Aramaki and latched onto his body once again. Rahaha! Power isn't the solution to my devil fruit, Aramaki remarked in amusement. If you didn't possess a skin hard enough to block my entry, you should have dodged it instead. Then, Warmog's eyes became bloodshot as the roots, sharpening their ends, penetrated through his thick skin. And in an instant, his body shrank as the roots began to absorb fluids off of his body. The trees that lied above those roots, on Aramaki's still outstretched fist, grew at an incredible pace, and eventually grew to a size equivalent to Warmog in elephant form. On the other hand, Warmog's body was full of wrinkles due to dehydration, and as Warmog's body slowly reverted back to his human form, he muttered weakly, however, no sound was produced. In one moment, the battle has took a sudden turn. Clang clang clang. And naturally, this comeback has boosted the Marines' morals. They fought with renewed strength and the Royal Guards who saw that their leader was rendered to a miserable state, began to look to their left and right shrewdly, trying to find a way to escape from this situation. Garfield stood back up and glared at Warmog, acting as if his previous action didn't exist. Yesterday, I wasn't going all out. So what if you grew stronger over a year? Aramaki said with confidence. I grew even more than you did. After all, I'm the forest human, Rahahaha tap. With such statement, Aramaki's palm was placed on Warmog's now skinny belly. Then, morning wood. Boom. The huge, straight trunk of wood suddenly burst out of Aramaki's palm, blasting Warmog all the way to the castle wall at the back. And as the dust died down, Warmog was found unconscious with the blood gushing out of his open mouth, and A-R-A-H-H-H-H the king of Lelujah, Barnan. He was found trembling on his throne. Aramaki, without any further word, turned back. Then, he slapped his hand with Rosinante, whose face held a similar grin on his face. Garfield, adjusting his hat, said with a forced calmness, W well done, Ensign Aramaki. The pirates, wary of the man named Smoker, stayed away even after the clash between him and Dragon ended up in his loss. However, among them, one man with sunglasses over his eyes and bowl hair cut walked forth while putting on the gloves on his hands. He was Virgo, one of the four elite officers of the Don Quixote family who went by the code name Corazon. I've sighted the White Hunter, Virgo spoke into a Den Den Mushy attached on his wrist, though he faced a one-sided defeat against Rebellious Dragon, his current status remains unclear. I will now advance and confirm his death. Nothing personal, White Hunter. Ignoring the ongoing noise from the mini Den Den Mushy, 
Virgo clenched his fist, planning to smash it straight onto where Smoker's heart lied. But you're a nuisance in Doffy's path to ascension. If anything, be remorseful of your powerlessness Virgo had to stop speaking, is Smoker, who was still lying on the ground, suddenly grinned. That was the final thing he saw, before Smoker's form vanished from his sight. Swoosh. And then, a clicking sound. Smoker, standing behind Virgo, was found sheathing Shashi back. Virgo's head was fully severed from his neck, and that head along with an arm flew up in the air. The head fell back on the ground and rolled, and the arm was now in Smoker's hand. Smoker brought his lips closer to the wrist of the severed arm and spoke, Tell your Doffy that Virgo is gone forever. I blew what? Treble, second in command of the Don Quixote family, as well as a man whom many may perceive as creepy in terms of appearance. He, unable to believe what just happened, took a step back from the Den Den Mushy. Said Den Den Mushy grinned, at treble, much to his horror. White Hunter Smoker, the super rookie of the Marine who not only defeated Nightmare Gecko Moria, but also held Flame Diego. Treble believed that this time was the best chance that they had to kill off this man. However, they instead lost their family member. Treble's eyes trembled behind his sunglasses. They slowly moved to another Den Den Mushy, that sat nearby. The one connected to Smoker, the one which was connected to his boss, Heavenly Demon Don Quixote Doflamingo. Or, say that again. Then, Treble found his heart dropping, as Doflamingo's rage-filled voice was heard through it. Smoker's Den Den Mushy raised an eyebrow. It then chuckled, before responding. Doflamingo's Den Den Mushy barked, unable to contain his fury, painful my ass. Smoker's Den Den Mushy snorted. Then, Smoker's voice turned ice cold as he spoke. Both Doflamingo's Den Den Mushy and Treble flinched in shock and disbelief. Treble's both trembled. He unconsciously took a step back. Though it was a virtual conversation that happened by chance, he would later come to believe that this conversation alone brought forth in many changes to the fate of Doflamingo family. Because Smoker's word just now, who leaked the information, became the trigger of Doflamingo's distrust. He please, I will give you all I got, so please spare me. Down the throne was the King Barman of Lelusia Kingdom. He, without a sense of dignity, stepped down from his seat and knelt willingly. As he did so, the crown on his head fell out. However, he didn't seem to care knowing that his life was online. CAC Asia look at you, King Barman among the rebels who watched the king with disgust, see he stepped forth. He, with his hands on his back, triumphantly walked. Stopping in the middle, he leaned down and lifted up the crown that Barnan dropped. And Rosanante's face darkened. From his perspective, Siki's eyes they were just like those of the celestial dragons, filled with nothing but greed. From here on, I, Siki, am the king. Siki placed the crown on his head while stepping on Barnan's head. Upon his announcement, Siki, 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 the civilians all cheered in joy. Happy that the long-lived rule of Barnan was finally over. Garfield, turning to Aramaki, nodded as a means of goodbye. He ordered to his men, arrest Barnan and the rest of his forces. And as for those slaves marines, Aramaki, whose eyes were shadowed, then stated with his arms crossed, free those women from their shackles. Provide them the necessities as soon as possible. Yes sir. Garfield, stopping in the middle of his track, turned and gazed at Aramaki questioningly. However, upon seeing Aramaki's fierce glare through his banks, Garfield turned back with a pale face and continued walking, as if he's seen nothing at all. And thus, here it was, the resolution to the incident in the Lelusia Kingdom. Dragon, Kuma, and Ivankov. They are the names of those who killed my men. Kommel, upon receiving the report, would growl at Smoker, and you failed to get them, but still, Kommel's anger will be futile. Eventually, he will be forced to let go of his meaningless anger, which was born from an idiotic reason of his reputation being tarnished. Aramaki, Rosanante, and Robin will all receive the promotion, having partook major roles in leading the joint operation with CP8 to success. Lieutenant Aramaki, Warrant Officer Rosie, Seaman First Class Arobi. Among them, Aramaki's name will earn many higher-ups attention, recognizing that he's the one who used to be the bounty hunter, Mad Bull. And then, there was Smoker. Though he wasn't present during the day of operation, he was at the Knockdown Island, arresting and subduing every single pirate in sight. Within one day, the island was demolished and pirates lost a route to bypass G2. Promotion again? Gup Sensei. Currently, Smoker, back to his division, was chatting with Gup through the Den Den Mushi. Ah, uh, didn't I become Commodore just recently? Rear Admiral Smoker. He couldn't help but scratch the back of his head, for he couldn't really be bothered with a rank at this point. Gut Sensei. Instead, Smoker said with a serious voice, I have a favor to ask. Tell some Goku-san that I won't be accepting missions for some time. I grinned. It's not that I don't want to be promoted, but that I already have a set objective in mind. Slavery. Garp's voice momentarily paused, falling silent. He clearly knew what I meant by this. Then, he finally said, Eh, now that's my disciple. Worry not, I'll cover you as much as I can, Smoker. Lelusia Kingdom. What did they achieve in the end? Freedom. No, they were still bound by the world government. Strength. 
No, they simply watched as Marine and CPA agents led the rebellion to success. Wisdom. No, for as long as I could see the history was about to repeat. King Siki, eh? I chuckled as I stared at the island that contained Lelusia Kingdom. Currently, with my division back on our ship, we were sailing away from the island toward our next destination, history repeats. Revolutionary army will return here in the future, upon realizing that Siki is yet another Barman in the end. Then I raised my head up and stared at the sunny sky. That enigmatic laser beam will erase the island. I grimaced. Who exactly are you, Inu? I know I improved a lot over the past two years. Even against Hellflame Diego, there was no need for me to go all out. However, I also know that I need to improve more. To become free from the shackles of the world government, my current strength was far from enough. And strength. It is more than just one's physical capability. Though such type of strength was the one of most importance in this world. What I currently needed were allies like Robin and Dragon, ones who will oppose the world government with me. Tap. Just then, I heard someone stopping by next to me. Turning my head in response, I came to see Rosinante. He was smoking casually. He, upon sighting me, widened his eyes before immediately throwing away the cigarette into the ocean and acting as if nothing happened. Ha! Huh, I couldn't help but sigh. For years, everyone on my left and right smoked. It is a bad thing, and I've been preventing those around me from doing so such that I earned the title of non-smoker. Yet, they didn't stop. Their addiction to nicotine was beyond belief. Even after slapping their cheeks, throwing their unused cigarettes into garbage bins, and threatening to punish them, they continued. At this point, I began to wonder, why do you bam? Rosinante fell down all of a sudden, even though he was simply standing still. Smoke. I sweat dropped. Rosinante, immediately standing back up while sweating profusely, stuttered in response. W what do you mean, Smoker-san? I, I didn't smoke. Not at all. He cowered in a comical manner. He squinted his eyes as if he expected a physical blow from me. After a minute or so, he reopened his eyes and asked warily, W8, are you serious about that question? I simply gazed back at him. Rosinante, upon recognizing my seriousness, too turned serious. He, taking in a deep breath, turned his head to the distant sky. Well, not everyone is as strong as you are, Smoker-san. Rosinante muttered, some started because smoking looks cool, and became addicted. Then there are ones like me, those who are haunted by the past. My eyes widened. Rosinante, at this moment, looked like a traumatized child in my eyes. The nightmare never ends, and the pain that keeps on intruding us. The reason why we joined to become Marines such reason keeps coming back to us, in a way that we cannot find ourselves to bear it without smoking. Rosinante, turning his eyes on me, then grinned mischievously as if he was acting. He subsequently whispered, By the way, Aramaki-san smokes to boom. HHH Aramaki fell on top of Rosinante all of a sudden. Oh, since when were you there, Rosie? Oh damn, hang in there, Aramaki. Not daring to meet his eyes with mine, quickly lifted Rosinante up and ran away much to my amusement. But still, was I being inconsiderate? I couldn't help but think in such a way, knowing what kind of past Rosinante had, until I saw Robin, who tilted her head upon noticing my gaze. They smoked next to a ten-year-old girl. I found myself crackling my knuckles, causing the nearby marine soldiers to take a step back in fear. Mercy and for the next hour, the two will face a horrific punishment, one that will make them bedridden for a week. December 30th, 1504 A Luxurious Room that was probably the most adequate way to define the current surrounding of Don Quixote Doflamingo, who was unusually wearing black attire. Behind him stood all the current executives of the Doflamingo family, Treble, Diamante, and Picker. Virgo was supposed to be one of them. However, he was no longer here. Along with them were the rest of the family. Jula, Laoji, Senor Pink, Matchfies, and Gladius. They served as the officers who commanded the countless number of underlings that Doflamingo controlled through the name of Heavenly Demon and Joker. Altogether, the Don Quixote family was a force to reckon with. Their total strength was enough to open a nation-scaled war, and Doflamingo was an ambitious man seeking to take over the world. And when he was angry, it meant that something big was about to happen. Virgo died, Doflamingo said. No one exhibited any sign of surprise though since all of them received the news beforehand, and so did Warmog. Everyone listened Doflamingo in silence. Doflamingo, gritting his teeth in vexation, snarled, the war that should have provided us a huge profit has ended in a single day. I lost my loyal family members. And then, that white hunter he's begun to interrupt my business, somehow locating every single slave ship that was heading to Sabadi Archipelago. The losses that I accumulated up until now they are beyond the amount that can be calculated. And furthermore, Doflamingo grabbed a piece of news with a trembling hand. It was the news reporting the feats of Smoker and his division, and behind Smoker, there stood one blonde man. Warrant Officer Rosie. Doflamingo then let out a furious chuckle, for fufu 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 Rosie my ass. 
Rosinante, why is my brother in the Marine, and in that accursed White Hunter's division? Is it out of his free will, or is he forced to do so? Brother, Treble whispered in a shock, that biological brother whom you told us before he was alive. Yes indeed, Treble. Doflamingo, grinning with the veins popping out of his forehead, turned around. He then threw the newspaper in the air, and then, swoosh. The sharp strings suddenly sprang into the existence, shredding it into pieces in an instant. Doflamingo, massaging his temple, then stated, For Fufu stop all ongoing businesses for now, and gather all available forces. The executives and officers all listened seriously to Doflamingo's declaration. We're going to massacre that white hunter and his marines. January W. What are the marines doing here? All marines, quickly subdue the criminals and free the victims. Though you are permitted to kill them if necessary, ensure that not even a single victim is caught in the midst of it. Yes, sir. February, Rear Admiral Smoker. We've just sighted another slave ship that's about to sneak past us. During the night, a eh? Ha, Aramaki. Go deal with them. Rahahaha. Got it, Smoker-san. March, uh, this man says that he's from the East Blue. Tell them that they'll have to wait in Sabaudi Archipelago. For how long? He asks. Indefinitely. The slave ships are still fluxing in relentlessly. April, May, June, July, and finally August 15th, 1505. Yes. I really do right now. Sitting next to a round table where Den Den Mushi was placed atop, I said seriously, Sabaudi Archipelago is getting overcrowded. People need to be sent back to their hometown. But the issue is, the sea is far too dangerous for them to travel back by themselves. Currently, I was conversing with Cancer in particular, my colleague who's recently been promoted to captain. He, deciding to leave Jones' division, has now become the commander of the newly established 33rd Division. What's happening on his side? I couldn't help but sweat drop, but nonetheless continued. Can I assume your arrival by tomorrow? Then, noted. Cancer's voice then took a serious turn. I raised my eyebrow. Yes, what about him? It was the information that I already was aware of, and, and that was the information that rendered me frozen. Raising up my right hand, I touched my face I was grinning. I whispered, acting out in the open. Huh? So unlike you, Doflamingo. It was an extremely irrational move from Doflamingo's side. There was only one deduction that I could make out of this. The seed of distrust that I placed in him months ago it was finally bearing the fruit. Rear Admiral Smoker. Just then, a marine soldier's voice was heard from the outside. An unregistered ship has been sighted. Please give us an order. I shifted my eyes up to the wooden ceiling upon hearing the voice. Anyhow, we can discuss more after you reach here. Got some work to do. I see. Well, Johnny then. Cancer out. With the call having come to an end, I opened the door and walked up the staircase. Making my way up to the deck, I was met with the bright sunlight above the blue sky, the calm ocean, the gentle breeze of wind, and one small-sized ship that seemed average looking in terms of its appearance. Smoker San, Rosinante, being the first one to notice me, greeted me with a smile. It's been quite some time since he's boarded my ship, and in comparison to months ago, he seemed to have warmed up to me. Hey, Smoker San, how was the call? Aramaki then followed. He, draping his justice coat over his shirtless top, grinned while crossing his arms. Not bad, I suppose. Making a casual reply to Aramaki and waving at Rosinante, I walked to the front of the ship. While doing so, I ruffled Robin's hair as I passed by her. ECH I'm not a child, Rear Admiral Smoker. Robin pouted while placing her hands over her messed up hair. Ha ha ha. But you are, oh Roby. The marine soldiers responded with laughs of their own. As I too chuckled in a similar manner, I locked my eyes on the distant ship, where the sailors were looking at us with disbelief in their eyes. Then, my eyes gained a red gleam. Observation Haki through the operation of this type of Haki. I came to sense the weak presences within that ship, most presumably the slave ship. I thought, Aramaki. I stated while taking my feet off my ship and walking in the air, to the ship, gotcha, Smoker-san. To which Aramaki complied by morphing his right hand into tree roots and vines, which swiftly traveled to the ship and bound it tightly. Tap. Simultaneously, I landed on the now bound ship. The sailors or the slave dealers they looked at me while gulping in fear. You must be wondering how a single ship manages to locate your folks down every single time, aren't you? Stating coldly, I walked forth and opened the doorway to the inside of the ship, similarly. I too wonder every day, of when you will stop committing these disgusting deeds. Inside of the ship was dirty. The stench that emanated from within was enough to make me frown. Upon looking carefully, I sighted ten people in total. One human child, six human adults, two fishmen, and one mermaid. Mermaid, I see I narrowed my eyes at the slave dealers, who were nervously taking steps away from me. This ship was quite an important one. Huh, e damn it one among the slave dealers, then screamed before taking out his pistol, we don't have any more choice. 
All of you, shoot that man however, no one responded to his words. The other slave dealers, whose demeanors exhibited nothing but a despair, simply fell down to the deck helplessly. One then muttered, it's impossible. That man over there, he's that white hunter you know. They then raised their arms as means of resignation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A woman muttered as she hugged herself. Her face was pale, and judging by her attire, she seemed to be someone of relatively high standing. The other five adults too relaxed, knowing that they were now in safe arms. Wow, you are the infamous white hunter smoker. On the other hand, one of the two fish men, one who seemed quite young, remarked with visible admiration in his sparkling eyes, you saved me just like how many others told. For the past months, I can confidently say that I saved many people from their bleak futures. And a good number of them were those from Fishman Island. Oh, Aramaki smiled in amusement before turning to me. It seems that you're quite famous down there, Smoker-san. Smiling similarly to Aramaki, I leaned down and looked at the young fishman at the same eye level. What's your name, kid? The fishman boy, gaining a blush on his cheek, replied shyly, I am Larry. Well, Larry, briefly looking at the other fishman and mermaid, I stated be more careful for the next time around. I know that you want to take a look at Sabaudi Park, but the situation isn't safe enough just yet. Usually, the reason why fishmen and merfolks are caught is that they willingly swim up from their home. Such an act is born out of their curiosity and adoration for the overworld, the world which they didn't get to experience. I promise you though. Then, holding out my pinky finger, I said that if you wait patiently, I will change this world, so that you can come up and play anytime you'd like. The boy looked at my extended pinky with widened eyes, before meeting it with his own pinky finger. His face then exhibited a pure smile that brought warmth to my heart, yeah? Subsequently, standing back up, I walked to a human child who was taking a rest nearby. Whether this child was he or she wasn't clear, but as far as I could deduce, this child seemed very very young around 4 or 5 in terms of age. Strange though I thought as I leaned down to the child, this one feels familiar. And what may your name be? I asked softly. The child looked at me warily, before replying in a nervous manner, Coca-Cola. The sun set by, and those fishmen and mermaid left the ship. The remaining seven victims were given the necessary treatments and care by Smoker's subordinates, and were now sleeping soundly. Having told all his soldiers to take a nice rest, Smoker was currently alone on the deck, gazing at the night sky full of stars. Creak then, a creaking sound. The door behind Smoker opened, and without looking, he muttered, can't sleep, Arobi. Robin walked up to Smoker and took a seat for herself. She, following his gaze, too looked at the stars for a while, before stating, that girl, Cola, she's only four, and those despicable people caught her as a slave. Smoker didn't respond. With a stoic expression, he kept his eyes locked on the sky. She cried for hours, before finally falling asleep just now. That young girl she held in the tears though she was only four. Robin, she turned 11 this year. Similarly, Smoker too had become 17 in terms of age now. Though the marine soldiers on his ship adored her as a child, he knew just how mature she was. Smoker, what would have happened if you didn't intervene? Smoker's facial expression darkened, she would have been sold off. Cannon, whether Cola becomes one of the revolutionary army in the future was of no concern to Smoker. Hell, he doesn't care if she ends up remaining as a civilian girl. Don't change the plot so that the future becomes predictable to him. Fuck with that mindset. He cannot and won't ignore these wrongdoings happening around him. Why are you the only one who's stopping this atrocious act? Robin then whispered. Smoker, shifting his eyes, saw Robin gritting her teeth with her hands clenched tight. There are many marines all over the world. I've seen tons of your colleagues and they all had sufficient strength. Yet, you are the only one to act when the true injustice is identified. Smoker couldn't find a word to refute Robin's words. Even Joan she was more interested in gaining reputation and authority by catching infamous pirates rather than saving the lives of those who are in need. Through months of experience, he's come to realize that the meritocratic system of Marine was a part of the world government's way of manipulating the Marine. Wealth, fame, and strength Marine wasn't about righteousness but about competition of who's going to reach the title of Fleet Admiral. You know that I earned the remorse of Celestial Dragons by my recent deeds. Smoker finally stated, Garp Sensei is covering for me as much as he can, but eventually, I know that I will be forced to drop this operation. You see, Arobi, in this world strength is the one and only justice. Smoker paused momentarily, for his observation Haki sensed Rosanante behind the door, silently listening to our conversations. 
Nonetheless, he continued, and it's only natural for the people even the marines to prioritize their lives over all else. World government stands on top, and therefore, they naturally comply. But, it's okay. Smirking confidently, Smoker stated, if they wish to keep themselves in a safe spot, let them be. I will just do more. And that was the night which Rosanate came to know of what kind of man Smoker truly was. Within the darkness, the blonde man, Rosanate, jolted awake from his slumber. Sweating profusely, he clenched his head to ease his headache, but to no avail. There it was, the hate-filled words of his brother Don Quixote do Flamingo. In his right hand was a pistol, loaded and ready to kill it target any time. Said pistol was locked on Doflamingo and Rosinante's father. Don quicks at homing. Those bastards who coaxed Doflamingo, and Doflamingo who fell to their words No, It wasn't that Doflamingo was persuaded to become evil. Rosinante thought as he shut his eyes tight from the ringing pain. He, from the very start wasn't human. Doflamingo then screamed at their No, Rosinante's father who was holding him dear. Oh, homing Rosinante's beloved father. Though they were condemned due to homing's decision to give up the status of Celestial Dragon, Rosinante never hated hated him. Instead, Rosinante loved his humane nature and kindness that distinguished him from the other monsters atop the sky. Doflamingo Rosinante. And then, Homing's final words. He didn't fear death, but was consumed by the sadness that he ended up placing his family into such misery. He forced a kind smile onto his face even at the very end, even when he was about to be killed by his own son. I'm sorry for being such a terrible father bang. By the time Rosinante's headache disappeared, he found himself huffing heavily. The... Nightmare Rosinante took in a deep breath while massaging his temple. It has returned. It's been years since he was reminded of this traumatic moment in his life. After meeting Sengoku and growing up as his adopted son, Rosinante used to think that he managed to overcome it. I suppose not Rosinante thought before standing up from his bed. He, walking out of the small room given to his use, walked up to the deck. Warrant Officer Rosie, nodding in response to the salutes of the Marines on sentry duty, Rosinante walked up to the frontmost tip of the ship where their white-haired rear admiral, Smoker, was sitting with a thoughtful look on his face. In his hands was a piece of newspaper. Good morning to you, Rosie. Then, Smoker spoke without turning his gaze. He noticed Rosinante's presence before the latter said anything. You've woken up earlier than usual, Smoker-san. Rosinante looked at the newspaper in Smoker's hands grimly, and asked, How's the situation regarding Don Quicks at Doflamingo? Smoker, rolling up the newspaper to Rosinante, casually threw it at the blonde. Rosinante, watching as the newspaper met the air resistance and swayed back and forth in the air, busily moved his feet left and right to catch the newspaper, before, boom, he fell face first to the deck, must to Smoker's amusement. Ugh, Rosinante, while still in a lying position, raised his head up, and saw that the newspaper fell right in front of him. On its title page, there it was, the image of the very familiar face, the blonde man wearing flamboyant sunglasses. Doflamingo. Smoker snorted as he stared at the distant horizon, Joker, Heavenly Demon, or Doflamingo. He legitimately purchased the Knockdown Island, and proposed his plan to build a theme park that can rival that of Sabaudi Archipelago. Question is, from whom did he buy the island from? Rosinante muttered, Park Smoker chuckled, though the newspaper didn't mention it. The Marine Bureau of Investigation reported the movements of various pirate ships back and forth the Knockdown Island, coupled with the reports of the ongoing pirate invasions everywhere in Paradise. It is evident that Doflamingo is setting up the new human auction shop there. And he made it obvious on purpose. I believe so, Smoker nodded in response to Rosinante's remark. But, Rosinante then inquired with confusion, how is this possible? How can Doflamingo be allowed to act in the open like this? Why are the Marine and World Government allowing this? You haven't finished reading the newspaper, have you? Smoker said as he stood up from his spot, Doflamingo became a warlord, the pirate who's officially allied to the World Government. Slavery, selling off human beings, Celestial Dragon's primary source of entertainment, their addiction, and the subsequent lack of it due to my act here in Sabaudi Archipelago. Smoker could see how Doflamingo managed to achieve this feat. Doflamingo asked for protection by being given the title of Warlord, and in return, he promised the entertainment back to the Celestial Dragons. Celestial Dragon's Clown Joker. How amusing. Smoker thought as he walked past Rosinante, who was reading the wrinkled newspaper with disbelief in his eyes. Within Smoker's eyes, the huge mangrove forest filled with bubbles all around was unveiled. Sabaudi Archipelago. Today's date was August 17th. Well then, from behind him, a whisper was heard. Smoker, chuckling without turning around, opened his mouth. Did you get a nice sleep, Cola? Cola, walking up to Smoker while rubbing her eyes to fully get rid of fatigue, nodded. Her eyes sparkled as they wandered around the mesmerizing scenery of Sabaudi Archipelago. The trees are so huge. Cola then pointed at the ships that were docked nearby, 
Oh, those ships look the same as this one. Smoker grinned. It looks like my friends have arrived already. Ruffling the young girl's hair and turning around, Smoker ordered, wake up the sleepy heads and get ready to land. Swiftly restock necessary supplies. Rosinante, organize the soldiers and support the ongoing patrol duty from Grove 30 to 79. Notify Aramaki to subdue any ongoing suspicious activity from Grove 1 to Grove 29. Meanwhile, I will be paying a visit at the Marine base located on Grove 66, while escorting the civilians. All awake Marines replied firmly, Yes sir. Oh, Cola, looking at the Marines with curiosity, then copied their acts and saluted, Yes sir. Ha ha, we got a young Marine here. Not bad for the first try. Her innocence brought smiles to everyone on the ship. Sabaudi Archipelago. As previously explained, this place is a massive mangrove forest, for it is composed of 79 groves in total. In addition, this place is the final place to dwell prior to crossing the Red Line. It was only natural that all notable pirates in paradise end up here, even under the presence of White Hunter Smoker. For past months, the prevention of slavery wasn't the only thing that Smoker did upon arrival. Every time his division stopped by to restock supplies, they cleansed the forest by eradicating any threat that they came across except for a select few. Though the danger still lurked by in this place, without a doubt, Smoker's endeavor has paid off. And currently, here stood Smoker, in Grove 66, Rear Admiral Smoker, surrounded by countless civilians who rushed at him with joy within their eyes. Have all of you been well? Smoker grinned and greeted them. How's your life so far? Well, I do admit, one man rubbed the back of his head. This place feels safer than my hometown. All thanks to you. Hey! Smoker, while turning his body to smoke to avoid one woman from hugging him tight, replied, That's nice to hear. Will you believe it if at least half of these civilians were the ones whom Smoker saved before? Whether out in the ocean or here in the archipelago, there used to be dangerous threats all around. However, once Smoker arrived, everything changed. Their daily lives improved by substantial degree. And although many still harbored the desire to return back to their home and reunite with their family members, they knew how hard Smoker was working to ensure their safety and comfort. Marry me, Smoker a loud screech was heard from someone at the back, before, fuck off bitch. He's way too high up there for someone like you to go for. Oh, what did you say? Did an ugly mustard squeak just now? A fight abruptly broke off among the women. They, punching and pulling their hairs in a comical manner, formed a cloud of smoke that earned a frown out of Smoker. He then made an irritated remark, shut up, women, you're damn annoying. His voice boomed forth, and ones who were fighting immediately stopped. They, standing strictly, hi, all replied in the same way, much to others' amusement. Robin, who stood along with Cola and six other civilians behind Smoker, shook her head as if used to this chaos. Cola simply formed an O shape with her mouth, amazed by everything around her. The other six civilians, on the other hand, seemed dumbfounded. All right, I'll catch up with you guys later, Smoker, returning back to his casual self, then turned and spoke to Robin. I'll leave those seven at your hands, Arobi. Robin nodded stoically, and Smoker, fully morphing his body to smoke, easily breezed through the crowd much to their disappointment. And within seconds, he landed in front of the Marine base, where its commander, Marine Commodore Barricade, strictly stood with the rest of his subordinates. It's good to see you well, Smoker-san. Barricade immediately saluted, though with a certain degree of friendliness. He, having seen Smoker many times in the past months, was practically Smoker's friend at this point. Same to you, Barricade. Smoker tapped Barricade on the shoulder. I see that your beard has gotten bushier than before. Looking around Smoker then asked, So, where are 32nd and 33rd Divisions? Haha, <laughs> if you are referring to Commodore Bastille and Captain Cancer, they are in other areas currently, helping us in dealing with the new batch of pirates. Ah, pirates I see, Smoker sighed. The flux surely is never ending. Such is the effect of the Pirate King's hidden treasure, to which Barricade mimicked with his own sigh. Then, he gestured his hand to the base ahead of them anyway. Why don't we wait inside? I got a tea ready to serve. What about the rice crackers? Barricade smiled. That too. Smoker grinned. You know me too well. Grove 24 Aramaki, draping his justice coat around his topless shoulder, scratched the back of his head as he stared at the scene in front of him. There were pirates, amounting up to a hundred or so, knocked out and beaten civilly. Tied by the ropes and cuffed around the wrists, they were currently being apprehended by fellow marines whom Aramaki didn't recognize. Hey, among them, one red-haired marine officer with a metal mask, Bastille, noticed Aramaki's presence. Who are you? I've never seen you before, Dara. Hum, a pirate trying to act as a marine Dara. Bastille has always been a thick-headed fellow. He was a typical brute who doesn't bother much with information whatsoever, and thanks to this, he wasn't as affected as Maynard from the Martini Piritus attack. However, due to this characteristic of his, he, at the same time, didn't know who Aramaki was even at the current moment. Dara. Aramaki raised his eyebrow, before bursting into a laugh all of a sudden, rahahaha. 
You're just like that old granny of mine. Bastille, staring at Aramaki's justice coat with suspicion, then said in a commanding tone, State your name and rank Dara Rahahaha. Aramaki fell on his butt and wiped the tears on his eyes. A.R. Rahaha, my apologies. I didn't mean to offend you or anything. Rahaha, I just can't control my laugh right now. EFF. Man, what a deja vu. Bastille closed his lips. Judging by his trembling fists, he seemed angry from Aramaki's antics. I'll give you one last chance, Dara Rahahaha, Dara Rara Pirate it is. Bastille unsheathed the huge great sword from his back then jumped at Aramaki. Aramaki, upon noticing that a shadow covered his form, opened his eyes and sighted Bastille dropping down on him. Ha! Huh. Boom. What? The fuck are they doing? Cancer, watching as Aramaki and Bastille began fighting all of a sudden, muttered. Agreed. Rosinante, who was right next to Cancer, nodded. He, then taking out a cigarette holder from his pocket, took out two cigarettes. Looking at Cancer, he offered one, to which Cancer accepted with a grin of his. Cancer took out a lighter and lighted up his cigarette. Hey, a fellow smoker I see. I like you he then passed it to Rosinante, who, G-A-H-H-H-H accidentally set his own marine attire aflame. Never mind, cancer deadband. It was a lively day in Sabadi Archipelago though chaotic at the same time. Knockdown Island. It was previously a place filled with blood and violence. In this place pirates used to laugh and drink heartily celebrating the fact that they managed to bypass Marine Base G2. Then, months ago, there was an abrupt appearance of one Marine. He, as his justice coat fluttered on his back, sweep across the entire island, and brought the entirety of pirates there to ruination. Knockdown no longer was the island under pirates' control, but instead, an empty land full of opportunity. Many tycoons eyed this piece of land greedily. Simultaneously, an auction was held one to decide to whom this island will go to. And in the middle of the auction, Don Quixote Do Flamingo barged in. Thus, here was the current knockdown island the entertaining park, filled with various amusement rides, interesting circuses, enjoyable foods, and many more. And in the center of this newly established Doflamingo Park, there stood one luxurious looking building. It peaked above all else, and on its topmost floor was Doflamingo's office, where he currently dwelled within, gazing at the majestic scenery through the window. How is the situation at Sabaudi Archipelago? Doflamingo, who seemed to be in a foul mood at the current moment, asked. Behind him stood the executives of Don Quixote family, who all knelt down in a submissive manner. Among them, Treble spoke with a snot dangling out from his nose. Bear here, it's confirmed, Doffy. All routes have been discovered, and there is no doubt White Hunter has a source of intel. Or in other words, a spy? Doflamingo, placing his hand over his forehead, crackled. I initially believed that White Hunter was merely acting no. I wish that such was the case. I mean, fafafafu. Being suspicious of my very own family. That wasn't something that I wanted to resort to. And yet, it did turn out that one of you betrayed me. Then, Doflamingo's right hand twitched. And in correspondence, one executive member, Jula, abruptly stood up from her position all of a sudden. My young boss. Jula panicked as her body began to move on its own. She tried to wriggle her body around, but instead ended up robotically walking toward Doflamingo. Jula. Doflamingo gazed at the obese woman with curly hair of orange and blonde colors. Jula, stopping in front of Doflamingo, then had her knees forced to the ground. Why did you betray me? Jola's eyes held confusion. The fact that her beloved boss was accusing her of being a traitor it truly ate her heart. I, I swear to you that I did not. There must be something wrong. Jola therefore stuttered while sweating profusely. Young boss, please believe in me. Someone is trying to manipulate you manipulate. Me. Doflamingo cut off Jola's words. He leaned down and looked at the middle-aged woman on eye level. Though his eyes were hidden behind the sunglasses, cracked the small cracks that were being generated at the edges of Windows Doflamingo's burst of Conqueror's Haki was enough to express his fury. Chiola, how much have you leaked? Who sided with you in doing so? Chiola desperately shook her head. I didn't. I really didn't, young boss I see. Doflamingo, as if having finished his business with her, stood back up, even in the end you attempt to deceive me. Not even a single shred of loyalty exists in you, it seems. I, Jola was about to speak. However, a thin string suddenly flew into her view. It violently penetrated her lips and stitched upper and lower parts together such that she was no longer capable of opening her mouth. The blood dripped down Jola's stitched lips. Her eyes became bloodshot from the pain. Then, they became teary. Such turn of event and such a miserable ending without any glory Jola dreamed of making Doflamingo the king of the world and she wasn't afraid of dying while doing so. However, being killed by remorseful Doflamingo out of all was click. Doflamingo's right hand held onto a pistol. Its barrel was directly pointed at Jola's forehead. 
who continued to stare at Doflamingo with nothing but disbelief. Those who refused to obey me faced the retribution. Then, bang, the blood splattered all around the room. Chiola's body fell down powerlessly with a thud, dead. However, Doflamingo didn't see shooting. Bang, bang, 16 shots. The dead body of Jola at this point wasn't even recognizable. Click. And Doflamingo ran out of bullets which he noticed upon pulling the trigger for the 17th time. ECH. Doflamingo clicked his tongue before throwing the pistol away. Stepping over the mutilated corpse, Doflamingo walked through the still kneeling executives. His footsteps left behind bloody footprints, and upon witnessing such a sight, Treble, Diamante, and Picker they, unconsciously grinned in a crazed manner. Treble, take care of the rest. And then, Doflamingo stopped in front of a round table covered by the luxurious table cover. On top of the table was a plate, and on top of said plate lied a strange looking fruit, we'll begin our move. Among the executives, one man in a black suit, Senor Pink, seemed to be shocked by the abrupt death of Jula. Recently, I've come across some idiots. I said as I took a sip from a cup of tea. After some time passed by, I was currently in the marine base at Grove 66, sitting around the round table with my fellow colleagues. Bastille and Cancer. They, with nothing but a vigorous motive to rescue their captured sister, sailed in this harsh sea without any navigation skill. If I didn't manage to see them drifting through a stroke of luck, they would have been dead. Bastille, gulping down the tens of rice crackers at once, then muttered, that means there may have been those who lost their lives in that way Dara. And coupled with what you've said before about how this island will eventually return back to its previous state without your presence, I suppose that we do need to move these civilians back. Cancer, whose hands were shaking uncontrollably, said in a calm tone, One thing to consider is the fact that the civilians here are either from the East Blue, South Blue, or nearby islands in paradise. I explained, and I doubt that I will be able to travel all across such seas with this number of people to carry. I'll... Take care of the paradise part, Dara. Bastille then said gravely, apart from your request, I'm in the process of investigating that scum, Martini Dara. Martini Hook is a warlord at the present time. Bastille's blatant claim just now was a dangerous statement to make, for investigating Hook meant going against the world government. Yet, I simply nodded, and Cancer 2 didn't express any surprise at the red-haired marine's words. And worry not, for there was the white Den Den Mushy in my chest pocket one. That nullifies the ability of Black Den Den Mushy to eavesdrop. Furthermore, I previously had Rosenante use his fruit ability to render the ongoing conversation in this room silent to anyone outside. After all, Barricade, I was well aware that he was a loyal follower of the world government's absolute justice. Nodding upon hearing Bastille's firm statement, I turned to Cancer. He hummed before opening his mouth, I'll handle the East Blue then. I'm quite curious of Lode Town, after all, South Blue for me then. I guess, I remarked, before leaning back in my seat. Turning to Bastille, I asked, oh yeah, what happened to Maynard by the way? Bastille, throwing another rice cracker in his mouth, shrugged, he joined Admiral Akane's division. For more experience, he said Dara. So he must be sailing in the new world. Huh? Cancer muttered while crossing his arms to hide his trembling hands, before his face darkened as if having remembered a bad memory. Bastille, not getting a hint of Cancer's emotion, asked out of curiosity. Oh right, you did mention before that you're from the New World Dara. I remember Maynard telling me a week ago that he's heading to Egghead Island. Have you been there before Dara? No, the only place I've been in the New World is the Toto Land. Cancer replied gloomily, but Maynard, maybe I should have done the same as him. Bastille, who seemed confused by Cancer's sudden shift in mood, turned and looked at me questioningly. Biting on a rice cracker, I shrugged in response. And then, a hearty conversation continued, catching up with how we've been doing debating the state of the world, and sharing our hobbies and interests for the rest of the night. Three weeks after, September 7th, 1505, a busy month it was. Leaving Sabadi Archipelago, my division sailed across the Calm Belt, while carrying hundreds of civilians with us. Stopping by from island to island, we dropped off the civilians back at their hometown. They rejoiced, hugging their family members tight and letting out tears of joy, they celebrated their reunions. All my subordinates held smiles on their faces. Watching as the people expressed gratitude to us made them feel good and motivated. And among them, Rosenante seemed to be the one who was affected the most. He received the words of thanks with nothing but a shock, as if he's never been thanked before. And now, the question is. And back to the present, I muttered to myself while looking at the joyful young girl. Cola, which island are you from? Frankly speaking, my memory regarding the canon wasn't perfect. The trivial details such as the name of the island which Cola came from, I couldn't remember no matter how many times I tried to squeeze it out of my brain. Um, Cola, placing his finger on her lips, then laughed, he he, Cola's home has lots of spiky big plants. Yeah, I have no idea which island that can be, 
I let out a light chuckle while shaking my head. Well, it seems like you'll be stuck with us for quite some time, Cola. Cola replied brightly, A, hey, I think it's going to be alright. Mom has lots of friends, so she won't be lonely. Robin, who was standing nearby Cola, gazed at Cola with an underlying suspicion, lots of friends. That, don't be excessively pessimistic, Roby. I quickly interrupted Robin, who stood still in a stoic manner before nodding in realization. My bad, Cola, she tapped Cola on the latter's head, and the young girl simply tilted her head in confusion while still smiling. And with that said, I, gazing at the calm ocean of the South Blue, said to myself, everyone was sent back to their home. A loud, ringing noise of one den den mushy was heard, all ongoing conversations in my ship ceased. Everyone gazed at the crying den den mushy with seriousness, and I walked up to the creature and accepted the call, Rear Admiral Smoker here. The voice from the outside immediately spoke without any form of greeting, a personal request they said. However, said request was from one of the monarchs affiliated with the world government. This was simply a nice way to give out an order I was well aware of this. In addition, Mokoko was quite a famous fellow, in a bad way blatant executions of his own civilians because he simply wanted to, taking control of all his people and sucking them dry to build his wealth, and above all, his loud declaration to become the Harem King. He was a much worse version of King Barnan, if I were to comment. Aramaki frowned, immediately expressing his dislike. Rosinante hid his emotion relatively well though his fists were clenched tight. Robin and the rest of my subordinates grimaced, not liking the idea of this mission. Is this what you prepared for me, Doflamingo? I, on the other hand, grinned as I spoke, I accept. Slap. HHH, King Mokwika. The royal guards of King Mokwika screamed in horror as I slapped the man with absurd hair on his cheek. HHHH, why did you hit me? King Mokwika. Said man with absurd hair, screamed at me while holding his swollen cheek. A sorry for my brutality, King. In return, I said lazily while picking my ear. But it wasn't out of any spite whatsoever. Currently, the ship was sailing in the calm blue with Mokwika, and his guards boarded my ship. You see, a dangerous bug named Asakam inhabits this area of sea. Once you're bitten, you'll die within a week before getting a chance to enjoy the Doflamingo Park. Mokwika's eyes widened upon hearing my words, a for real. I nodded casually, us marines have a tolerance to those bugs, but you guys don't. One previously landed on your cheek, so I naturally had to kill it before it could infect you. The king's face turned pale as he gulped, wow. I had no idea thank you for the save, Maureen. If I died here, I wouldn't have got the chance to buy the new batch of slaves after year-long boredom slap. Slapping his other cheek, I interrupted his words. ECH, another bug. Please excuse my rudeness, King. I'd rather have your cheek swollen than have you die. Ho Aramaki watched my action while stroking his chin, before, boom, slamming his fist onto the one royal guard's exposed face. That royal guard was flown back with a couple of teeth broken and his nose shattered. AHH, what are you doing? The other guards shouted with their eyes popped out. Damn be thankful for what I've just done. I'm seeing lots of bugs today. Aramaki shrugged in response. Agreed. Rosinante then spoke up. Lots of bugs today indeed. One is coming your way. Let us save you. We got your back. Following suit, the other marine soldiers began to take steps toward the royal guards who were looking to their left and right nervously. Ish, ish, few in all of fire. Don Wai. At the back, Mokwika said to his guards with a smile, with his face swollen beyond a recognizable degree. The royal guards looked at their king in disbelief before, boom. Oof, bam. H, H. The helping hands arrived. Row, row, row your boat, gently down the stream on top of one exquisitely designed ship that bore the Jolly Roger of Don Quixote Pirates. One tall man hummed with binoculars in front of his eyes, merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream this man, bearing the unique facial feature of red rectangular streaks running down from his forehead. Through his eyes to his chin is none other than Diamante, the top executive officer of Don Quixote Pirates, along with Treble and Pika. Or Treble Diamante, grinning as he continued to check his surroundings with binoculars, spoke up, how was my singing just now? In response, Treble's voice resounded from the nearby Den Den Mushy. Nor, I know I suck. Or, stop, no need to feign your opinion for me. I know I still got lots to improve. Well, if you say so, I'll have to acknowledge it. I suppose that I am good just as you say, you ha ha ha. The subordinates on the same ship sweat dropped at Diamante's antics, which the man ignored. Beha, <laughs> by the way, do you want to hear something funny, Diamante? Then, Treble began a new topic. Diamante. Placing his binoculars down, raised his eyebrow. Um, what can it be? The Den Den Mushy made a shrewd grin, reflecting Treble's facial expression. A Diamante scratched the back of his head, trying to think of an answer. Then, he grinned yet again while saying, Aha, I know, you saw her meeting up with White Hunter. Diamante frowned in confusion. A, 
Treble spoke in an excited tone. Oh, I see, Diamante nodded as if having understood. Treble, Diamante muttered, you are a fucking genius. Treble then said quote, oh, I think I gotta go. Have fun on your side. See ya. By the call was abruptly cut, and the subordinate pirates of Diamante, all stared at the Den Den Mushi, in disbelief unsure of what they just heard. Ah, wait. Diamante turned and gazed at the pirates. Did you hear what he just said? The pirates all froze up in response to Diamante's question. Then, they looked at each other with pale faces, before turning back to Diamante and shaking their heads in fright. Diamante, scratching the back of his head, turned away from them. All right then. The pirates visibly relaxed, knowing that they were about to be killed. And just as they thought so, Diamante, who was observing the front with his binoculars again, suddenly shouted, All of you, get ready to engage your ha 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 ha. We finally found that Diamante's eyes widened in anticipation, the land full of perfect candidates, Amazon Lily. You ha ha ha, it's just as Doffy said. The atmosphere of the ship suddenly changed. The pirates' eyes adopted a mix of greed and lust as they gazed at the island in the middle of the calm belt. Attic and this day, Amazon Lily met an invasion that they never faced before. September 14th, 1505 a week before, Smoker received a call from his pink-haired colleague. Smoker, are you there? Hina. Hina didn't finish her words back then but it was clear what she was trying to say. Smoker asked back then, four different royals were given the privilege of being escorted. Apart from you, there are divisions under the following officers. Vice Admiral Bayard, Vice Admiral Tensei, and Vice Admiral Onagumo, the well-known followers of the Absolute Justice. Hina expressed her worry back then, of course Smoker knew. Doflamingo was seeding to kill him for months after all. As far as Smoker could deduce, they will probably turn the other way, ignoring Doflamingo's attack on him. Furthermore, if the civilians or nobles are to fall into danger due to Doflamingo, they will act in order to prevent any loss of reputation. Therefore, Smoker stated with confidence back then, and here they were in the present dock to the newly built port of Knockdown Island. Smoker stood behind King Mokwiko as the staircase was laid out from his ship to the port platform where the butlers and maids were standing in an orderly manner, bowing and welcoming the arrival of the world noble, Sambarabaraba. No wonder they said that Sabadi Park cannot dare to compete against this place, King Mokwika exclaimed in delight as he excitedly descended and walked through the bowing butlers and maids. All marines were moving out. Smoker, Aramaki Rosanante, Robin, and the other marine soldiers began to follow King Mokwika and his royal guards, with Kola holding Robin's hand with amazement in her eyes. They, walking on top of the red carpet that was laid out all the way from the port to the tallest building in the center came across the views of various attractions that were full of civilians. This way, please, a middle-aged butler said calmly as he opened the gate of entry into the tallest building. The inside was lit up by the luxurious chandeliers, which contributed to showcasing the well-designed interior. It was essentially a banquet hall full of delectable foods and drinks, filled with fellow world no nobles who enjoyed a nice meal among themselves. Sambarabaraba. What a paradise Mokwika, screaming in joy, ditched the rest of his group and ran toward the food bar. A King Mokwika please wait for us. His royal guards, sweating profusely, immediately followed the king. The butler, who served as a guide, bowed skillfully before moving away leaving Smoker and his division standing by themselves. Ah, Smoker-san, should we follow the king? Rosinante, who was trying his best to hide his nervousness, asked Smoker, we're tasked with protecting him, right? Aramaki, on the other hand, mumbled, where is Joker, that despicable scum? For one, never let your guard. As for the king, I got him covered. Smoker finally stated after briefly looking around the room, also, be suspicious of everything around you, ah. If it isn't Marine's pride, Rear Admiral Smoker. Then, a voice came from Smoker's left. Turning in that direction, Smoker and his division saw a handsome man with orange-colored hair. Vice Admiral Bayard, one whom Smoker came across a couple of times before, and the younger brother of Cedar Heavy Admiral Blaze. Vice Admiral Bayard, long time no see. Smoker replied casually, I heard about your noble feats in the Sabadi archipelago. Prevented every single slave ship from reaching the human auction shop. A hey. Bayard, acting friendly, then draped his arm around Smoker's shoulder and pulled him away from the rest of his division, trying to separate me from my subordinates. I guess I'll comply for now. Smoker, not resisting Bayard's lead, began to walk along with the orange-haired Vice Admiral. While doing so, he turned back and looked at Aramaki, who nodded back at him before leading the rest of the division elsewhere. And now, Tensei, Onagumo, guess who I brought here? Smoker was in front of one round table, where two Marine Vice Admirals were silently enjoying their meals. Rear Admiral Smoker, Tensei, whose eyes were hidden behind his sunglasses, nodded stoically, pleased to meet you. I believe that this isn't the first time we've met. Onagumo, on the other hand, simply frowned as he chewed on a piece of steak completely ignoring Smoker's presence. 
Bayard, smiling pleasantly, took a seat and pointed at the sole empty seat, take a seat, smoker, and have a meal with us. Smoker, in response, saluted lazily, greetings to senior marines. I will excuse myself then, before complying with Bayard's wish and taking a seat. On table, there lied delectable dishes, which Smoker didn't bother to look even once. Rear, Admiral Smoker, then Onagumo suddenly growled, glaring at Smoker with evident disdain. Why did you kick Shepard out? Smoker's eyes gleamed in interest. Oh, were you the one who recommended that useless man to my division, Vice Admiral Onagumo? Bam, useless. Onagumo slammed his fist on the table. Did you just say that my nephew is useless, Kondoriano is Onagumo's nephew? Smoker, not affected by Onagumo's outburst at all. Snorted, if he isn't useless, then who is? Must I really explain any further? Onagumo, unable to bear his rage any further, stood up from his spot. Why, you, whoa, whoa, calm down, Onagumo. Bayard, smiling in a troubled manner, held his hands out at the seething Onagumo. He then turned to Smoker with the same smile. And you should apologize as well, Smoker. You know that it isn't nice to insult one's own family member. How idiotic. Then, Tensei said while placing his glass of wine down. I side with Rear Admiral Smoker in this matter. Lieutenant Commander Shepard, he's recently joined the Bureau of Investigation, and showcased nothing but uselessness as Rear Admiral Smoker quoted. If not for you, Onagumo, I would have stripped him of his rank already. Onagumo, gritting his teeth angrily, then turned to Tensei, and now you're picking on me however, Onagumo's words were never completed as tap, tap. One blonde man with flamboyant sunglasses and a pink feather coat entered and made his way into the hall, with a grin on his face and his hands in his pockets. So that's how Joker looks, one noble with a black mustache whispered. Hum, he looks younger than I thought though. However, Smoker's eyes narrowed instead, strange. Though I've never seen Doflamingo face to face before, one standing in front of me right now something feels off. Doflamingo making his way to the center of the hall, spread his arms wide open and stated, Ha 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 ha, welcome, dear hegemons of the world. Have you enjoyed your meal? Everyone, falling silent, placed their eyes on him. That isn't Doflamingo. I don't sense a particular will within that man. And at the same time, Smoker concluded. But question is, what's the point behind the entrance of this fake Doflamingo Smoker's eyes gleamed in crimson as he quickly turned his head to the back. He could see that all of his subordinates' eyes were placed toward the fake Doflamingo, and Rosinante, in contrast to them, was walking out of the hall as if flood by something. Now that everyone arrived, why don't get straight into the business? I know that you didn't come for boring things outside. I know what exactly my fellow nobles want. Please, follow me. It was nice meeting the three of you. Smoker, cutting his attention off from fake Doflamingo's words, stood up from his seat. They had raised his eyebrow. Oh, but you haven't eaten anything yet. Isn't it too early to go? Tensei simply gazed at Smoker stoically. Onagumo didn't even bother to make an eye contact with him. I'm not here to fool around, Vice Admiral Baird. And please, though your hospitality was pleasant, Smoker, whose justice coat covered back was facing the Vice Admirals now then stated while turning his head and gazing at Bayard through the corners of his eyes, don't act as if we're friends, will you? Bayard, for the first time upon hearing Smoker's words, had his smile faltered. Smoker, ignoring Bayard's demeanor, walked up to Aramaki, who was sitting along with the rest of Smoker's division. Aramaki moved his eyes to Smoker upon noticing the latter's approach, and Smoker whispered, Rosinante disappeared. Aramaki's eyes widened. He turned to his left and right, and found that Smoker's words were true. Don't worry though, I know where he is. Smoker patted Aramaki on the shoulder, and continued, I'm going to go and fetch him, so ensure to keep Arobi and Cola within your sight. And forget Mokwika, I'll take the blame if he dies from the crossfire. Crossfire? Huh? Aramaki murmured, before nodding seriously, will the other marines help, Smoker-san? Smoker chuckled as he lifted his hand up from Aramaki's shoulder, good question, and silently exited the hall, to the direction in which Rosinante went to. At the same time, Aramaki let out a small laugh, Rahahaha you gotta be kidding me. The longer and longer Aramaki stayed in marine, the more he learned, of just how different Smoker was from the rest of the marines. Within a dark room that was lightened up by the dim light, there lied a cell that resembles that of a prison. Within the cell, there was one beautiful girl with straight black hair, trembling as two men gazed at her from the outside. There her here, what a success you've accomplished, Diamante. Treble, one of two men, said in amazement, I was expecting a substantial loss during this expedition, and yet, you completely exceeded my expectation. Diamante, the other one, stood with his hand on his chin, not falling into his usual antic of denying praise for him until it stopped. He hummed thoughtfully. It was strange though, Treble. All I did was place a spoon on top of the already prepared meal. When I arrived at the Amazon Lily, these warriors Diamante eyed the young girl 
they were already in a poor condition as if having undergone a huge battle recently. There was barely any fight, and I simply captured whoever was in the sight. Treble grinned, Behahe, that's something that we don't have to be concerned about. Only the result matters, and not the cause. Then, reaching his hand to where his stomach lied, Treble took out a mucus-covered chest from it. A young girl. Notably beautiful even by my standards. Furthermore, from Amazon Lily, meaning that she's got no human rights. Treble opened the chest revealing a strange patterned fruit from within. One fortunate encounter leads to another. A beauty having eaten the fruit meant for beauty's behaha. Now this is what we call the grand prize of the auction. Left in an Aramaki. And in addition, the rest of the 31st Division. Aramaki, still seated, raised his head up and saw that the Vice Admiral wearing a black suit underneath his justice coat, Tensei, walked up to him. Naturally, Aramaki stood up to greet the superior appropriately. However, Froza's Tensei spoke into his ear. I'll say it once and clear. The celestial dragons expressed their fury. Robin instinctively placed Kola behind her. Aramaki's eyes sharpened. His lips twitched as if about to say something, but he managed to hold it back. Tensei then continued, We understand your noble wish to resolve the injustice of the sea. However, your division has gone too far this time around, and you've mistaken the very notion of justice itself. Aramaki spoke in a low tone, Please elaborate. Justice is an ambiguous and arguable concept. Depending on one's perspective, its characteristic and direction can change by 180 degrees. In other words, one's justice alone cannot avoid a bias. Tensei said calmly, and therefore, the only way to deduce the true justice is to set a standard. Law. Tensei, shifting his eyes at young Kola who stood behind Robin, said, Slavery is immoral. Indeed, it is immoral to enslave a fellow human being. However, the regals who are not governed by the world government don't have human rights. Enslaving those without rights doesn't violate the law, and thus doesn't violate justice. Do you get what I'm trying to say, Lieutenant? Aramaki hid his clenched up fists by placing them in his pockets. Tensei's words seemed coaxing at first glance, and he had to admit that he may have been persuaded if he didn't meet Smoker. Rear Admiral Smoker's actions in Sabaudi Archipelago weren't that of righteousness, but of mere foolishness. He directly interrupted the Celestial Dragon's entertainment and almost managed to end it permanently. Tensei adjusted his sunglasses. Oaking our superiors will result in the reduction of our funding. Not only will our salaries be cut, but the pressure that Marine can exert in the sea will notably decrease. Your commander doesn't understand the idea of greater good, and I tell you, if Vice Admiral Garpin Kuzin didn't stand up for him relentlessly, he would have suffered multiple demotions already. What's the point of saying all this to me? What are you trying to say? Simple, stay here and do nothing regardless of what may happen at the next moment. Our responsibility only lies on protecting the nobles here, as well as the civilians on the outside. Tensei slowly reached his hand out at Kola, and gently ruffled the girl's hair. Heavenly Demon didn't violate a law so far. For after he's become the warlord, all his past deeds were forgotten. Keep your eyes open and think for yourself. Aramaki lowered his head in response. His bangs covered his eyes and his lips were shut tight. Then, Rahahaha, he chuckled all of a sudden as he finally replied to Tensei's words, noted Vice Admiral Tensei. Aramaki, he realized that this was just a simple matter. Have you already expected this far, Smoker-san? Though he was wondering what the issue was with Rosinante, Tensei was simply telling him not to interfere when the Don Quixote pirates attack Smoker. Doflamingo is already aware of your feats. Gathering up all his forces, he set up a pit to ensure his victory. Now, you will probably be facing hordes of pirates. Tensei gazed at Aramaki with a raised eyebrow as the latter sat back down in his seat. Then, his eyes met Robin who looked back at him with light in her eyes. Yes, both of them believed in their commander's might that he will be the one standing in the end. Rosinante, it's been years, hasn't it? It was in the middle of an unknown hallway far away from the banquet hall, illuminated by the sunlight that shone through the windows. In here, Rosinante stood with a solemn expression as he faced the blonde man wearing flamingo-like attire. Don Quixote do Flamingo, his long-lost brother. And that wasn't it. Behind do Flamingo stood one huge man wearing golden armor. Picker. Rosinante mumbled, Doflamingo. Previously, it wasn't that Rosinante wanted to leave. Rather, his body moved by itself as if being controlled by someone. Taking a ladder that led to the pit and descending to the underground. Walking through a dark tunnel and passing through a hidden port that harbored countless pirate ships, where the pirates gazed at him in amusement. By the time he regained control of his body, he was in here. Fufufufu, I sure haven't expected to reunite with you like this. I mean, Doflamingo then grinned while leaning his body forward to think that you the one who has the blood of God running down your veins as I do, has become a loyal servant yourself, oi, Rosinante, you were forced to do so, right? 
Rosinante frowned as Doflamingo asked with certainty, it must be. My very own biological brother, you won't willingly disgrace me by staining yourself dirty with the title of marine right? Doflamingo's words rang into his ears. Rosinante couldn't help but reminisce. The nightmare, the death of his father, the aimless wander, followed by meeting his benefactor, Sengoku, training to become strong, and learning the value of morality, and the bonds that he managed to form in the 31st Division. Smoker, something about him was different. Rosinante knew that his ideal was far different from the justice that Marine followed, that he truly wished to change the world for the better. Rosinante wanted to be like that man confident and determined, and if he wished to do so, he couldn't afford to yield to his trauma even if it were to lead to his death. I will stay true to myself Rosinante gathered his resolve, for a worthless life is worse than a worthy death. Don quicks at Doflamingo. Therefore, Rosinante, erasing any trace of fear from his voice, said to the man who used to be his brother, Our brotherhood ended during that day when you killed my father. Rosinante took out a cigarette from his pocket and lit it up, taking a puff out of it. He said seriously, the only truth that you've spoken is the fact that I'm a marine. So tell me, warlord, for what reason did you bring me here? Doflamingo's grin dropped. He, who had the veins popping out of his forehead, growled. Are you denying your blood, Rosinante? Rosinante brought the cigarette away from his mouth and stated, What blood are you talking of? Blood of God. Oh, please, he glared at Doflamingo firmly and declared from the start to the end. I was a human. And so are you, Doflamingo. Picker's eyes exhibited rage upon hearing Rosinante's words. He took a step forward impulsively, however, was stopped by Doflamingo, who raised his hand up. I see, so you decided to side with that white hunter who killed my family member. Doflamingo slowly extended his right hand toward Rosinante. Rosinante, widening his eyes, immediately jumped to his left, and just when he did so, then die as a disgrace. Swoosh. Doflamingo swiped his right hand vertically, and as he did so, the wall behind Rosinante was cut clean. ECH. Rosinante gritted his teeth as he jumped up. Swoosh. Evading a horizontal slice that left a mark on the floor. Fuffa fuffu. How weak you are, Rosinante. Doflamingo dashed at Rosinante with his fingers curled up like talons. He continuously lashed his hands out at the blonde marine, and the latter couldn't do anything but utilize his mastery over Sorrow and Geppo to dodge the consecutive attacks. Swoosh, swoosh, swoosh. If you're waiting for White Hunter, give it up, Rosinante. Doflamingo laughed as he attacked crazily. Fafa Fafu, you saw just how many pirates were stationed as you traveled here. Rosinante received a small gash on his cheek. The blood dripped out of it, but he didn't have time to care for it as another one came his way just after. Swoosh. Then, Rosinante's eyes widened in realization. These aren't invisible slashes whatsoever. These are... Rosinante thought while backstepping from Doflamingo, strings swoosh. Ka. Rosinante, having failed to dodge Doflamingo's next attack, felt a deep slash on his abdomen, swoosh, followed by another on his leg. Rosinante lost footing as a result, and boom, crashed onto a wall. Ha ha, Rosinante grimaced in pain as his dizzy vision settled down. And then, he saw Doflamingo casually walking up to him. Tap, tap. Doflamingo's shadow loomed over him, and simultaneously, numerous strings suddenly sprang into existence, tying Rosinante before the latter could do anything. Then, Doflamingo raised his leg up, string saw. Between the heel of his foot and the midsection of his leg was one sharp string that gleamed upon receiving the sunlight. Doflamingo exclaimed coldly, Goodbye Marine. Rosinante watched as Doflamingo's string saw slowly descended toward him. Doom. Rosinante knew that there was no way for him to make his way out of this situation. It was his doom as far as he could deduce. It's just as he says Rosinante thought as he made a slight smile on his face. The number of pirates in that port was far too many. I suppose Clang. Another leg entered Rosinante's sight. Smoker San. Rosinante's eyes widened as he saw the face of the familiar white-haired man. Smoker, gazing down at Rosinante, asked, Are you alright? Strange. How strange Rosinante thought. Why do I feel at ease when I see you? I, I have something to tell you. Rosinante's lips uncontrollably quivered. Doflamingo's string saw was no longer within his sight as he asked Smoker, I lie to you about my name. It isn't Rosie, but Rosinante. How did you get here, White Hunter? Doflamingo gritted his teeth in disbelief as he attempted to push his leg down at Rosinante's throat. However, Smoker's leg didn't falter even once. Nice name you got there, Smoker casually replied. There is more. Pars. Pars. Why? You Doflamingo growled in anger. But Smoker's eyes were still locked onto Rosinante. I am the biological brother of Don Quixote Doflamingo. 
one who's committed many wrongs. Smoker nodded, all right. Rosinante's voice trembled. I, I, I used to be a celestial dragon, one of those folks who committed many wrongs. I didn't tell you because I was afraid. Afraid that you may reject me just like others. But still, I can't help but hope will you accept me as it is. Wahahaha. What a silly question. Smoker, laughing heartily, replied firmly, you are my friend Rosinante. That's all that matters to me. Then, White Hunter, the extreme pressure of will sprang out from Doflamingo. It was none other than the Haki of Supreme King One, that is bestowed to a select few, even among the select few who managed to awaken Haki. Doflamingo's will dominated the entire area, as the windows tremored and the rubble on the floor were pushed back. And here, Smoker didn't yield. He stood against Doflamingo's will adamantly, before boom. He too, blasted forth the vigorous Haki of Supreme King causing Doflamingo to flinch in response. You are kidding me, at the back, Picker muttered in an absurdly high-pitched tone. How does that man possess the color of Supreme King Gar? Pause. The black lightning burst out from the clash between Smoker and Doflamingo as the two wills of Supreme Kings met one another. The entire hallway was overwhelmed by extreme pressure, and Picker, who was shocked by the sudden development of the situation, unconsciously shielded his face. Rosinante, lying below the clash that he's never seen before, was sweating profusely from the sheer force that shredded his will. Boom. And finally, the clash ended as Doflamingo's leg was knocked back. Landing back on the floor, at some distance away, he glared at Smoker, who leaned down to Rosinante, and, still no smoking though, removed the cigarette from the blonde's mouth. The cigarette was dropped onto the floor. Without speaking any word, Smoker stood back up, giving Rosinante time to recuperate. He then shifted his eyes at Doflamingo, who gazed back at him with lingering hatred. Treble Diamante, gather at the hallway behind port number 4 immediately. From Doflamingo's back, Pika was found speaking into a Den Den Mushy. That light at the corner of the hallway. His high-pitched voice resounded across the area. However, neither Smoker nor Doflamingo bothered to react against. On the floor, the cigarette's tip was found to be still lit. The frail wisp of smoke traveled upward from the cigarette tip, which Doflamingo frowned upon. Its silent Rosinante thought as he touched the scar on his abdomen, where the wound was previously closed off by Smoker burning it. Silent, though I didn't necessarily mute anyone. And then, one window abruptly shattered. Doflamingo was suddenly found to be standing right in front of Rosinante, with his hand outstretched at the latter. His wrist was held by Smoker, who swiftly redirected Doflamingo's attack toward where that now broken window lied. Fufufufu Doflamingo grinned, in a way that exhibited his rage. Though his eyes were hidden behind his sunglasses, Smoker could tell that the former was looking at him. Who do you think you are? White Hunter. Boom. Just as he said so, a huge fist made out of stone impacted Smoker from the side. However, Smoker didn't falter. Even as the stone fist continued to push against his cheek, Smoker simply replied to Doflamingo, a marine. Then, wide out. A huge volume of white smoke suddenly burst out from Smoker, flooding into the entire room. Doflamingo, flinching in response, quickly jumped out of the hallway through the broken window along with Picker, who quickly followed him from behind. And using that moment of time to his advantage, Smoker quickly spoke something into Rosinante's ears. On the other hand, Doflamingo and Picker landed on top of a grassy plain. They watched smoke-filled hallway with wariness in their eyes. And one figure, Smoker, suddenly flew out of it. Fafafafu, Doflamingo met the attack of the approaching white head marine by swiping his right hand five color strings. Swoosh. From Doflamingo's hand left five strings that vibrantly glowed in mesmerizing rainbow color. However, such strings simply passed through Smoker as the latter morphed the specific sections of his body into smoke and separated, effectively dodging them. And now, Smoker stood right in front of Doflamingo, with his left hand holding onto one swirling ball of white smoke. Swoo! Doflamingo frowned while jumping back, feeling danger from said white ball of smoke. The strings immediately sprang out from his feet and shoulders, and attached the other ends to the clouds above. Subsequently, those strings pulled Doflamingo up high to the sky, away from Smoker's technique bomb. Dash, or so Doflamingo thought, before the white ball of smoke was slammed onto his crossed arms at the next moment. The extent of force was enough to send Doflamingo flying back and he barely managed to regain his sense before crashing into the terrain. Duffy simultaneously, Picker's loud voice boomed forth. The ground below then shook, before a huge figure made out of stone emerged from within. This stone giant resembled Picker's appearance. Don't worry, Picker, Doflamingo replied as he kept himself afloat by the strings attached to the clouds, for Fafu I'm just getting started. On the other hand, Smoker landed back on the plane. He, uncaring of Doflamingo's words, looked around his surroundings. At the corner of his eyes, he sighted the distant Doflamingo Park. It seemed that this area was on the other side of the island, away from where the civilians were. With many marines located there, an idiotic situation such as holding hostages won't happen. The remaining concern then was the chance of there being slaves somewhere in that park, which is a task I left to Rosinante. 
Smoker, facing off the huge stone giant and man in a pink flamingo-like coat, chuckled. Then the only thing left for me to do, is to beat the shit out of these filths. Smoker reached his hand to his back and unsheathed Shusui. The black blade gleamed upon receiving the sunlight, and its metallic appearance spoke nothing but ferociousness. Hey, black blade, Doflamingo muttered gravely. That weapon may be a little troubling indeed. At the next moment, Pika's stone giant began its move. Clenching its stone made fist, it punched forth towards Smoker. However, Smoker then vanished from his spot. Boom. Pika expressed confusion as his stone made fist suddenly broke into pieces. Boom. His stone made right arm was destroyed by a potent impact from below. Pika's eyes widened, realizing that Smoker was simply moving at an incredible speed that he couldn't follow with his eyes. Then, clang. Doflamingo intervened Smoker's next blow with haki covered strings which were intertwined to produce resiliency and toughness. Doflamingo then pointed his palm at Smoker within point-blank range, overheat. Swoosh! A rope made by condensing many strings altogether shot out from Doflamingo's palm. Due to the friction, said rope glowed in bright orange emanating intense heat. However, Doflamingo frowned as Smoker, simply by forming a hole in the middle of his chest caused said rope to pass through him without any damage. And then, Doflamingo realized that Smoker's sword, Shusui, couldn't be found within his sight. Instead, Smoker's arm was elongated by condensed white smoke, and said elongated smoke arm was circling around Doflamingo boom. Pika quickly intercepted the approaching Shusui, held by Smoker's smoke-made arm, by placing his stone-made hand on top of Doflamingo. From one strike alone, the stone-made hand crumbled into pieces, and at the same time, Smoker pointed the index finger of his other hand at Doflamingo, Tobushigen. White bullet, clang. Doflamingo grimaced as he felt a hard blow on his stomach, which he shielded by immersing with armament haki. Smoker's elongated arm still remained intact, holding onto Shusui tightly. He then swung it around like a whip, slamming it toward the midsection of Pika's stone giant. Boom. Once, boom. Twice, boom. 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 Thrice, and more. Smoker, through the skillful use of his smoke-made arm, spun Shusui around him at an incredible pace resembling a windmill, when viewed from far distance away. Interestingly enough, each one of his strike, instead of cutting through the stone, blasted it into pieces like a dull weapon. Boom 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 boom. Smoker grinned as he bulldozed through the stone giant, white spiral. Within seconds, Pika was exposed to the fresh air, with the entirety of his stone giant shredded into pieces. He, expressing nothing but disbelief, couldn't do anything but watch as Smoker's shoe sweep butchered his left arm at the next moment. Swoosh! HHHHH Pika screamed in horror as he began to fall rapidly with the blood pouring out from his left arm. Pika! Doflamingo shouted angrily before launching himself at Smoker. He shot out his hand boom, 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 which began to continuously shoot out the thick ropes that he termed as overheat. Smoker, watching as said ropes approached him at once, retracted his smoke-made arm and caught Shusui by his actual hand. He then swung Shusui horizontally. White wave. Whoosh. A huge volume of white smoke was released at the next moment. It quickly traveled and enveloped tens of orange ropes that resembled missiles. Smoker then snapped his fingers, transmutation. Black. The white smoke morphed into multiple snakes, which all coiled around the flying ropes. Upon Smoker's call, they simultaneously turned black in color, before, boom, exploding simultaneously. Doflamingo, who was rapidly flying at Smoker, was knocked back due to the impact generated by the explosions. Ha ha, at the same time, Pika Wobbly stood up from the area of his crash, while preventing further blood loss, by covering the stump of his left arm with rocks. He whispered in a shaky tone, W what just what kind of monster have we touched? Or, Pika. Doflamingo, noticing the state that Pika was within, shouted at the man out of panic, snap out of it, Doflamingo hurriedly ran toward Pika. He was sweating profusely, truly afraid of what was about to happen to Pika at the current moment. Pika's eyes widened upon hearing Doflamingo's statement, waking up from his trance. By then, he realized tap, that Smoker was standing right in front of him, and that Smoker's palm encased by armament haki. Hardening was in contact with his exposed chest. And then, Pika heard his death sentence. Black impact. Boom. It was such a devastating technique. Smoker directly pushed the explosive black smoke through the pores on Pika's skin, and had them explode from the inside, effectively destroying Pika's internal organs with one single blow. Though Smoker would have too received damage as well if he were to use this technique three years ago. Now, he was capable of protecting himself with armament haki. Pika's eyes hollowed out, and from his agape mouth, smoke existed. He, not having any strength to latch onto the realm of living, fell down to the ground with a thud. Pika and Doflamingo was one step late. The bullet-like bundles of strings that he shot towards Smoker they arrived only a second later, and Smoker, having seen this coming through the use of his observation haki, morphed the specific sections of his body into smoke, and created gaps to evade those string bullets. Doflamingo's body trembled as he gazed at Pika's corpse. 
It was an abrupt and unexpected death that resulted from the Don Quixote pirate's complacency. First Virgo, then Pika, Smoker, twirling Shusui around, said coldly, who's next? Smoker looked to his right, where the five of Don Quixote family's executives, Treble, Diamante, Laoji, Matchwise, and Gladius, stood with their eyes widened in disbelief. Behind them, hundreds of pirates stood with their guns held up against Smoker, ready to shoot at any time. Oi, Treble forced a shaky grin on his face. Why you're kidding, right? It, it's only been 10 minutes since Picker called us, so why? The grin dropped from Treble's face, and he shouted, Why is Picker dead in front of us? The entirety of Don Quixote family gulped. The sweats poured down from their bodies as they gazed at this Marine, Smoker. Prior to arriving here, they saw at port number 4 that thousands of pirates were all knocked out. Furthermore, they knew how strong Picker was, and how much, much stronger Doflamingo was. Smoker. He dealt with thousands of pirates before reaching Doflamingo and Pika, and subsequently managed to kill Pika even while facing the two of them at once. The Don Quixote family began to feel dread as chills ran down their spines. I'll kill you. Doflamingo then whispered at Smoker, I'll pluck out your nails and teeth. I'll pull out your eyes and eat them in front of you. I'll slice you into pieces and feed them to dogs. I'll ensure you the worst kind of death you can ever imagine. You said something similar months ago. Smoker, unfazed by Doflamingo's cursing, bickered while resting Shusui on his shoulder. Are you all bark and no bite, Joker? Doflamingo saw nothing but red. And then every present member of Don Quixote family launched their attacks on Smoker, simultaneously. Guess. While the intense battle between Smoker and the entire Don Quixote family was ongoing above, Senor Pink was on the underground floor of the Doflamingo Park. He, seemingly conflicted, asked within the darkness, why do you think I joined this crew? Back then, he heard. The top executive officer of the Don Quixote family, Treble He, was chatting with Diamante through the Den Den Mushy. Senor Pink was standing behind the door back then, overhearing that Treble fabricated Jola's supposed betrayal. Tap, tap. Within this darkness, a set of footsteps were heard, before one blonde with tattered marine attire, Rosinante, revealed himself. Senor Pink then chuckled, it was because I wanted a family. Growing up as an orphan and having no one to trust, but myself. I was delighted when the young boss approached and asked me to join his family. And now, I came to learn that this family was nothing but a play in the end. Rosinante didn't respond and instead, stared at Senor Pink seriously. I talked far too much, didn't I? My apologies. Senor Pink, gaining a serious demeanor himself then held his fists up come young boss's biological brother. Rosinante and Senor Pink rushed against each other before starting a fight of their own. Boom. Though the noise was subtle, it resounded across the entire knockdown island. The civilians, enjoying their time in Doflamingo Park, began to express annoyance. Boom. Then, they realized that multiple pirate ships suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Those ships rapidly sailed away from the island toward the far horizon, and this served as a phenomenon that implemented fear into civilians. Are we wait, what's going on? One man cried before pulling his daughter out of an amusement ride. Come, Rusty, we're getting out of here right now. But Papa, no buts. Said pirate ships, of course, harbored numerous pirates. They were the ones whom Doflamingo hid within this island, as well as the smart fellows who realized that the situation wasn't going in their favor. Ooh, um, are you sure about this, Captain? One pirate on the frontmost ship among the distant pirate ships expressed his nervousness. If Doflamingo finds out about us, he'll kill us. The captain of the crew immediately barked back, idiot. Do you think Doflamingo will even be alive by then? Do you have an idea of what kind of monster Doflamingo touched? He pointed his finger back at the knockdown island that they were traveling away from. White Hunter was on that island that freaking White Hunter. One who killed not only Nightmare, but also Hellblaze. How the hell do you think Doflamingo can stand victorious against that man? His hands then trembled as he continued. Three years ago I, Ferdinand was there. I saw the might of Nightmare Gecko Moria. The huge fella whose rumors matched his strength. And I also witnessed back then the fall of that nightmare against White Hunter. And three years passed. I bet you Doflamingo doesn't even have 1% change of winning boom. Abuwa then, a pirate ship that sailed adjacent to theirs, suddenly exploded into pieces. The captain stopped his words and gazed at the cloud of smoke with widened eyes. Then, as the smoke cleared, they saw one marine ship triumphantly sailing toward them with cannons aimed at their ship. On top of said marine ship that faced Ferdinand's pirate ship, three individuals were found. One pink-haired woman, Hina, and two men, Akahand and Shu. Ah, are you sure about this, Hina? There are tons of pirate ships around us right now, Gar. We're all going to die, Shu screamed in horror, and Hina, in response, clicked her tongue while putting on the black gloves on her hands. Shut up. Hina's is hurt. Hina growled before kicking Shu away. She then shouted at Akahand. What the hell are you waiting for? Load the cannonballs. Why yes ma'am. Akahand responded with underlying fear before hurriedly running to the back. A week ago, 
smoker requested through the Den Den Mushi back then, next to Hina was Zephyr, who was listening to the conversation. And he said back then, eh, some real experiences won't hurt. Go, take those five buffoons with you. So here she was in the present with Shu, Akahan, Hina Senpai, a permission to engage. Ain, who held onto a sword as she locked her eyes on the distant pirates. Hum. Now this is what we call a challenge. Bins, who conducted an odd dance that seemed like a ritual of some sort. Bararara I was wondering when things will get interesting. And Shuzo, a newcomer to Zephyr's training program during Smoker's absence. Six remaining pirate ships in sight, Hina stated coldly. Their abrupt run means that they've cut their ties with Don Quixote family, and thus are alleged criminals. Make sure that not a single one escapes. In response to her words, Ain smiled, while Bins and Shuzo grinned excitedly. And then, within the sea nearby Knockdown Island, the battle of four six marines against six pirate crews has begun. Within the grassy plain where the bright sky illuminated its mesmerizing scenery, numerous individuals surrounded one whitehead marine officer, Smoker. His justice coat shone brightly upon receiving the sunlight, and from the gist of it, there wasn't even a single tear. Bang 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 bang. In contrast to the gentle wind, the endless supply of bullets flew at Smoker. Some pirates held onto mere rifles, and select few managed to get their hands on more extensive ones, such as Gatling guns. However, Smoker simply stood by. His body generated numerous holes upon the bullets flying through him. However, those holes emitted wisps of smoke instead of blood, indicating no harm at all. For Bright, then, within this chaos of bullets, five sharp strings, coated in armament haki suddenly flew towards Smoker from Doflamingo. Smoker, identifying those strings, slashed Shusui upward clang, parrying them effectively. At the same time, clicking sounds were heard from all around, the pirates' faces turned pale as they realized that they ran out of ammos. And just as the gunfire ceased, Karida Glaive Diamante charged in at Smoker with his sword bizarrely flattened and folded to resemble that of a bull. Ha! Huh. The huge man with a blond beard, Matchvise, jumped high in the air and spread his limbs, as he began to fall at a rapid speed. Ten Ton Vise the man who seemed abnormally old in comparison to the rest of the pirates. Lao Ji, bulked up in an instant before dashing towards Smoker alongside Diamante, Geo Fist Ultimate Technique, Battle Insurance Fist. Gladius, holding onto an exquisitely designed pistol, shot a round of bullets that abruptly inflated as they flew, Pop Baller. Sticky, Launcher, treble from his hand threw multiple balls of mucus at Smoker. Together, it was an absolute mess, with all kinds of attacks flying in from everywhere. The booming noises, the loud war cries, and the gentle wind. Smoker thought as he closed his eyes. All noises around his, except for the rustling sounds of wind, muffled out. And there, he reflected the eyes of those women under Barman's slavery ones that were filled with despair. The state that young children were in, within that filthy state of a ship. The sheer number of civilians whom he rescued from the hands of slave dealers. For the past few months, Smoker went through the epitome of human greed, those who forsook their humanity for the sake of money. And at the top, Doflamingo stood manipulating them with his petty strings. Swoo the attacks from the executives of Don Quixote family, they were now right in front of his eyes as he opened them. The muffled noises returned back to him, and the gentle wind has become negligible to his skin. How laughable, and there, Smoker, with his eyes shaded by his bangs, snarled in disgust before vanishing from his spot. Boom. HH Diamante, with Smoker's absence, was blasted back by the combined techniques of Treble and Gladius. Lao Ji, appearing where Smoker stood until just a moment ago, punched through nothing but thin air, before Matchfires crashed onto him from above. Thud. Doflamingo. Gritting his teeth as his facial expression uncontrollably trembled, let out a cold sweat upon one of the pirate goons, flopping to the ground with his mouth foaming. Thud. One, two, three Doflamingo watched as one by one, his subordinates fell. The executives too, watched their surroundings warily, as the pirates fell with their eyes hollowed out, next to the already dead picker. Thud 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 thud. The will of Supreme King, Doflamingo felt the hair on his skin standing up. Smoker's haki it wasn't the same as what he experienced minutes ago. At its full might, here Doflamingo helplessly stood, with the subtle fear creeping into his soul. Then, Doflamingo instinctively reacted, clang, meeting Smoker's haki imbued fist with his haki imbued left arm, black blow, boom. Doflamingo's vision then shifted, before he felt an inexplicable pain from the area of impact. Do, Doffy W what just happened? Doflamingo, trying to regain his sense while he was flying up in the air, turned his head to the area in which he felt the pain from gone. Shh, huh? Doflamingo's left arm was missing a hand. Instead, there was a bloody stump. And then, he also noticed a white trail of smoke that extended all the way from his body to Smoker's right hand. White hook. Then, Doflamingo was suddenly yanked back towards Smoker. Doflamingo, even forgetting the pain, quickly generated numerous strings from all around his body to protect himself. Cocoon Smoker's fist easily penetrated through his string-made dome. And, Black Blow. Boom. 
Doflamingo vomited blood as he was mercilessly punctured by Smoker's fist, by the exact same technique once again. Where, where is my family? Doflamingo thought as his entire body screamed in pain. What are they doing Tan? Doflamingo became pale as he felt the exact same grab by the white smoke on his body. White Hook. He was a chosen one born with Conqueror's Haki. Within his blood ran down the blood of Celestial Dragon the noblest heritage above all. In addition, he was the Joker the Underworld Powerhouse who was second only to the Mysterious Id. And yet how did I end up in this kind of situation? Doflamingo thought in exhaustion as Smoker held him by the neck with his right fist ready to punch the former for the third time. Black Clang. Four men suddenly struck their techniques on him. Let go of young boss now. Lao Ji shouted as he pushed his fist onto Smoker's shoulder. Og Diamante pushed his abnormally flattened sword made, with the ability of his ripple ripple fruit that exhibited sharpness, against Smoker's arm that held onto Doflamingo's neck. Hop Gladius was holding onto a rock, and the other end of the rock was in contact with Smoker's back. This rock was swelling up at a rapid speed due to his pop pop fruit. Shen NNNGGG match vice, increasing his weight to his maximum capacity with the use of his ton ton fruit, held back Smoker's right fist as hardest as he could. And, sticky sticky chain treble, generated a chain of mucus that latched onto Doflamingo's pink flamingo like attire, trying to pull his boss out of Smoker's grip. Higher! The five of them screamed at their utmost strength. They used every inch of energy they had to free Doflamingo from Smoker. And Smoker frowned in response, expressing nothing but annoyance. The fact that these scum's eyes were filled with determination it truly disgusted him. Then, Smoker's entire body began to turn metallic black in color indicating the full body armament Haki hardening. Swoo the smoke began to gather beneath Smoker's feet. It swelled smoothly, and the executives of Don Quixote family couldn't help but feel intimidated. Nonetheless, they gathered their resolve, let go of D-O-F-F-Y-Y, trying to save their boss from the hands of Smoker. Oh. No, 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 no. Doflamingo, witnessing as Smoker was coated by the armament Haki from head to toe, desperately thrashed against Smoker's grip. You won't dare, White Hunter. But the Marine's iron grip was far too strong. Doflamingo raised his right hand up and desperately blasted rounds of thick ropes over and over again. Overheat, 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 clang, clang, clang. But all was futile. Overheat and at the next moment, blackout. The entire surrounding was flooded by a huge volume of black smoke engulfing not only the executives, but also the unconscious goons of the Don Quixote family. Then, said black smoke combusted magnificently, boom. Then, there was silence. The subtle noises of bodies falling to the ground were heard, and as the smoke cleared from view, the burned and torn apart body parts of all five executives of Don Quixote family were scattered around the only standing man, Smoker. Without a doubt, all of them were dead. However, Doflamingo, on the other hand, though he too was lying with his bodies torn apart as well, Huff Huff, was slowly reattaching them back through the use of his strings. Huff Huff I Huff can't Huff die yet Doflamingo, as his body was being reassembled like a puzzle, slowly raised up his right hand at Smoker, who silently gazed down at him. Who Huff who are you Huff to look down on me? Doflamingo seemed to be one step away from death. He, latching onto the realm of living with all he had, muttered, 16 huff huff holy huff bullets park. A simple Tobishigan was fired from Smoker's index finger, said technique punctured Doflamingo's forehead, and ended the life of the heavenly demon. Smoker, coldly staring at the bloody corpse of Doflamingo, remarked, a fitting end for petty pirates, before turning around and walking away from the scene. Boom, boom. The noises quaked from the outside all the way to the banquet. The nobles, expressing fear and wariness, approached the station marines. Ma'am, and Bayard, smiling gently, replied, It is naught but a trivial thing. Soon, the noises will cease, so please calm yourself down. E but, are you sure about that one curly-haired woman wearing a luxurious dress said? I can see those people running crazy. And among them are marines whom I previously sent, Bayard stated softly, there is nothing to worry here. At the back, Aramaki sat by with a confident grin on his face. Across the table, there was Tensei, who gazed at the former with his arms crossed. Onagumo, standing in front of a window and assessing the ongoing situation outside, had a default frown on his face. The noises Robin, sitting along with the rest of the 31st Division, speculated, without a doubt, they are from the battle between Smoker and Heavenly Demon. It was a strange scene, Robin remarked. These marines, playing fools and acting as if knowing nothing, prevented them, the 31st Division, from reaching out to their commander to help him out. Let me tell you about the case of Vice Admiral Victorious that I came across. Robin thus deduced that this was yet another attempt of the world government to know. Something doesn't make sense Robin denied her own deduction. Smoker, disregarding all his deeds, is Vice Admiral Gup's sole apprentice. Also, he's a well-known individual to the public. There is no reason for the world government to target Smoker, when the benefits he is capable of bringing far outweigh his rebellious nature. She was overthinking, she realized. Slavery, Smoker's extensive measures to prevent a single case. 
He must have earned the remorse of celestial dragons, and they, being the regular customers of the human auction shop, directly allowed Doflamingo's permit to kill Smoker. That is probably the case. Cola, sitting near her, was found to be busily chewing the food in her mouth. The other marine soldiers of the 31st Division expressed their nervousness, looking back and forth between Aramaki and the direction in which Smoker exited. Tap, tap, tap. Then, the clear sounds of someone walking resounded across the area. Bayard, Tensei, and Onagumo simultaneously shifted their eyes at the exit of the banquet hall. So, it seems, Onagumo muttered, that the owner of this park finally decided to show his face. The three of them stiffened as the walking man wasn't revealed to be who they thought he was. EFF Aramaki, upon turning his head around and sighting the familiar face, burst out laughing. Rahahaha. What took you so long, Smoker-san? Said man, Smoker, revealed an amused grin of his own as he made his way to Aramaki and Robin's table. Before, tap. Smoker was stopped on by Bayard, who placed his hand on Smoker's shoulder. Why? Smoker, Bayard, smiling in a friendly manner, asked, I've been wondering where you've gone off to. Smoker, narrowing his eyes at the orange-haired vice admiral, swatted the latter's hand away. Creek. Tensei stood up from his seat. Onagumo moved his legs toward where Smoker faced Bayard. The three vice admirals stood in front of Smoker. I smell a metallic scent. Bayard whispered, what were you doing on the outside? The three pairs of eyes stared at Smoker frighteningly, asking for an explanation. Smoker, revealing nothing but impassiveness, replied coldly, I thought you knew. Smoker and Bayard glared at one another and the atmosphere in the banquet became intense. The nobles, unsure of why marines were opposing one another, looked to their left and right warily, while taking a few steps back. Their royal forces, readying themselves for a potential fight, stood in front of their masters. Rear, Admiral Smoker, what happened to Bayard, whose face darkened, was about to ask. However, Bayard Tensei, placing his hand on Bayard's shoulder, interrupted the latter, there are too many eyes watching. ECH. Clicking his tongue, Bayard wrinkled up his face. Placing his hands in his pockets, Bayard instead muttered, You've forsaken your duty to protect King Mokwika. Though your subordinates stayed in your stead, your long-lived absence during the duty cannot be justified, Jess. Yes, Smoker, expressing nothing but annoyance, walked past the three of them. Wine, report, whatever. Do what you want to do, Vice Admiral Bayard. And finally, Onagumo, unable to bear Smoker's attitude any longer. Growled. What happened to Heavenly Demon, Smoker? Bayard and Tensei urgently turned their heads at Onagumo, and Smoker, upon hearing such sentence, grinned victoriously with his back facing the three Vice Admirals. So you admit that you were aware, Smoker spoke coldly without facing the Vice Admirals, of the ambush that pirates set up for me. What? From what basis are you assuming such an atrocious metallic scent? How is that enough of an evidence for you to assume that I fought Heavenly Demon of all possibilities? The warlord who's allied to the world government. Smoker bickered, isn't Marine supposed to be an ally for him? Onagumo froze. Smoker, slightly turning his head, stared at Onagumo through the corners of his eyes. The shrewdness that Onagumo saw within Smoker's eyes they resembled those of snakes. So you knew Smoker chuckled, and you didn't intervene. The so-called Vice Admiral of Marine, letting a fellow Marine get attacked by a warlord where is justice in that? Tensei frowned at Onagumo, who seemed to have paled up in realization of how much impact his question had. Baird seemed to be in a deep thought, trying to make his way out. Finally, he spoke up, well done, Rear Admiral Smoker. He forced a shaky smile on his face. So you managed to stand victorious against Heavenly Demon, who betrayed the world government justice has been served. Ha! Huh. Smoker and Aramaki both let out a dumbfounded remark before, Rahahaha. Aramaki rolled on the ground, laughing uncontrollably, and, ha, huh, Smoker snorted in hilarity. Sure, let's go with that. The three vice admirals couldn't do anything but watch as Smoker walked away from them. The nobles whispered among themselves, confused and unable to fully comprehend what just happened. King Mokwika, Smoker lazily spoke as he walked toward the main exit of the banquet. Why yeah, Mokwika, who was spectating the scene, perked up upon Smoker's call. I apologize for my inconvenience but it seems that I am far too occupied currently to serve as a guard for you. Smoker pointed his thumb at Onagumo. Hence, from here on, Vice Admiral Onagumo will take on the role in my stead. Onagumo immediately retorted, Rear Admiral, since when did I agree to that? I am already assigned to yes, you didn't agree yet. I'm well aware, Smoker stated, but if you don't fulfill the duty, King Mokwika will be left alone. Besides, you are a spider, and a spider is quite good at dealing with bugs including Asakum. As Su what? Oh Mokwika, on the other hand, expressed his delight, Sambarabarabe instant accept. If there was anything that he could do to prevent himself from getting beaten up, Mokwika will accept it. Ignoring Onagumo, Smoker opened the door. Aramaki, Robin, and others within the 31st Division immediately followed, with Aramaki still chuckling uncontrollably with his hand over his eyes. Creak, and as the door opened, everyone came to see, a hey, Rosinante, 
Senor Pink, and numerous women with bandages wrapped around their wounds. Bayard, squinting his eyes in confusion, muttered, What in the hell no one here was able to assume that these women, all of who were from Amazon Lily, were supposed to be the slaves prepared for the auction. Then, slam, the door closed behind them with Smoker and his division having exited the banquet. Smoker, looking at Rosinante, said, Well done, Rosie Rosinante. Rosinante corrected with a genuine smile having cleared up the darkness within his heart. Rosinante, Smoker nodded with a look of approval. Robin's eyes widened upon hearing this, but quickly masked her emotion. Then, Smoker looked at Senor Pink and asked, And what about this man? Senor Pink, and yes, I'm aware, Rosinante stated, that he was an executive of Don Quixote family. Senor Pink, with cuffs on his wrists, was found dazing off at the blue sky above. However, Rosinante then shifted his eyes to women, and among them, one spoke up, men are trash. But that one he helped us while we were locked up. Rosinante turned back to Smoker and muttered, as you can see, I was unsure of what to do with him. Smoker walked up to Senor Pink and inspected the latter. Then he said, place him in a cell provided on our ship. Our purpose of coming here has been dealt with, and our utmost concern at the current moment is to leave this place h hold on then the voice of a teenage girl interrupted him turning around smoker came inside of two girls one with green hair and another with orange hair the one with orange hair shouted in desperation m my sister isn't here with us she must still be down there somewhere rosinante widened his eyes there is another one the green haired girl fidgeted nervously as she was taken away from us and i i'm unsure of what they did to her smoker crouching down asked seriously What's the name of your sister, and how does she look like? Boa Hancock. She has straight black hair, and she's excessively beautiful. Noted, Smoker stood back up and ordered Aramaki, take everyone back and set sail. I'll be returning with the last one before you're far from this island. Aramaki saluted with a grin. Got it, Smoker-san. It was dark. It was cold. Staying locked up in this lifeless cell, the young girl named Boa Hancock shivered. September 2nd, around two weeks ago, she was celebrating her 12th birthday with her sisters and others, excited about getting to join the Kuja Pirates expedition. However, the sudden appearance of one despicable man, that man who was able to manipulate sand, brought chaos to the Amazon Lily, and then there was the abrupt invasion of Don Quixot family. The warriors of Amazon Lily were far too injured to fight, and many of them, including Hancock and her sisters, were caught thus leading to the present. All, all men are trash. Hancock whispered in a shaky tone, curling up to preserve as much heat as she could. Sandersonia Marigold she felt powerless and exhausted, with a strange cuff on her ankle sipping away her strength. She overheard previously, the conversations about how she was going to be the grand prize for an auction. In addition, she was forced to eat a repulsive fruit with a horrifying taste. Ever since she was captured and brought to this place, there was nothing but misery. Help! Hancock shut her eyes tight and whimpered, wishing to escape from the reality. Help please she felt lonely. She missed her home. She wanted to see again. That lively forest full of green and the vast ocean that evoked nothing but awe. The everyday life full of fun and freedom, chatting and hunting with her sisters she, after being locked away from those experiences, came to realize how valuable they were. Please someone Hancock shivered from the cold. Tears flowed out of her eyes and soaked the cold, solid platform below. And then, clank the lock fell down to the floor, and the door made out of metal bars, slowly creaked open. Then, the sound of one man walking echoed throughout the area. Hancock, getting goosebumps on her skin, scuffled away to the corner of the cell, upon realizing that someone was coming on her way. Then, within Hancock's view appeared one tall man, wearing a white coat around his shoulders. This man Hancock's never seen him in her life. He wasn't the same as those pirates who brought her here. Finally found you. This man, kneeling on one knee, matched Hancock's eye level. He then asked softly, you must be Hancock, right? Hancock covered her head with her frail arms. She then whispered in fear, W who who are you, man? That man, smiling gently, held his hand out, I'm Smoker. Hancock gulped, afraid of the unknown. The first male whom she met, and many more she's come across all until now. All of them were malicious fellows who did nothing but inflict harm on her. However, this man named Smoker seemed a little different than them. Will he hurt her just like others? Is he giving her false hope just to throw her into a bigger pit? She didn't know, and she had no way of finding out. However, she gathered up her courage. Even if it was a false hope, she wanted to dream of returning back to the life she missed so much. Therefore, she slowly extended her shaking hand and placed it on top of Smoker's outstretched hand. And there began the miracle. Freedom. Hancock felt her eyes wandering everywhere, engraving the sky, sea, distant island everything into her mind. After weeks of imprisonment being able to move without restriction and breathe in fresh air, 
gave her joy. Sun, it brightly shone above her and smoke her as they traveled on top of a flying nimbus. Upon receiving the warm sunlight, she felt her eyes tearing up. And soon enough, within their sight entered the marine ship that was sailing by. On top of that ship, her sisters Sandersonia and Marigold were waving at her with visible relief. The nimbus slowly descended and allowed Hancock to safely land on the deck of the ship. She, jumping out of it, hugged her sisters tight and enjoyed their reunion. I'm dead tired, and Smoker, immediately slumping down on the ground, muttered. He turned his head and watched the horizon where the sun was setting by. It brightened up the world with its golden light, and Smoker, finding a momentary peace as their ship sailed in the gentle sea, relaxed his body. It's all thanks to you, Smoker-san, Rosinante. Sitting down next to Smoker, muttered, finally, it's over 11 o'clock, a ship is sighted then, a watcher cried from the crow's nest above. Rosinante immediately groaned, and Smoker, grabbing the rail nearby, forced himself back up. Ha, let's see, Smoker turned in the direction that the watcher indicated, and saw Robin looking at him stoically. She stated, it's just a fellow marine ship. Smoker then, they heard the delighted screams of two men from said marine ship. Smoker placed his hand on top of his eyes, and found Shu and Akahand, who were letting out tears of joy from their comically swollen faces. And as that marine ship reached right next to Smoker's and began to sail at the same pace, Shu immediately cried in misery. Smoker, you have no idea how glad I am to see you. Shu pointed at the huge lump on his head. Look at what your girlfriend did to Akahand and me. Can you please tell her to stop Bam? Wow, as Shu yelled at his lungs before dropping dead to the deck. Hina, with her clenched fist smoking, barked at the unconscious Shu. WHO's his girlfriend. Smoker sweat dropped as he leaned against the rail. Akahand, on the other hand, stood rigidly and managed to avoid Hina's wrath. Ha, Hina, turning away from the twitching Shu, sighed. Her eyes containing dark bags underneath exhibited nothing but mental exhaustion, which Smoker pitied. Smoker, removing his gaze from Hina, looked around his surroundings. Boa's sisters and those from Amazon Lily were busy looking at the distant sea with amazement enjoying their freedom. His subordinates, while busily moving back and forth and fulfilling their duties, were occasionally chatting among themselves. On the adjacent ship, he could see Ain, Bins, and the burly man, whom he didn't recognize, whispering with their eyes headed to the unconscious Shu and horrified Akand. There was still so much to do in this world, but nonetheless, Smoker felt accomplished. Doflamingo, the one who will not only contribute to the development of Smile and put Wano citizens to misery, but also take over Dressrosa and commit atrocious deeds, was gone. Though the future was flowing in a direction that Smoker couldn't predict, he believed that such change was for good. Smoker. And then, someone whispered from his side. Turning, Smoker saw Robin, who was gazing at him with a darkened expression. Smoker raised an eyebrow. Is something wrong? Hina, who was nearby, too looked at Robin in curiosity. Look, Robin said while pointing at the unconscious shoe. He urinated on the deck. That wood's going to rot and weaken the ship. The ship will break and sink. Everyone there will die. What? Hina frowned in confusion. Smoker, not saying anything in response, simply deadpanned at the girl. Ha 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 ha. That's so funny, Arobi. And Cola, who was seemingly listening to Robin, laughed while falling on her back. Smoker and Hina looked at each other with fatigue in their eyes. Let me show you what I'm capable of Rahahaha bring it on. Under the blue sky, Shuzo and Aramaki were having a push-up competition. Now, now, let those fools be, and gather everyone. It's time for, Shu, on the other hand, was rubbing his palms together, while gathering up the marines in front of him, Gamble. He took out a wooden chest from his back and showed it to everyone. He then shook it, in this chest, there is a fruit. If you guess it right, then you get double your bettings. Shut up and take my money, Apple no. The sound heard didn't seem to resemble that of apples. From what I can deduce, aha, elephant melon, ha ha ha. That chest is smaller than elephant melon, you moron. The marine soldiers all rushed in while slamming Bellis onto Shu. Shu, laughing giddily with his hands full of money, placed them down and shouted. And now, the moment of truth, the chest was opened, and, whoa. Shu and the marines, instead of the usual lime, saw a fruit with a strange pattern. That, that, one marine pointed his shaky hand at the fruit. Am I seeing the devil fruit, devil fruit mama mia? Shu whispered, if I eat it, I will become as strong as Smoker. And before he realized, the entire fruit was in his mouth. And by the time he realized, he chewed on it, while Shu screamed as the horrifying taste engulfed his senses. Then, swallowing down the entire thing, he grinned madly before running toward where Smoker was found standing next to Rosinante, Shu Yahuhu. Fight me boom. At the next moment, Akahan suddenly flew out of the neighboring marine ship and fell on top of Shu, crushing the latter. So it isn't a loja, one among the marines commented. Away from them, Hina was found with Robin and Cola. Placing her eyes on Cola, Hina inquired, so she doesn't know where she's from. Robin shook her head negatively. She is vaguely aware of what her island looks like, but the information is far from enough for us to deduce. It's fine. Cola, 
who was sitting on a rail and swinging her legs back and forth, said brightly, I like this place better than my home. So you want to become a Marine? Hina asked carefully, to which Cola replied by tilting her head, Marine. What's that? She asked in curiosity, oh, is it a teddy bear? Robin squinted her eyes, you want to be a teddy bear? Cola nodded, yeah. Then, there were those from Amazon Lily, running around and showcasing their nimbleness. Ayn and Binz accompanied them, getting to satiate their curiosities regarding this mysterious island named Amazon Lily. And finally, at the frontmost section of Smoker's ship, Smoker was found standing next to Rosinante. Rosinante, whose hand was holding onto a cigarette holder, chuckled before handing it over to Smoker. Smoker's eyes widened in disbelief. Who are you and what happened to Rosinante that I knew of? Rosinante, visibly relaxed, said as he gazed at the puffy clouds ahead, I've been relying on that thing for quite some time. My trauma forced me to do so, without it. I couldn't manage myself through the day. But Smoker, holding onto the cigarette holder full of cigarettes, listened. I don't need it anymore. And it's all thanks to you. Rosinante smiled at Smoker, Smoker-san. Hey, Smoker found himself grinning, as the cigarette holder in his hand was lit a flame, burning away into ashes. You've overcome, Rosinante. Two marine ships were heading toward the Amazon Lily. After doing so, they probably will return back to the Marineford. I may encounter a much harder situation in the future, Rosinante thought, a conflict far more severe than Doflamingo. But I'm not afraid, Rosinante's eyes. Then found an obese-looking bird with a mustache above its beak, barely keeping itself above the air. Because Smoker San will be there to guide me. Rosinante closed his eyes. And the lingering trauma of Doflamingo killing homing it no longer appeared. It was within the dark room where there lied a snail shell-like device named Tone Dial at the side. From it, a particular song named Bink's Sake was playing on an endless loop over and over again. And here, one man was found relaxing in his seat, with his feet laid on top of a table. Veiled by the darkness, his proper appearance couldn't be pictured. Foolish man. That man commented as he puffed out the smoke. Holding the cigarette with his left hand, the man read through the newspaper that he held with his right, secrecy is the key. To willingly give up on an advantage like that your death fails to surprise me. Joker. Placing the newspaper down, he shifted his attention to another man nearby, who was angrily chugging down a bottle of rum. This alcoholic had two swords embedded in his severed legs. In addition, his left arm was missing. He was Golden Lion Shiki, one who found himself unable to live through a day without the healing water. So, the man, watching Shiki with annoyance, asked, when are you going to leave my island, Shiki? Your island? Shihahaha full lead was never yours, Achoku. The man, whose name was revealed to be Achoku, frowned with the cigarette between his teeth. Shiki, uncaring of the worsening mood of Achoku, exclaimed after emptying the bottle completely, you've simply managed to gain control by luck. Whitebeard, Linlin, Kaidu, and me if one of us desired to take over here. What could you have done? Achoku, crunching up the newspaper, scowled, Ah, uh, you picking a fight? Shihahaha. Shiki threw away the bottle, which shattered upon crashing into the wall. Achoku let out an annoyed growl before shouting, What the fuck did Newgate say for you to become like this? You aren't being yourself, Shiki. Shiki's laugh abruptly stopped upon hearing Achoku's shout. Shiki's demeanor took a sudden shift from that of amusement to rage and depression. He then slammed his right fist on the table, boom. That heartless man Shiki barked crazily. He rejected my offer. Yes, fine then. Whatever. But Achoku we are friends, right we were on the same crew, eating the same food, sailing in the same ship, and serving the same man. Shiki stood up with his sword legs and looked to his left and right, as if looking for someone to fight. Then, the rage-filled gleam suddenly disappeared within his eyes, and he said in sorrow, Back then, I offered him my loyalty and Captain Rock's devil fruit. And he upon one of his crew members expressing his desire to eat that devil fruit, snatched it from me with no return lot. Achoku whispered in disbelief, Dark dark fruit you had it bam. Achoku, grabbing Shiki by the collar, pushed the latter against the wall. Bastard you know for how long I was looking for that fruit, Achoku shouted into Shiki with anger of his own, and upon doing so, the cigarette fell out of his mouth. You should have come to me first, that fruit was the key. Shiki, you know that very well. Shiki retorted with bloodshot eyes. I have no idea what you know about that fruit, but it's him. Shiki abruptly turned his attention to the wall, and whispered as his eyes gleamed red, that filth who asked Whitebird to snatch the dark dark fruit. Marshall D. Teach why the hell is he here? Achoku, on the other hand, backed off from Shiki and whispered with a frown. E. September 21st, 1505, Marineford within the centric building of Marineford that served as the base of all marine operations. There lied one Japanese star room. 
tatami floor, a long table that spanned across the entire room such were the features present within the room. In addition, in front of the smoking hot teas were the marine officers, the vice admirals and admirals, who were found sitting on top of the comfortable looking cushions. Ha, and Sengoku, the fleet admiral who was seated at the frontmost seat, grimaced while holding a cup of tea. Well, ha 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 ha. On the other hand, Gart was laughing so hard that the tears full of amusement dropped out of his eyes. Moreover, Kuzan, sitting at some distance away from Gart, was chuckling silently evidently in approval of the same topic that Gart was amused at. Gart, Suru, with her arms crossed, spoke up. This isn't a matter to laugh at. Behave yourself. Tap. Subsequently placing the teacup down, Sengoku opened his mouth, Vice Admiral Tensei. As Gart covered his mouth to suppress his laugh to a silent giggle, Tensei, the Vice Admiral wearing sunglasses indoor, spoke up solemnly. A week ago, the heavenly demon Don Quixote Doflamingo died, at the hands of Rear Admiral Smoker. Though the specific and thorough cause of this event is unknoln, the Cipher polls concluded that Smoker caught onto Doflamingo's betrayal of the world government albeit with apparent displeasure. And upon hearing Tensei's words, Ho, oh, one man, the one with a muscular physique and standard marine cap atop his head Admiral Sakazuki Orokenu, expressed his amazement. Kuzan, as well as Bayard, narrowed their eyes at the man in response. EFFF Gart, sealing his puffed up cheeks by placing his hands on top of his lips, seemed to be having a hard time keeping his laugh suppressed. ECH, Onogumo, in contrast to Gart, frowned deeply before angrily gulping down the entire cup of tea. Oh, on Sakazuki's right, one Vice Admiral wearing a grey coloured suit Vice Admiral Borsalino raised an eyebrow. Gart san isn't he supposed to be your disciple? Well ha ha Gart, bursting out yet another loud laughter, replied with a grin. You got that right? Borsalino raised his hands up in amusement, a marine who survived Gart san's training. How scary silence. Then, Sengoku stated in a stern voice. As all marine officers' eyes turned back at him, he continued, the world government, regardless of the positive change that Rear Admiral Smoker managed to bring through this incident, expressed their concern for Smoker's rebellious tendency. What? Garp's expression abruptly shifted to that of a frown. Disregarding Doflamingo's betrayal, the fact that Smoker decided to assault the warlord allied with the world government without any report beforehand. Sengoku gazed straight back at Garp and said seriously, raises the question of whether he truly was aware of Doflamingo's betrayal or not. Suru, looking at Sengoku from the corners of her eyes, spoke up. Then, the purpose of this assembly is to Sengoku nodded in response, to determine the proper settlement for Rear Admiral Smoker whether he deserves the promotion for his achievement or demotion for making a vulgar action that may have induced serious complications. The room momentarily fell into silence, and after a few seconds, the man seated nearby Sengoku, Garp, and Suru Admiral Blaze or Cedar Hebi asked with a pleasant smile on his face, promotion as into the rank of Vice Admiral. Placing his hand on his chin, Blaze tilted his head, um, though his feats are praiseworthy, he is only 17 in terms of age, isn't he? I'm unsure if the showcase of his strength alone is enough for him to reach the rank of Vice Admiral. Indeed, 17 is quite. I recall that he began his career as a Marine approximately five years ago, reaching the rank of Vice Admiral within five years. Doesn't this seem a little too much, Fleet Admiral Sengoku? Upon hearing Blaze's words, many present Vice Admirals nodded their heads in agreement. Furthermore, Tat, one old-looking individual with a long, grey-coloured beard, Admiral Hanazumi or Hironazumi added on, this old man seconds Admiral Blaze's opinion. A youngster should build up more experiences out in the sea prior to receiving the heavy duty as a Vice Admiral. In response to these Marine officers who seemed against Smoker's promotion, Garp snorted, eh? Then, while taking a bite of a rice cracker in his hand, Garp exclaimed, since when has the meritocratic society of Marine adopted such a conservative mindset? Garp, crumbs are falling, commented Suru, to which Garp responded by looking down at his suit and forming an O-shaped mouth. Agreed, Kuzan then followed up calmly, adding on to Garp San's words. I've been sailing in the New World quite frequently for the past year. The three catastrophes forces especially that of Big Mom and Kaidu are getting far too large even with our efforts. Age renders smoke questionable. I tell you, strength is what matters the most above all currently. And in my eyes Kuzan swept his eyes across many seated nearby him. He seems more qualified than many of you here. Boom. Onagumo. Gritting his teeth in response to Kuzan's statement, barked, that puny kid, more qualified than us, you say. Kuzan lifted his cup of tea and replied coolly, indeed. Next to Onagumo, Bayard's eyebrow twitched. Though the orange-haired Vice Admiral was masking his displeasure as best as he could, he was slowly failing in doing so until his eyes met the eyes of his own brother, Admiral Blaze. Widening his eyes, Bayard's expression quickly returned to a poker face. On the other side of Onagumo, the Marine officer with many scars on his face, Vice Admiral Doberman, was huffing and puffing rapidly, evidently angered by Kuzan's claim. Why? Do you believe that your eyes have gotten more astute after attaining the position of Admiral Candidate Kuzan? Onagumo growled. 
I tell you that you as an outsider who wasn't present at Knockdown Island during the incidents on Agumo. A deep and charismatic voice interrupted on Agumo's angered shout. Onagumo subconsciously shut his mouth, and everyone's eyes immediately turned to the man who just spoke up, Sakazuki. Whether you were there or not doesn't matter, Sakazuki said while frowning at Onagumo. A scum like Don Quicks at Doflamingo, regardless of what the world government says, is better dead than alive. And I believe that Rear Admiral Smoker did a fine job in imposing absolute justice to those filths of the sea. Sakazuki raised his hand up, I am in favor of Rear Admiral Smoker's promotion. Away from Onagumo, Sakazuki gazed at two other admirals, age, strength, whatever. The core value of Marine isn't to become the world government's dogs, but to kill every single criminal off of this world. Hum, Hanazumi stroked his chin with a faint thoughtful expression. Blaze, on the other hand, stared back at Sakazuki with the same robotic smile on his face. Garp and Kuzan, wondering what Sakazuki was planning in his mind, narrowed their eyes at the man with distrust within them. Sungoku, after the room has returned to that of silence, spoke up once more. Then those in favor of Rear Admiral Smoker's demotion, raise your hands up. Hanazumi, Onagumo, Doberman, and few other Marine officers raised their hands up. However, many others, looking at Sakazuki with underlying fear within them, kept their arms still. And those in favor of promotion, raise your hands up. Upon Sengoku's call, Garp, Kuzan, Suru, Sakazuki, and many more far more in contrast to the number who agreed on Smoker's demotion raised their hands up. Sengoku, closing his eyes, stated firmly, a promotion it is. Opening his eyes back up, Sengoku said to Garp, tell him to return back to the Marineford. We're back, Hancock whispered as she gazed at the familiar island of Amazon Lily, which lied in the middle of Calm Belt. A gentle hand of an older woman from Amazon Lily was placed on top of Hancock's head, yes. Yes, we did. Amazon Lily the state of the island was quite a bad sight, however. The trees stood with withered leaves and frail branches. At a larger scope, the island seemed dry. Smoker, noticing these qualities, then turned to women from Amazon Lily, and stared at their bandage-covered wounds. What happened to you guys? Hina, grimacing upon sighting the island, asked. One among the Amazon Lily inhabitants replied with sorrow, a man capable of handling sand. We were simply living through our daily lives, and he suddenly came in flying from the nearby island named Rusukana, that island filled with inexplicable monsters. This woman, shutting her eyes tight, continued, naturally, being able to survive from that island, meant that he is strong. However, we still underestimated him. After all, he was one while we were many, and all men we saw up until then were weak and worthless. Crocodile Smoker noted to himself, so he is alive after all. We were beaten, and that man left. Then, before we were given the chance to recuperate, another one with that strangely wiggling sword came with a huge number of other men. That one was much weaker, but our injuries disabled us from retaliating. Two marine ships were now at the shore, and one by one, the inhabitants of Amazon Lily got off the ship. They, pushing their pride as warriors aside, looked at the marines with nothing but gratitude and then bowed. Thank you. It was short, yet sincerity-filled words. And the marines, smiling in response, turned away. That was all that they needed. Smoker San. And then, Hancock, standing at the shore, spoke up timidly. Smoker, returning his gaze to the beach, found that the teen was looking at him. Thank you for saving me. Hancock, in Smoker's eyes, seemed far different than the pirate empress of the canon. And Smoker was aware that those harsh events in the canon Hancock's life served as the motivation for her to grow strong. Hancock and her sisters didn't receive marks from the celestial dragons. They weren't given the excessive torches that will traumatize them for life. Smoker, looking at Hancock, thought, then, will the canon pirate empress be no more? Will she simply remain as a woman with the power of love love fruit and know the more? And Hancock then asked hopefully, how can I become as strong as you? Smoker's thought until now ceased. I guess that some aspects of canon are simply meant to be Smoker chuckled in amusement, those eyes of her. I see nothing but a desire to become stronger. Strong, you asked? Hancock gulped. All the other women of Amazon Lily too leaned in to listen to what Smoker had to say. After all, they believed that strength was just as valuable as beauty was to a woman. Smoker then said, every day, run around the entire Amazon Lily 1000 times. Do 100,000 finger push-ups against a cliff, 100,000 sit-ups and pull-ups with 10,000 ton additional weight on you. Climb up the cliff thrice, plank for 3 hours with a boulder at your back. Get thrown into the air with enough strength, such that the friction from air resistance sets you aflame, and get hit by 1,000 cannonballs. Once you grow accustomed to that, get beaten up by a big-fisted man one million times. 
Huh. Hancock, frozen in confusion, muttered. Similar to Hancock, everyone seemed dumbfounded, with their eyes popped out and jaws dropped open. Smoker then chuckled. Hopefully, that helped. As if the marine ships has now departed from the island. Hancock, even as the others hurriedly returned to their island and enjoyed their reunion with others, kept her eyes locked on the departing ships. Within her eyes, there was the sight of one white-haired marine officer's back, which proudly displayed the justice coat. His right hand was raised up and waving at her, and Hancock, unconsciously gulping, raised up her own hand slowly and waved back at him. Will slavery completely be terminated after this? Probably not. Celestial dragons, they will definitely find other means to achieve their disgusting desires, Smoker believed. If so, were Smoker's doings for the entire year pointless? Well, ha ha. Smoker grinned, absolutely not. And there it was, the resolution to his year-long endeavor. Within the still sea of calm belt, the weather was sunny and bright. Two marine ships, basking under the sunlight, were leisurely and triumphantly sailing by. Though tired and exhausted, the marines within the two ships smiled, feeling accomplished. And now Smoker, erasing a smile on his face, walked down the staircase of the ship and into one room. That consisted of metal bars that constituted a cell. Behind those bars lied Senor Pink, the man who raised his head up and looked at Smoker with hollow gaze upon the latter's entry. Smoker, crouching down to match the pirate's eye level, thought, what to do with you? Senor Pink, frowning slightly, bickered, what? And gave a middle finger to Smoker, much to his amusement. One week. Smoker, looking directly at Senor Pink, stated, we have around a week of time before arriving at Marineford. Raising up his right hand, Smoker stretched out three fingers, and there are three choices that I will choose from regarding your future that is. Senor Pink frowned in annoyance, but Smoker, ignoring the former's negative attitude, continued, Option number one, you get executed before reaching the impel down. In Smoker's standard, most of the criminals belonged within this category. Option number two, you spend the rest of your days locked up in the impel down. The usual instance in which Smoker will choose this option is when a devil fruit that the criminal possesses far outweighs the criminal's known danger. One known example is Foxy. And option number three, What's the fucking point here? Senor Pink, letting out a hollow chuckle, cut Smoker off in the middle of his sentence, true men don't compromise. Smoker, raising an eyebrow out of hilarity, watched as Senor Pink bickered, I'm a criminal. I've killed several and obeyed Doflamingo's orders. Being an executive under him, I too received my share of benefits, and regardless of whatever bullshit you blabber, what I've done can't be justified. Smoker, snorting in response, unsheathed Shusui. The black blade was shoved through the gap between metal bars, and its tip was pointed right at Senor Pink's neck. Then, is this the ending that you desire? Smoker asked. There is no more suitable punishment for me than death, Senor Pink replied. But I do wish that I had several lives such that I can be killed in accordance to the number of innocents whom I killed throughout my life. Senor Pink's eyes shifted down to the black blade right in front of him. He could smell the strong metallic scent of it. However, he instinctively knew that such scent wasn't the inherent quality of the blade. Well, what are you waiting for? Senor Pink commented while stretching his neck, conduct the justice, White Hunter. Senor Pink closed his eyes and took a light sigh. He was ready to meet his end and fall into the bottom of the pit to the hell which he thought he deserved. However, just as there it is, the very word that disgusts me. Smoker, contrary to Senor Pink's expectations, retracted Shusui back. Upon hearing Smoker's comment, Senor Pink opened his eyes back up with confusion. And death. Smoker said impassively, death. It isn't suitable enough to be considered a punishment. An eternal repose death, to some extent, can be considered the true freedom that those pirates seek for. In my perspective, dying is a cowardly means of escaping from your burdens. Senor Pink's eyes widened as Smoker leaned in. If you kill thousands, save a hundred times more. Visit every single victim whom you inflicted harm upon, and ask for their forgiveness regardless of whether they forgive or not. Now, doesn't this sound harder than the simple act of dying? Smoker, sheathing Shusui back, Grinned while extending his hand to Senor Pink through the metal bars. Option number three, become a Marine. Senor Pink muttered in disbelief, Oi, you are shitting with me, aren't you? If you're a true man, Smoker, cutting Senor Pink off, stated, then fucking accept your punishment like one. ECH, Senor Pink, gritting his teeth with multitudes of emotions swirling within him, snatched Smoker's hand and held it firm. Damn you. Bohaha welcome aboard, your boy Pink. A day passed by. As Marines strictly watched any potential danger, Smoker gazed up at the blue sky. That didn't contain a single shred of cloud. Calm belt surely is boring Smoker thought before taking out a coin and flicking it to the news coup, who was awaiting his payment. The news coup eagerly bit onto the coin and happily flew away, 
leaving Smoker by himself. Sure boy. Smoker then yelled while locking his eyes on the newspaper, get started with the cleaning already. For how long must I endure standing on top of a dirty deck? Ha! Huh? And in response, the man with sunglasses covering his eyes, Senor Pink, now stood with standard marine attire on him and a mop in his right hand. Why the fuck do I need to clean G-A-H-H boom? At the next moment, Senor Pink's eyes popped out in pain before he fell on the deck face first, due to Akahan a quite large man in terms of size suddenly crashed on top of him. Rosanante, who's been watching this scene from some distance away, squinted his eyes in amazement. How is it that that dude always ends up falling down from the sky? Aramaki, who stood right next to Rosanante, pointed at the adjacent marine ship. That pink-haired lady, she seems to have quite a temper. Rahahaha. That guy and the other wimpy one keep getting beaten over and over again. Fuck, and on the other hand, Shu was found screaming in misery as he held onto a rusty sword. Is this all that my power is capable of? Why can't I turn into fire or something? Senor Pink, kicking Akahand away from him and standing back up, clenched his teeth hard. However, calming himself down by taking in a deep breath, Senor Pink eventually began to wipe the deck with the mop. Cola, wait over there, don't run outside without your clothes. Seriously, you're going to catch a cold. Ah uh ha -huh ha -huh. Two ships surely were lively and noisy. However, Smoker, not bothered by such surroundings, gazed into the newspaper with a serious expression on his face. Corruption among the Marines, the former Rio Admiral Dyer's barrels, was found plundering innocent civilians in the Arts town. Commodore Bastille discovered the evil exploit and stopped any further progression. However, Dyer's barrels successfully escaped with his subordinates. The headquarter is this supposed to happen? In the canon, the specific information regarding Dyer's barrels' treachery was unknown. However, judging by the fact that Dyer's barrels' discovery and bargain of Opop fruit occurred in the year 1511, Smoker came to deduce that Barrel's exposure happened way earlier than it was supposed to. Then will his discovery of Opop fruit also be accelerated? Smoker thought with a newfound hope within him. If so, then can the Flevance incident be prevented? Flevance, the country also known as the White City. It was the very hometown of Trafalgar D. Waterlaw, and Smoker was aware of what kind of tragedy this country will soon undergo. No. In the first place, is Opop truly necessary to prevent the incident? Flevance was the country that Smoker had his eyes on since the last year, where the hereditary disease named Amber Lead Syndrome was recently discovered and was currently under research. In the future, the disease will be wrongly deduced to be contagious, and the diseased civilians within the country will be trapped within that white country without any aid. If I begin acting now, and if there are more brains involved in this matter then perhaps, the incident can be prevented or, so Smoker thought. What are you concerned of? Then, from Smoke's side, a feminine voice was heard. Turning to the source of voice, Smoker came inside of Robin, who looked back at him with an evident curiosity behind her stoic face. Smoker, taking in a deep breath while passing the newspaper to her, replied, A new task for us to work on after our visit to Marineford. That is, September 28th, 1505, Marineford. This just feels wrong, said Senor Pink, as he gazed at the triumphant scenery of the Marine headquarter. I, I was a pirate just a month or so ago, you know. Two Marine ships, after the long detour from Knockdown Island, due to the necessity of returning the captured women back to their home, finally arrived back at the Marineford. Hina tired. Hina requires a fine glass of wine. Hey, aren't you just 15 in terms of age though? Rahahaha. This place surely is the same as always. I heard that Commodore Bastille is bedridden right now. Has he recovered? I wonder. The Marines and the ships let out remarks of their own. Smoker, staring at the Marineford with excitement of his own, grinned as his eyes found Garp, who's been waiting for him at the dock with his arms crossed. You've done quite the job this time around, Brat Smoker shouted back heartily. A hey, long time no see, Garp Sensei. Been busy dealing with a string bastard, you know. Garp grinned. Have you brought some souvenirs? Smoker replied cockily. Hey, I knew you'd ask that, and brought some rice crackers. Now that's my boy. Then, oh ha 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 ha. The two of them laughed simultaneously earning sweat drops out of others. Damn, that Bastille, in the middle of one marine ship. The man with a tattered justice coat around him snarled. It was one small village in the new world. What's the chance of encountering another marine division there? This man was none other than Dyer's Barrels the former Marine who betrayed the organization, and was currently on the run, along with his fellow former Marines. One former Marine among them then asked, What now, Rear Admiral? I'm no longer the Rear Admiral, Barrels responded with a frown. Call me Captain instead. Captain. Another muttered, Are we pirates now? Barrels clicked his tongue, TCH if we aren't pirates. 
Then what are we? Bam. Barrels then slapped his hand on top of the table, where one bounty poster lied. It read, Marauder dies barrels. Wanted dead or alive. 330 million Beely. Quite a huge sum that they placed on my head Barrels growled. Damn it. They were currently sailing through the calm belt. Barrels knew that judging by the direction of their navigation, they will eventually reach the North Blue. Think Barrels. Through what path can you guarantee your survival? Oi, Rear Captain Barrels. Then, another former Marine asked, What about that son of yours? Didn't he get caught by that Bastille? Whatever happens to him is none of my concern, Drake replied coldly. If you have enough time to worry for that kid, think instead of a way for us to survive Barrels had to stop. After all, his eyes, looking at the back of the ship, came in sight of one man who suddenly appeared out of nowhere. The other soldiers, noticing Barrel's sudden shock, and turned back to see what Barrels was surprised at. Why? Hello there. And they saw the man with long and messy hair, with old and dry looking clothes, sitting on top of the rail. This outward appearance seemed to render it harder for the former marines to recognize the man. Barrels seemed to have noticed the man's identity immediately. What are you doing here on my ship? No. How did you get here? Barrels whispered, no how are you alive even? As far as I remember, you were lost in the calm belt after the defeat a year ago ah uh, yes. What a torturous time it has been. The man said with a deep sigh, barely surviving a day by eating the raw internal flesh of a sea king, managing to be expelled out of that sea king onto the strange island full of ridiculous animals, meeting those women who used a strange power named Haki, and finally returning back to the sea, only to be lost in the new world, and end up here. Many things surely happened. That man hopped down from the rail and stood right in front of barrels, dire barrels. I haven't expected to meet you here either. Now, if you folks were the usual marines, I would have tortured you to death. However, the man then grinned in a crazed manner. I don't consider traders as one. Barrels unconsciously felt oppressed by this one man in front of him. As he unconsciously took a step back, the man declared, so I'll be generous this time around. From here on, this ship and your lives all are mine. The man opened his arms wide, serve me, be my loyal crewmates. In return, I will preserve your lives. Barrels clenched his fists hard in anger, but they eventually loosened powerlessly. After all, the man standing in front of him was none other than Sir Crocodile. The pirate who's returned from the dead, yes, Captain. Ash with an oppressive haki that Barrels couldn't fathom. Sex. Smoker thought as he gazed at an insignia in his hand. This insignia was none other than the badge that represented his status as a vice admiral. Grinning in content, he flicked the insignia to the round table in front of him, to which Cancer, the one sitting across the table, grabbed and inspected in amazement. Vice Admiral Smoker. Cancer muttered with a chuckle, sounds pretty cool. I admit, the two of them were currently in a hospital room, at some distance away from this round table where Cancer and Smoker sat around. There was Bastille, bandaged and bedridden. Fuck. Let me see as well. Bastille wiggled his body in an attempt to take a look at the insignia, but to no avail. Oh come on. Are two of you here to tease me? Dara snickering in response, Cancer threw the insignia at Bastille. Bastille's bandaged arms instinctively wiggled in response, but they, having been broken, were unable to move swiftly. As the insignia began to fall toward him, Bastille opened his mouth as if trying to catch it with his teeth, Smoker. Before Bastille could clench the insignia with his teeth, send forth a hand made out of white smoke which caught onto it, and returned it back to Smoker's grasp. Don't get my badge dirty, will you? Smoker proudly placed the insignia back on his justice coat. Cancer, on the other hand, turned to Bastille. So, how did you end up in that situation again? That bastard, Bastille frowned in demise, dies barrels. Smoker, upon hearing Bastille's growl, took out the bounty poster out of his sleeve, Marauda Dyer's barrels, 330 million Beely. I remember him having quite a good reputation what exactly happened. I wonder. I was freaking winning, you know Dara Bastille, then shouted abruptly. Cancer, flinching from the sudden burst, barks back. Lower your tone, Dara Till. Shut up, cancer inducing cancer Dara Bastille. Engulfed by the rage, resumed shouting. You know what he did, Smoker ha, huh? as cancer continued blabbering at Bastille in annoyance. Smoker asked with a sweat drop, what? That sicko, he used his own son as bait Dara Cancer, immediately fell silent and froze on his spot. Bastille continued, every time I tried to attack Barrels pushed that kid forward, what am I supposed to do in that situation Dara? Huh? A tough situation indeed, Smoker replied thoughtfully as he closed his eyes. If someone like Sakazuki was there instead of Bastille, then that marine would have decided to kill the bait along with Barrels. Smoker was glad that Bastille was the one who discovered Barrels' corruption. You made the best decision available. Though Barrels escaped with his subordinates, you managed to save the majority of civilians there, along with Barrels' former son. Standing up, Smoker tapped the still-lying Bastille on the shoulder before exiting the room. You've done all that you could do. Let those worries go and take some rest, Bastille. Yes, we'll do Dara. Huh. 
Cancer, scratching the back of his head, gazed at Bastille apologetically, and opened his mouth as if trying to apologize, before Bastille stuck his tongue out in a way that resembled that of lifting up a middle finger. Cancer, growing a tick mark, placed his middle finger on top of his lips. Shoo, be quiet in the hospital, all right, get out of here Dara. Smoker walked out along with Cancer by his side, leaving Bastille by himself. Then, after turning by the corner, Smoker and Cancer saw one orange-haired teen with an X-shaped scar on his chin, who busily looked around as if searching for something. Hum. Cancer raised an eyebrow as Smoker came to a stop in front of the teen. He then looked at Smoker questioningly. Why? You know him. Your die is Drake, aren't you? Smoker asked, causing Cancer to widen his eyes. Wait, this guy, you mean? Cancer locked his gaze onto this orange-haired teen named Drake, who took a step back in weariness, before saying with an underlying anger, I threw away that despicable surname. Drake glared at Smoker, I go by the name X Drake. Cancer wrinkled his face with evident displeasure. What's with this rudeness? Boy, just because you've grown taller doesn't mean cancer. Let him go. Smoker, raising his hand up, calmed his blonde colleague down. Then, sighing lightly, he pointed his thumb to his back. Drake, if you're looking for Bastille, his room is over there. Drake, with caution, slowly walked around Smoker and Cancer, before hurriedly moving to where Smoker pointed. I don't like that kid, Cancer muttered, if a pretty girl does that, fine, I can understand. But come on, an edgy teenage boy, brooding all day. Yuck. Smoker snorted as they resumed walking, talking about yourself in the past. Subsequently, Smoker said, And you know, that dude doesn't even seem that young. I'd say around three to four years younger than us. Let's say three, Cancer held three fingers up. One year is composed of 365 days. 365 days, ugh. Don't even get me started with those time bullshit. Smoker, not willing to listen to Cancer's calculations, then found his stomach growling as they exited the hospital. Aren't you hungry? 8760 hours are equivalent to... Aren't you hungry? Minutes, boom. Smoker, filled with annoyance, mercilessly slammed his fist on top of Cancer's head. From the sheer impact alone, the ground below Cancer cracked, and Cancer, with a huge lump on his head, was embedded on the ground like a mole. Oh, Smoker, realizing what he's just done, shrugged lazily, oops, my bad, buddy. However, Cancer, whose eyes whitened out, wasn't in an adequate state to answer Smoker's apology. Instead, you're becoming more and more like Gartsan, I swear. Smoker came to see Joan and Dole whose sweat dropped at the scenery in front of them. Ah, you two then, Smoker sighted one pink-haired young girl with round eyes standing between Joan and Dole. Concealing his surprise, Smoker pointed his finger at the girl and asked Dole, and she is. She's from the West Blue. Name's Perona. Dole replied, brought her here cause she was unreasonably hated by the town folks due to a devil fruit power that she had. A disgusting town it was, Joan commented while rubbing Perona on the head. The name of that town was, Ah, uh, Kono Konoa. Dole looked at Joan with squinted eyes. It was Tunstead. Where did Konoa come from? Oh. Joan stood still with a dumbfounded expression, before paling up as Sister Tsuru. Oh no, moving his eyes away from those two. Smoker looked back at his side, where Cancer was still embedded within the ground. There, Perona was found, poking onto Cancer's lump out of curiosity. So Smoker suggested, are you girls hungry? My treat. Four marine officers and one girl. The five of them, after some time has passed, were now sitting on the tatami floor, right on top of the cushions provided. They were currently within one restaurant ran by a civilian, waiting for the ordered food to come out. How have you been doing, Mademoiselle G. Joan? Cancer, who regained his consciousness long ago, asked shyly to Joan, Have you missed me, dear? Joan, ignoring Cancer completely, asked Smoker, What did you order again? Some sort of noodle. Don't remember the name. Yudin. I don't think so. Mademoiselle Cancer stuttered as he looked back and forth between Smoker and Joan. Raymond. If it isn't Yudin, that seems the most likely. Was Raymond the spicy one? Then probably not. I think, damn you, Smoker. Cancer then grabbed Smoker by the hem of his shirt and shook the white-haired Marine. Why is it always you? Huh? What are you angry about? Smoker, as he was being swayed from side to side, asked out of confusion. Dole, deadpanning at Cancer, commented, Simp. Cancer immediately shouted in response, G-A-H-H-H, shut up, tomboy, at least you aren't on my list. Dole, offended by Cancer's shout, shouted back, Oh, wow, I'm so glad that I'm not on a simp's list. And I'm so glad that then, a Japanese-style paper door on the side suddenly slided open. And upon sighting who were in the adjacent room, Dole and Cancer immediately stopped with pale faces. Will you quiet down, please? An orange-haired admiral, Blaze or Cedar Heavy. Youngsters these days are so loud Vice Admiral Borsalino, who's received the codename of Kazaru. And finally, there sat a third individual the muscular man with a standard marine cap on top of his head. Admiral Sakazuki Orakenu. The big shots of marine were dining right next to Smoker's group. Oh shit, Dole whispered while slowly moving to Smoker's back. 
Cancer, looking at the three of them with widened eyes, he cute. Gion and Smoker bowed slightly in courtesy. Gion then said, Greetings to Vice Admiral Borsalino, Admiral Blaze, and Admiral Sakazuki. I am Gion, currently at the rank of Rear Admiral. Ah, Gion, yes, Blaze said knowingly. I've heard about you from Tokakik before. A.R. Gion flinched upon hearing the name Tokakik expressing an immense dislike. However, quickly masking her emotion, she forcibly smiled. I, I see. Smoker, finding Gion's slip amusing, watched her while sipping down a tea. Oh. Conversely, Borsalino seemed to have taken an interest in cancer. Aren't you that boy from Toto Land before? Toto Land? Ha huh, Smoker thought an interest. Cancer immediately bowed to Borsalino with gratitude v Vice Admiral Borsalino. It was exactly 10 years ago. If you were not there back then I probably wouldn't have made it here. Ah, save it. Glad to see that you made up high. Borsalino then tilted his head. What's your name again? Cancer, sir. Cancer. Smoker, jolting up from the abrupt wave of amusement, lowered his head and bit his lips to prevent himself from laughing. The genuine confusion on Borsalino's face it surely was difficult to stay impassive too. Dole, watching as Smoker's face turned red from trying to hold his laughter back, leaned and whispered into his ear, You aren't in a position to laugh. After all, your name is Smoker. Still better than cancer, Smoker whispered back, to which Dole rolled her eyes in response. Vice Admiral Smoker. Then, the man who's been staying silent until now Admiral Sakazuki spoke up while placing his cup of tea down. Smoker and Dole turned to the rigidly sitting man, who stated, I've heard a good deal of your achievements out in the sea. Congratulations on your promotion, you have contributed to raising the reputation of Marine. Smoker, raising his eyebrow, nodded slightly nonetheless. Thank you Admiral Sakazuki. And judging by how fast your capability seems to be progressing, it is without a doubt that you will become a leading figure of your generation in the future. This makes me wonder. Sakazuki shifted his cold eyes at Smoko. What belief do you hold in regard to the Marine's justice? All the other conversations ceased upon Sakazuki's abrupt question. Justice. It was one of, if not the most sensitive topics within Marine. After all, the current Marine was divided into factions in accordance with their beliefs regarding justice. Smoker immediately realized that this was Sakazuki's way of testing him. Thorough justice. Ha Smoker thought bitterly as his mind went back to the Ahara incident back in the canon. I'm well aware that you adhere to the idea that the annihilation of the evil is more effective than saving the weak. Ruthless and idealistic to the core, I can't truly determine if you're good or bad. But one thing is for sure you are crazy. Smoker, gazing directly back into Sakazuki's eyes, replied with a conviction. If I were to summarize my thought of justice in word arbitrary I would say. Cancer, already having heard of Smoker's ideal, listened on without any surprise. Dol, nodding her head thoughtfully, seemed to have understood Smoker's perspective to some extent. Borsalino, all of a sudden, turned the other way and began playing with a napkin, as if not interested in the conversation. In contrast, Gion, Blaze, and Sakazuki narrowed their eyes in response. Elaborate, said Sakazuki. Smoker, letting out a light chuckle, placed his teacup in the middle of the table, this is a criminal. Then, he scattered napkins around the teacup, and these are the hostages the innocent civilians. The criminal threatens to let him go, that he will kill all these civilians if we don't listen. The idealistic situation of saving civilians and arresting the criminal at the same time is impossible. In this circumstance, what will your choice be, Admiral Sakazuki? Sakazuki immediately replied without any hesitation, kill all of them. Cancer and Doll's eyes widened in disbelief. Sakazuki continued, though the deaths of civilians are regretful, they are for the greater good to prevent any further evil doings by the criminal. Then, for whom does the justice exist? Lifting one napkin and staring at it, Smoker said impassively, then, disregarding the ongoing situation, the one who killed the innocents isn't the criminal but you, Admiral Sakazuki. You killed the helpless civilians for the greater good however, speaking of greater good itself, serves as a sign that you are aware that your act is wrong in essence. Sakazuki's eyes twitched. A marine who willingly commits wrong under the name of justice. This leads to the idea that justice doesn't equate to goodness. If a wrong act can be perceived as doing justice, then justice is arbitrary. It is naught but an excuse for a strong to do what he or she wants to do. Gion, lowering her head with her hand on her chin, seemed to be in contemplation after hearing Smoker's logic. Blaze, on the other hand, didn't exhibit any emotion. Placing the napkin down, Smoker tilted his head towards Sakazuki. So, what do you think, Admiral Sakazuki? Interesting, and at the same time, naive. Sakazuki, letting out a light snort, said coldly, your perspective remains on a narrow scope and fails to interpret my action based on its result. A marine must always think of what choice can lead to the best possible outcome, and some deaths are unpreventable. Smoker and Sakazuki gazed at each other, not willing to bend their wills against the fellow marine. With the room engulfed in silence, the cold, icy atmosphere dominated the surroundings. Such that the young girl, Perona, unconsciously gulped while closing her body to doll. Creak. 
Then, another paper door opened, and, have I kept you waiting oh. Kuzan entered the scene. Arara now this is unexpected. Kuzan, looking around the room, exclaimed dryly. Then, locking his eyes on Smoker, he waved his hand, and if it isn't our youngest vice admiral. Long time no see, Smoker. Smoker waved back in a friendly manner. It's been years, Kuzan san. You seem quite busy these days. Kuzan chuckled, back to you, White Hunter. Kuzan, Sakazuki however, expressed his dislike for the newcomer. He, turning to Borsalino, snarled at the latter. Since when was he invited here? Did you lie to me, Borsalino? Kuzan, who didn't seem to have expected Sakazuki's presence either, grimaced. Borsalino, looking back and forth between the two of them, forced a smile while sweating profusely. I thought that it was about time that you two resolve that still ongoing feud of yours. Regardless of the different points of view, we are comrades, aren't we? Neither Sakazuki nor Kuzan responded to Borsalino. Aren't we? Borsalino, judging by his facial expression, seemed genuinely shocked by the fact that the relationship between his two colleagues was much worse than what he anticipated. Now now, then, Blaze motioned his hand at a cushion that lied next to Borsalino. Kuzan san, why don't you take a seat first? Simultaneously, Sakazuki looked at Smoker and his friends through the corner of his eyes, before, tack, closing the paper door back and separating the two rooms once more, who immediately after, Jun, Kanso, and Dol let out a sigh of relief. Smoker looked at them with pity as they wiped the sweat from their forehead. Though the conversation of the four men could still be heard subtly, they were finally relieved from the extreme stress of talking to veterans. Well, Cancer mumbled while subconsciously taking out a cigarette from his pocket. I Cancer, Jion looked at Cancer with a frown. Get that cigarette away. Now, Cancer's body stiffened as he looked at the cigarette in his hand. Then, while complying with Jion, he asked timidly, are you into men who don't smoke? I don't like someone who smokes in a private restaurant. It's rude. Smoker nodded in agreement to Joan's words, a common sense. Then, the other door, which leads to the outside, opened, and a waitress entered with prepared meals. Ah, Smoker remarked as he saw a bowl of noodles in front of him. Sober it is. Sober it is, Joan too said as she too gazed at Smoker's dish. Right, we're here to eat. Doll sighed before Perona, who was gulping down a cup of water. I'm sorry that you had to go through that, Perona. Chem PH, you better get me a big doll as a reward. Unfortunately, they don't sell a doll here, PFF. Doll froze in the middle of her sentence as Smoker slipped with his cheeks buffed up and a strand of noodle peeking out of his mouth. Big doll what the fuck Smoker, barely managing to gulp down the food, then exploded into laughter, or ha 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 h hey doll, realizing what Smoker was laughing at, shouted with her face reddened. Cancer shook his head in disappointment, unfortunately, she isn't big enough to be considered a big doll. Joan's eyes widened as she hurriedly held her hands out, w wait, doll bam. E-A-H-H -H. at the next moment, doll struck her fist on Cancer's face, causing him to crash into the paper door. That separated their room from the room where four veterans sat. Ha! Huh. Smoker found his eyes widened as Cancer, whose cheek was swollen, was found slashed right on top of Sakazuki's head. Arara Kuzan looked at Smoker with a deadpan, to which Smoker rubbed the back of his head apologetically. Sakazuki's hand, which held onto a teacup, was trembling. This man was barely holding himself back from what Smoker, Jion, and Dol could tell. With a huge wall of ice blocking two rooms, Smoker was the first to finish his meal and wait for his teammates to finish theirs. Cancer, who's been shivering with a pale face for quite some time by now, seemed to be having a hard time holding onto chopsticks properly. I just realized you haven't been in Marineford for a long period of time, right? Then Joan, unable to bear the silence any longer, spoke up to Smoker, you've always been busy sailing and catching those big shots, after all. Smoker raised his eyebrow, why, did I miss something? Doll, without saying anything, aggressively pointed her finger at the ice wall. Joan warily gazed at the ice wall, before leaning closer to Smoker and whispering, around six months ago, Admiral Sakazuki and Vice Admiral Kuzan encountered one another in Mistoria, an island located in the New World. They were in the process of driving away the pirates affiliated with the Beast Pirates. There, the exact situation that you previously depicted occurred where civilians were held as hostages. Smoker found himself surprised. He supposed that he was far too immersed in the matter of slavery, such that he missed an event that big. Admiral Sakazuki primarily focused on annihilating those pirates. On the other hand, Vice Admiral Kuzan protected civilians from Admiral Sakazuki's attacks. The operation was a success. But the two of them argued over the faults of each other's methods. And over time, this has grown into an entirely different scale. For the majority of vice admirals expressed their unpleasantness to Kuzan's act of going against hierarchy. I see. That's new. Smoker didn't exhibit any change of emotion, thanks for the information, Joan. Smoker doubted that this would have happened in the canon. He suspected that the rise of this internal conflict was caused by Smoker's influence over Kuzan, who came to restore his burning justice after the Ahara incident years ago. But if this was the case, then, the battle at the punk hazard smoker thought seriously, 
we might experience that incident at a much bigger scale. Previously, when Sakazuki and Kuzan first glanced at each other, and even now, Smoker felt and could feel the hostility that they possessed toward one another. His observation Haki wasn't lying, they clearly hated each other. So, then, Dol changed the subject while looking back and forth between Smoker and Cancer. What do you two plan to do now? Upon hearing Joan's words, Smoker noted that today's date was December 12, 1505. The year was almost over, and he's been resting in Marineford for some time by now. Maynard has been transferred to Vice Admiral Jonathan's division after Admiral Sakazuki's return back here. Bastille is injured and won't be moving for a while. Hina, Akahend, and Shu told us that they will finally be graduating from Zephyr Sensei's training a month after. Dol informed, I decided to go to the newly established base at the New World G14. Shion San on the other hand, will probably be staying here for a while. So yeah, just wondering. Smoker affirmed Flevance. Flevance. It's a country located in the North Blue. Smoker stated sternly, the doctors of Flevance recently announced the discovery of a strange disease, where a patient experiences blotching of skin, whitening of hair, and chronic pain until death. The statistics state that this disease is only found in Flevance, suggesting that the environment of Flevance may play a role in its manifestation. But judging by the flow of the current situation, the world government seemed to think that this disease is contagious. Cancer narrowed his eyes, so the world government is already on the case. What's the purpose of your visit there, then? The contradiction arises from the fact that the head of the Flevance Doctor Union, Dr. Trafalgar, reasoned that this disease cannot be contagious. Smoker said, and I find it likely that as the disease progresses, the world government will come to place this country under quarantine. The civilians will essentially be neglected to their deaths. Shion shook her head adamantly, if the disease is contagious, then that is the best option that the world government has. But what if it isn't contagious in the first place? Smoker reasoned, the civilians will be left to die, especially when we consider that Flevance is a land incapable of producing edibles. True, Joan, upon thinking, nodded in agreement. Oh, whatever, good luck with that disease shit. Listening alone makes me tired. Cancer then remarked, I too decided already to hunt down that dyer's barrels before he causes further harm. He's exited the new world through the calm belt, and if he managed to sail through, he should be at the North Blue Cancer stopped and blinked his eyes, guess my path overlaps with Smoker then. Smoker, however, didn't seem to be listening. Instead, he was dazing off at the tatami floor below, contemplating a different matter. Flevance, Dyer's barrels, along with other anomalies then, raising his head up and looking at Jion. He asked, Jion, you'll be staying here for a while, right? Jion nodded, yes. What about it? I have a favor to ask, which is, Smoker, while looking at Perona next to Dole, said, you see, there is a kid named Caller on my ship bang. Quite impressive, don't you think? Said Robin as she laid down a pistol and looked at me, sharpshooting with a pistol of all types. And speaking of weapons, a firearm isn't my sole suit. At the next moment, two arms simultaneously bloomed from Robin's shoulders. Watch, smoker. Two arms gripped onto the swords that lied on the side and swung them in an exquisite manner. While they freely slashed the empty air, Robin's original arms held onto two pistols. Bang bang. Robin placed the weapons down and retracted her bloomed arms. Then, she looked at Smoker with a stoic face. What do you think? Impressive. Smoker, to his amusement, saw that Robin's eyes held an excited gleam. An 11-year-old girl. Being stronger than an average marine who's received training, your efforts paid off Robin. Robin, upon hearing Smoker's compliment, turned away from Smoker. Good, Smoker saw a slight blush on her cheeks and chuckled, before, now I can assassinate. Bloodbath? Graveyards. Phew phew phew. Sweat dropping upon hearing the dark statement. Well, a young girl acting innocent before backstabbing her victim Smoker said dryly, sounds like a plan. You've grown a tad smarter, Smoker. Ignoring Robin's comment, Smoker stood up. He then motioned Robin to follow. It's already night. Time to leave. They were currently in the basement of the training facility that Zephyr used for the training of his pupils. Though Robin's rank didn't permit her to enter this training facility, Smoker was a vice admiral now, the officer who had the authority to utilize all built-in systems of the Marineford. Smoker gently opened the exit for the two of them to leave. However, Smoker then stopped, as he saw Zephyr leaning against a wall with his arms crossed. Smoker raised an eyebrow. Zephyr San, I thought you went to sleep. Hey, wild speculation there. Smoker, Zephyr replied casually, before shifting his eyes at Robin behind Smoker, disregarding that. I came to see that girl's performance by chance. What's her name? Arobi. Why, Arobi? Zephyr leaned down and looked at Robin with excitement. Do you want to be my disciple? Sorry, Robin said in confusion, before gazing at Smoker questioningly. Smoker, who too seemed caught off by Zephyr's sudden offer, shrugged. That devil fruit ability of yours, along with your dexterity and multitasking capability, 
I see a great potential there. Zephyr exclaimed with certitude. Though it may be hard to grow you as much as that white-haired brat over there. Roby, it is too wasteful for you to spend your time out in the sea. Hum. Smoker actually liked the idea. Cannon is not absolute, and I may come to encounter a strong foe, such that I won't be able to cover for Robin. Building experience under me is better than the training that an average marine soldier receives. But when it comes to Zephyr's training Smoker grinned, for it was obvious as to which choice was more beneficial for Robin. Arobi, therefore, Smoker suggested to the hesitant girl, take it. Zephyr Sen is known as the second best instructor within the organization. Zephyr's eyes twitched second best. I mean, yeah. Smoker blinked as if saying an obvious thing. Gut Sensei is first, isn't it? If it's about beating up a child to a mashed potato, then oh yes he is. Zephyr, growing a tick mark on his forehead, shouted at Smoker a year ago. I asked him to demonstrate his style of training. And do you know what he did? He punched every single one of my disciples with armament haki hardening. They were bedridden for a week. A week. Smoker squinted his eyes in disbelief. Holy smokes, Zephyr-san. Your disciples are freaking weak as hell. How can they be bedridden for a week just from that? Fuck off. Zephyr growled. Before yanking Robin to his side, now that I think about it, you are no different than that crazy bastard. I can't let a promising marine like Arobi be ruined by your side. Robin sweat dropped. Uh, Smoker, though still confused by how Zephyr's disciples were bedridden for a week, nonetheless asked Robin. So, what do you think? Robin, humming in thought, then stated, I admit this is an opportunity that I never expected to receive. After all, Instructor Zephyr's reputation I too heard about it very well. Robin pursed her lips. Then, clenching her small fists with resolve, she looked at Zephyr and nodded, Please take me as your disciple, Instructor Zephyr. Zephyr grinned, Welcome, Trainee Arobi. In the darkness, Zephyr's grin seemed frightening. He held his huge hand out and rubbed Robin on the head. In Smoker's eyes, Zephyr seemed like a child molester. WHO do you think I am? White bastard, Captain Woman, I see a pirate ship ahead at 12 o'clock. Within one marine ship that sailed through the harsh sea, a watcher shouted in his lungs, and judging by the Jolly Roger, it's the watcher seemed terrified. Trembling from fear, he stood with his jaw agape in shock, before screaming, T the dead end pirates Captain Woman, a bald male marine officer with the letter W engraved on his head, gritted his teeth and shouted, all marines, prepare to engage the marines on the deck gulped. However, they held on to their firearms with determination, placing their trust in Captain Woman's decision. And in no time, one pirate ship appeared in front of their naked eyes. However, something seemed wrong. Ripped sailing masts. Broken railings. The pirate ship wasn't in a normal state, and skeletons. Captain Woman whispered as he held his hand up, keep your guard up, but don't fire. Upon sailing closer to the pirate ship, the marines came to the side of a horrifying scene. There was no survivor at all but skeletons only. Captain Woman carefully stepped onto the pirate ship. Carefully walking on top of a messy deck that creaked every time he took a step, Captain Woman eventually stopped in front of one skeleton. That was wearing a captain's hat. So he really died? Captain Woman whispered dead end Frankenstein. Wanted for 180 million Beely. Judging by your current state, you must have died at least months ago. To think you, a man who used to be hailed as the greatest doctor in the world, would meet your end like this Captain Woman, then turn back to his soldiers and ordered, notify the Marineford immediately. Dead end Frankenstein. The death of this man wasn't a normal event. He was just your average pirate who sailed in the new world. However, at the same time, a skilled doctor who was the user of Opop fruit. Therefore, his death meant 5 billion beerly. Pirate, Marine, or whoever you may be, the world government will purchase the Opop fruit for 5 billion beerly. The release of Opop fruit back out to the world. And the world government was drooling to take this fruit for their own. Kuahahaha reading down the paper report that detailed the world government's official statement. A bird human named Morgans laughed out loud. To think you would get this desperate for that one single fruit. Elders grinning shrewdly. Morgans revealed his excitement. So it is true then I assume Opop fruit. That devil fruit can really make one immortal. Huh. As the news coups and hired reporters busily worked around him, Morgans then threw away that paper and grabbed another one in front of him. Mate Shem. But unfortunately, you got a contender, dear elders. Morgans said to himself, Kuahaha. That it he finally moved after years of dormancy to Morgans. Seven billion Beely for Opop -op Fruit. One billion goes to you for the advertisement. Kuahaha Morgans jumped in joy before crazily running around the busy room. What shall the next title be? The whereabouts of the doctor's dream fruit no no to bland. Death of the world's greatest doctor nope. That's not the key AHA Morgans turned to a reporter next to him and shouted in anticipation. Here it is. The title of our next newspaper shall be, Morgan spread his wings wide open. The race for the forbidden fruit, one reporter muttered in response. 
that doesn't sound right, Kuahaha get back to your work, fellas Morgans wasn't in a condition to listen. January 1st, 1506 New Year. New start, Smoker muttered while holding onto a slip of paper, along with the new set of problems. He was currently sitting in the port, and by his side, there sat a blonde cancer. Hey, at least we are aware of them, Cancer shrugged better than being oblivious. Hey, true, Smoker chuckled before reading through the paper. It read, bring rice crackers from Rubik Island when you return, Ash Garp. Hung, Smoker hung thoughtfully. I haven't tried the rice crackers in North Blue yet, have I? Then, Smoker and Cancer noticed a small shadow that extended from the back. Turning back, they found an orange head teen with X-shaped scar on his chin, X-Drake, looking at them solemnly. X-Drake pointed his finger at Cancer, you. Cancer raised an eyebrow, Daffic, kid. I heard that you're going to hunt Dyer's barrels. And, take me with you. Cancer, out of annoyance, scratched the back of his head, why should I? X-Drake, clenching his fists fight, shouted aggressively, I'm going to punch some sense into that bastard myself. Smoker, eyeing Drake's physique, noticed that this teen was trained. However, whether he could be of use to Cancer was a completely different question. Cancer, in response, simply raised a middle finger to Drake, how about no, emo. Standing up from his spot, Cancer tapped Smoker on the shoulder, Welp, I'm heading out now, buddy. Sire in the North Blue. Smoker and Drake watched as Cancer whistled while casually walking toward his ship nearby where all his subordinates boarded and readied for the departure. Damn it. Drake, exhibiting frustration, cursed as if that's going to make me give up. Smoker who too stood up from his spot, then watched with amusement as Drake managed to sneak himself in at the back of the departing marine ship through the use of a rope that he found from who knows where. Smoker initially wondered if he should stop Drake, However, he then remembered that he underwent the exact same experience during his training. Mare therefore, Smoker concluded, shouldn't be that dangerous boo. Just then, a feminine voice intruded from Smoker's back. Smoker turned back and found a pink-haired woman, Hina, looking up at him with a blank face. Surprised, Smoker chuckled, very. He then took a step back and saw that Hina was wearing a red suit and more importantly, a justice coat around her shoulder. Congratulations, Smoker exclaimed with a grin, Ensign Hina. Well, Hina's just begun. Hina returned with a smile of her own, but thanks Smoker. January 1st. Today, Hina's finally graduated from Zephyr's training and officially took another step to her marine career. And also, then, Hina suddenly saluted Ensign Hina, hereby reports that she is now allocated to the 31st Division under the command of Vice Admiral Smoker. Smoker, for once, found himself dumbfounded. Why? Duh, Hina, dropping her serious demeanor, nudged Smoker's arm playfully. Hina is your subordinate now. Ha! Huh. Smoker, though caught off guard, smiled, welcome aboard then, Hina. The two of them casually began to walk back to Marineford Town. And also, Hina ate a devil fruit. Oh, cool, Smoker exclaimed with his hands in his pocket. Then, his eyes widened upon realizing what he just heard. Wait, what? It's called Cage Cage Fruit. Sounds perfect for a Marine, doesn't it? Well, Smoker replied dryly. You might have been better off without that fruit though. Don't underestimate the power of Paramecia, Mr. Loger. It seemed that Black Cage Hina was now official. A week after January 8th, 1506 rations. Check. Weapons. Check. Navigation. Check. Ship's condition. Check. Any other concerns? All is good. At the port stood a marine warship, ready to depart at any time. The marine soldiers stood still with their determined eyes facing their front. Senna's pink, though filled with a complicated mix of emotions, replicated the acts of those soldiers. Meanwhile, Aramaki and Rosanate were checking for any anomaly prior to the departure. That's Lieutenant Aramaki. He's the forest human, having eaten the forest forest fruit. As for that blonde man, he's Warren Officer Rosie or Rosinante, whichever you prefer. He's the soundless human, having eaten the calm calm fruit. Smoker, on the other hand, was introducing his division to Hina, and that man with sunglasses. He's Chore Boy Senor Pink, previously a pirate who's currently become a marine as a way of atonement. Hina understood. Hina nodded with her arms crossed. Oi, Smoker-san, we're good to go. Then, Aramaki approached and grinned at Smoker, and also, who's this over here? Hina saluted Aramaki in a monotone. Hina is Ensign Hina. Pleased to meet you, Lieutenant Aramaki. Rahahaha, the feeling's mutual. She's the cage human, Smoker added on with a chuckle. Behind Aramaki stood Rosanante who bowed at Hina. Pleased to meet you, Ensign Hina. I'm Warrant Officer Rosanante, and I look forward to working with you. Hina nodded, same over here. All right then. Smoker then walked forth, gazing at the horizon that lied ahead of them. As you already know, we'll first cross the Red Lion and enter the New World prior to sailing through the Calm Belt. Our destination is Flevance within the North Blue. Is everything clear? Yes, sir. Then set sail. Smoker's mind was full of optimism that he will prevent the tragedy of Amber Lead Syndrome.
But, little did he know, that there was someone watching him from afar. Flevance, atop one roof of Marineford, where was one orange-haired Marine officer Admiral Blaze gazing at the departing Marine ship. Flevance, hem yes, sounds troubling. Blaze muttered, world government already discovered that the cause of that unknown disease, is the accumulation of amber lead over generations. This information was hidden in order to extract the adequate amount of amber lead from the mine for the greater good. But that smoker? Smoker's feet's up until now, with whom he was close to, and of what kind of ideal smoker possessed Blaze, as long before deduced, that smoker was a dangerous fellow. Two problems lie with smoker's intervention in Flevance. One, the fall in the productivity of Amber Lead Extraction. Two, the possibility of him revealing the world government's neglection of Flevance. Either way, there is no benefit for us at all. Blaze, forming a slight frown, stood up. Then, he raised up his wrist, where a mini Den Den Mushy lied, before speaking into it. Hock, there came no word out of the Den Den Mushy. However, Blaze knew that the call was connected to the other side. Assault Vice Admiral Smoker and his division before they managed to enter the calm belt. Ensure that he and Warrant Officer Rosie remain alive. But you may do whatever you want to do with the rest. Am I clear? Blaze said coldly. Slave. Yes. Roger that. Then, the call was cut. Blaze, lowering his arm back down, looked up and gazed at the blue, peaceful-looking sky above. Bull, tiger, rabbit, goat, monkey, pheasant, dog, pig, mouse, horse, snake, and dragon. Such are the animals that an admiral receives as a codename. Blaze whispered, however, no admiral has ever received dragon as a codename. After all, the only dragons in this world are the celestial dragons the gods who govern this world into that of an order. When looked closer, one would find the absolute madness in Blaze's eyes. Looking at the sky with deranged faith, he said in glee, all for the glory of the sky. At present, there were three types of marines. First, the believers of moral justice such as Kuzan. Second, the believers of absolute justice such as Sakazuki believing in the notion that marine is the very definition of justice. And finally, the believers of a different version of absolute justice. That, the world government alone is the only justice of this world. Admiral Blaze, he was the leading figure of the third type. January 11th. So far, there was no particular obstruction in our sail. And according to the pre-done calculation, we should be able to reach Flevance by 18th. Hina, sitting down on a wooden chair, remarked with a cold sweat, but... Hina does admit, the sea of New World really is different than that of the Paradise. Currently, after having crossed the red line through the upstream current, that the world government was in control of. We were sailing in the northern direction, and nearing the calm belt that lied between the New World and North Blue. Left of Storm is approaching at 11 o'clock. ASEA King is approaching from below. What's with this wind? It keeps changing its direction, with Smoker's division having never entered the New World before. They all seem tense, looking out for any potential hazard around them. Rahaha. So this is the New World, in contrast Aramaki seemed Phyllis, grinning at the dark and foggy weather ahead of them. What a manly sea. Manly. Senor Pink, who was impassively mopping the wet floor lazily, perked up upon hearing Aramaki's remark. He then looked around the surroundings and nodded in approval, hard-boiled. Silence. Just then, Rosinante's voice boomed throughout the ship. He, utilizing his fruit, effectively silenced all marine soldiers on the ship and prevented further chaos. Subsequently, he turned to Smoker. Now, Smoker-san, if you may. Smoker, who was sitting across Hina, stated casually, Chill, all of you. Yes, sir. And all marines fell silent with seriousness in their demeanors, while others acted as if this was normal. Hina, squinting her eyes at the sight, exhibited confusion. Are we were all of you acting? Hina asked. Aramaki, snorting in response, replied with his arms crossed, what acting? Can't you see how Smoker Sen just managed to calm them down with his charismatic speech? He literally spoke just one sentence Hina pulled on her hair. What speech splash? Then, the water suddenly splashed onto her from the wild sea, much to her demise. ECH? What a great start, Hina frowned and shook her drenched hair. Then, she snatched a snatched loaf of bread and nibbled it down aggressively. Smoker, Aramaki, and Rosinante looked at Hina's behavior with a deadpan, before turning to each other and shrugging, women. Yes, a typical woman. Don't try to understand them. It's impossible to do so. And just like this, the 31st Division seemed to be traveling without any issue. Upon sailing further, the sky began to clear, and the wild sea showed signs of calming down. Smoker, witnessing these changes, said, we're entering the calm belt now his eyes then flashed red as he abruptly turned to the back. Narrowing his eyes, Smoker raised his hand up, gesturing his subordinates to stop whatever they were doing. Raising his head up, Smoker then shouted to the watcher at the crow's nest, 6 o'clock, right behind us. Quickly take a look and report what you see. The watcher hurriedly complied to Smoker's order, turned around and looked at the stormy sea behind them through the binoculars. Then, said watcher began to sweat profusely with his eyes widened, before reporting loudly, T the pirates. 
There are three gigantic pirate ships traveling toward us. Oi, is this for real? Aramaki, frowning in displeasure, growled. Pirates hunting down the Marines A and judging by the Jolly Roger, they are none other than the Martini Pirates. Martini. One Marine whispered in horror. Martini as in Martini Hook T the Admiral Killer another started. Before widening his eyes in realization, B but wait, he's our ally now, isn't he, Martini Hook, a warlord. And also, Smoker, watching as three pirate ships entered his sight, muttered, the murderer of Dalmatian and Masterson. But the question was, why would a warlord, who's officially allied with the world government, follow him and his division? Smoker tensed his body up, believing that something was going wrong here. Then, Smoker raised his hand up and clenched his hand into a fist. In correspondence, all marine soldiers raised up their rifles, ready to shoot down the approaching pirates any time. In the middle of this harsh sea, they managed to pinpoint our exact location. Hina said darkly, and regardless of their title as warlord, they are pirates in essence. Whatever they may be here for, I don't have a good feeling about this. Hina's thought was in a line with smokers. Now, three pirate ships were right in front of the marine warship. Each one of them being larger than the marine warship, contained at least a hundred pirates. Within the middle ship, there stood one middle-aged man with a captain's hat on his head, who overall resembled Jack Sparrow in terms of appearance. This man twirling a cutlass around the tip of his index finger, then spoke up with his eyes exhibiting a hollow gleam. Why, it is nice to meet the infamous White Hunter. This man bowed emotionlessly while snatching his cutlass by its hilt, as you probably are aware of. I go by the name Hawk. His other hand, which wasn't occupied with his cutlass, was holding onto a bottle of alcohol instead. He then raised up the bottle of alcohol and muttered cheers, before gulping the liquid down all of a sudden. What a strange crew thought Smoker as he inspected the Martini Pirates. Unlike the usually loud and crazed pirates, these ones were silent and gloomy. Regardless, he discarded such thought. I have no idea why you decided to chase us down, but I'll be honest, Smoker said with a dangerous smile. I'm currently debating whether to kill you or not. You see, he then raised his hands up as if weighing a balance. On one side, you are a warlord. However, on the other side, you are the murderer of my colleagues. A hard choice to make, don't you think? Ha! Huh. Hook in response chuckled. And in contrast to these two smiling men, the atmosphere was getting intense. The marines instinctively felt that the pirates harbored a malicious intent and tightened their grips on their weapons. Subsequently, Hook's face changed from that of amusement to a cold expression. He threw away the empty bottle to the sea, and just as the splashing noise was heard, clang, Hina found herself frozen. Right next to her face was Smoker's Shusui, which blocked Hook's haki imbued cutlass from beheading her. I won't ask the reason behind your attack, Smoker stated with his eyes flashing coldly, but consider your lives gone pirates. Smee, Hook, while retracting his cutlass back, said as he looked at the marines who surrounded him in an instant, do it. Just when Hook said so, from point-blank range, a cannonball was fired. Smoker, immediately appearing in front of the cannonball before it struck his ship, deflected the cannonball up to the sky. Boom. And simultaneously, Hook, using that brief moment of time, appeared right by Smoker's side, and pushed later off of the ship, essentially separating the two of them from the rest of the marines and pirates. Smee, a muscular man wearing a red stocking cap on his head, then shouted, attack the pirates, each holding a different kind of weapon, jumped to the marine warship with malicious intent. The ones holding firearms stood behind and began firing. ECH Hina let her guard down. Hina, ashamed. Hina snarled while putting on her black gloves. Then, she gazed at the pirates murderously. Rosinante flipped out a pistol from his holster, before whispering, Khan. All Marines, Aramaki, with veins popped out of his forehead, ordered, Don't let those scums of the sea dirty our ship. Wipe them clean before Vice Admiral Smoker returns? Yes sir. Bang bang. Clang. And thus began, the chaotic war on the borderline between Calm Belt and New World. Strange. Smoker, while standing in the air with Shusui in his right hand, remarked, You are one enigmatic fellow. Martini Hook. Smoker gazed at his foe, who was standing in the air just like him. First, the fact that you are capable of using Gepo. Second, the plan to separate me from the rest of them just back then. It was as if you expected that I would be the sole one to react against it. That you were aware of our strengths. And third, Smoker bickered at the man while placing Shusui on his shoulder. Did you really kill Admiral Anastasia yourself? From the start, when Smoker sensed Hook through the use of his observation haki, Smoker came to inquire about this. In comparison to the weight behind the notorious title of Martini, there stood a man whose strength was estimated to be around the same level as Smoker. That Admiral, she was the one strong enough to be called the Iron Blood Empress by the common folks. And even with the consideration that she was senile, there was no way that you could have even landed a strike on her. Clang. At the next moment, Hook, without responding to Smoker, suddenly appeared on Smoker's left and slashed his cutlass, to which Smoker countered with his Shusui once again. And this time around, you used sorrow, commented Smoker. 
Clang clang clang. Hook performed exquisite swordsmanship by relentlessly playing his cutlass towards Smoker. However, Smoker, easily seeing through Hook's attacks through his physical capability, managed to parry every single strike that Hook threw. Clang. Then, Smoker's Shu Sui landed on Hook's abdomen. Instead of penetrating, a clanging noise was generated. It was primarily due to Hook coating his abdomen with armament Haki. However, Smoker muttered, Tekai. Huh? Hook, not exhibiting any emotion, stepped back from Smoker. Then, he finally opened his mouth. I admit, your strength is far above what I anticipated. Then, Smoker found his eyes narrowed as Hook's cutlass was then encased by an orange-yellow colored substance. Then lets up the game. I suppose, said Hook while staring at Smoker with his hollow eyes. Armament Haki emission. Huh. Smoker took in a deep breath quite dangerous. Ha! Huh, from Smoker's breath, white smoke was exhaled. Though his outward appearance didn't change whatsoever, the internal components of his body were morphed into smoke ultimately reducing his body weight by a drastic amount. Same A Kaiken. Ghost body. Current Smoker, unfortunately, hasn't mastered the emission of Armament Haki. Regardless of the fact that Hook's strength was far below what the world believed it to be, he wasn't a foe whom Smoker could deal with ease. Emission clashing head-on is an idiotic choice to make. Smoker sheathed Shusui, to which Hook raised his eyebrow upon. Then, swoosh he vanished from Hook's view. Hook, whose eyes subsequently flashed red, turned and slashed his cutlass vertically. Swoosh. However, Mr. Smoker, who appeared right in front of Hook, morphed the left portion of his body into smoke, and had the cutlass pass through the gap between smokes. Smoker, whose eyes also exhibited a similar red gleam as Hook's did, then thrust his finger forward. White gun. Clang. Smoker's attack was stopped by the armament Haki coating on Hook's chest. However, Smoker already expected this to happen. At the next moment, poof. The white gun blasted from Smoker's finger exploded into a large volume of white smoke completely engulfing Hook and obstructing his vision. Hook, immediately swinging his cutlass horizontally, dispelled the smoke away from him. But by the time he did so, Smoker was holding a swelling sphere of black smoke on top of his palm, which he then threw. Black ball. Boom. Hook, shielding his body by placing his cutlass in front of him, grimaced as the intense pressure of the explosion knocked him back. However, he quickly regained his bearing and took in a deep breath, before sending out a vigorous slash to Smoker, who appeared on his back. Swoosh. The slash severed Smoker into two. However, he then melted into a mass of white smoke. Hook then realized that he's been tricked. But it was too late by then, for White Blow. Smoker's Haki imbued fist found its way to Hook's exposed face. Boom. Hook was knocked down from the sky, splash, into the still water of the calm belt below. Ra, and just after a loud screech was heard from deep down, before a huge sea king jumped out of the water with its fangs open, ready to bite Hook down in an instant. But Hook, not letting it from doing so, Rumbo, then slashed his cutlass multiple times within a second, instantly shredding the sea king into countless pieces. Splash, splash, splash. As the pieces of Sea King fell back into the sea, Hook wiped the trail of blood on his lips and glared at Smoker, you'll have to try harder than that. White Hunter then, Hook noticed an anomaly in which the sky that was supposed to be bright and sunny, now had all clouds joined all together. They madly swirled right above Hook, and a trail of smoke was found to be connecting. Said Cloud Storm, with Smoker's raised up right hand. Oh, Smoker stated, I already am. Then, Hook saw a huge serpent of white smoke descending from the Cloud Storm to where he stood. Grimacing, he held onto his cutlass with two arms, and met the huge serpent, white serpent. Lash Neverland Boom. Upon collision, the extreme volume of smoke spread over the vast surface of the nearby sea. And within this smoke, swoosh, boom, swoosh, swoosh. Smoker and Hook, they again were engaging one another in extremely fast-paced physical combat whether by fists or by the cutlass. However, Smoker, while slamming his fists on Hook's Haki reinforced body, managed to dodge every single slash that Hook swung, and then tap. Hook felt Smoker's palm on his chest and subconsciously widened his eyes. Black impact. That's what Hook said to his crew members before launching the attack, cough. Hook's eyes turned white from the pain. From his mouth, smoke exited. His whole body trembled, and his chest, now visible with his attire having been shredded by Smoker's attack, was bloody to look at. But then, Hook gritted his teeth while raising up his cutlass once more. On his sword, the emission of armament Haki unstably flickered but didn't show any sign of yielding. Smoker, not letting his guard down, propelled himself toward Hook at an incredible speed. Swoo Hook saw that Smoker, while flying toward him, was engulfed by the swirling mass of white smoke. And when it dispersed, Hook saw in total 12 identical Smokers, all about to attack him at the same time. Hook, in response, slashed his cutlass and sent forth a wide arc of sword wave, fairy dust swoosh. The sword wave slashed through all 12 of them at once. Eleven then dispersed, 
However, the final one the original smoker didn't seem injured, for he purposely separated his waist and let the sword wave fly through the empty gap. Smoker now stood right in front of Hook once more. Hook quickly retracted his cutlass and slashed through Smoker again. But Smoker predicted this move also, morphed the area of impact into smoke, and dispersed it such that the cutlass cut through the empty air. Swoosh. And then, the time seemed to slow down in Hook's eyes as Smoker's right fist coated in armament haki and engulfed by the blazing black smoke approached his face. Black blow. Boom. The air exploded and Hook coughed out a substantial amount of blood as he was blasted back without control. His body wasn't able to handle this stress no more, and he let out a scream in pain, AHHHHH White Snake. At the next moment, Smoker, having traveled a far distance in an instant, was next to Hook, who was bound by the snake of white smoke that cord around him. Keck. Kirk, uncaring of the fact that the pirate choked, Smoker seemed shocked. His eyes, gazing at Hook's back, saw the hoof of the soaring dragon, also known as the Mark of Slavery. That celestial dragons engrave on their slaves. Cough cough huff huff Hook, though consumed by the pain, formed a bloody smile. Huff huff surprised. Ha! Huh. Smoker, with his head lowered, chuckled darkly, Admiral Anastasia, Dalmatian, and Masters in their deaths were the world government's doings. Thud. Thud. In the middle of the battlefield, pirates felt fear as their crewmates fell down with a thud, by the cause unknown. One by one, they silently fell. And when looking closely at their corpses, pirates saw a bullet that penetrated each one of their heads. Calm. Rosinante aimed his pistol at one pirate who was about to stab his sword into the chest of one marine soldier. Then, he shot the bullet at the pirate. There was no sound upon firing. There was no sound upon the bullet driving into the temple of the pirate. There was no sound as the pirate screamed in horror. Then, said pirate lost his strength and fell on the deck. Thud. The pirates, witnessing such a scenery, shuddered. They, recognizing Rosinante as the utmost threat, began to charge toward the warrant officer at once. However, they were then forced to stop as one pink-haired ensign, Hina, stepped in. Where do you think you're going? Hina hasn't played enough yet. Hina cracked her knuckles as she slowly walked to the crowd of pirates, before dashing at the next moment. One pirate then opened his mouth, trying to scream fire, to his crewmates. However, he then found a bullet on the side of his head, and no noise was produced from his throat. Thud. Just when said pirate fell, Hina was standing right in front of the frontmost pirate. The pirate was about to raise up an axe that he was holding. But before he could do so, Hina's arm unnaturally bent and phased through his torso. Hey! The pirate expressed confusion as Hina's arm was now behind him. Now, there was a metal construct that tied him up, making him unable to move his arms. Hina then tilted her head to dodge a bullet that was shot in her way. Subsequently, she kicked the nearby pirate, and her right leg too bent and phased through the pirate, leaving that pirate with a tight metal cuff-like construct. Ha ha! Getting hit by a girl. Ha ah, then, one among the tied-up pirates smiled in pleasure with a blush on his cheeks. Fuck off. Hina, expressing disgust, kicked the pirate away from her, and this pirate, rolling across the bloody deck, came to a stop in front of one man's feet. The pirate looked up and saw the man with sunglasses Senor Pink staring at him in disapproval. You're a disgrace to men, said Senor Pink, before smashing his foot onto the pirate's face. True man doesn't moan when hit by a woman. The marines busily supported their officers, clashing against the other pirates, and sniping enemies down primarily, to prevent them from shooting another cannonball at point-blank range. And, at the leftmost pirate ship, there stood two men, Aramaki and Smee, preventing each other from interrupting the battle between their underlings. Boom. The air trembled as the two men met fist to fist. With no one having a notably stronger strength, they struggled at equal strength. Ha! Huh. Smee then frowned as roots emerged from Aramaki's arm and began crawling onto his. Immediately thrashing them away, Smee bickered, a freaking devil fruit user yet again. Rahahaha. And, Aramaki, grinning while rolling his shoulder, then punched for the second time. Smee, sidestepping to dodge Aramaki's fist boom, managed to slam his haki-imbued fist onto Aramaki's exposed face. However, said punch didn't manage to push Aramaki by a single step even. Aramaki, simply turning his head sideways and spitting blood out, reformed his grin before slamming his fist onto Smee's exposed abdomen. Smee, though leaking blood from the corner of his mouth, didn't exhibit any sign of pain. Instead, he smashed another fist onto Aramaki's arm, before the latter could stretch out the roots around his arm. Aramaki, immediately after, raised up his other hand with its palm facing Smee, Morningwood. Boom. A shocking sight occurred, where Aramaki's wood, which was fired at a point-blank range, was destroyed into pieces by Smee's punch. Aramaki, for once, expressed a surprise. A horrible application of devil fruit. Smee snorted while crossing his arms and blocking Aramaki's kick. Boom. A horrible application. Aramaki raising an eyebrow. 
then raised up two hands at once, dual mourning would Smee, rotating his body such that two trunks of wood passed through his front and back, then took in a deep breath before, boom, smashing two woods into pieces. Smee gazed at Aramaki coldly, only an idiot would fall for an attack as stupid as that. A wooden trunk fired from your palm you're far too weak for the sea, Marine. Aramaki then narrowed his eyes, are you sure about that? Smee, ignoring Aramaki's statement, stepped forth or tried to, but was unable to do so. Confused, he lowered his eyes and saw tree roots, vines, and plants the pirate ship that they stood on top of was now entirely covered by vegetation. How? Smee's eyes widened in disbelief, and Aramaki grinned, those pieces of wood, of course. Smee, imbuing his entire body with armament haki, ripped and destroyed the vegetation around his feet. However, they relentlessly coiled around him over and over again, and eventually overwhelmed him from head to toe. Rahahaha, it seems that an idiot was you. Aramaki remarked, a complacent fool who deduced his strength to stand above that of his foe right from the start. Smee, utilizing his physical strength to its maximum capability, thrashed. However, the combined strengths of these plants and trees were beyond belief, he was completely trapped without any hope. Then, Aramaki's hands morphed into multitudes of the tree roots that previously failed to penetrate through Smee's skin. Smee, seeing this, stated with a glare, and so what? A weakling, who isn't even capable of manifesting Haki, is incapable of injuring me, and since when was I unable to do so? At the next moment, Smee's eyes widened as the tips of those roots turned black, indicating the armament Haki. Hardening, Aramaki, walking toward the entrapped Smee, growled with a grin on his face, haven't you learned not to underestimate your enemy throughout years of piracy? Smee gritted his teeth, no matter. Your haki still pales in comparison to mine, Puck Puck. Smee's eyes became bloodshot as Aramaki's roots stabbed through his haki imbued skin without much resistance. Then, they began to bulk up, absorbing the fluid and energy out of Smee. Smee visibly shrank, and his skin became wrinkled, losing strength in his body. The hardening of armament haki faded away. And just after boom, the critically injured hook came in flying and smashed into the shrunken and bound form of Smee. Subsequently, Smoker landed next to Aramaki without a single wound on his body. The captain hooked Smee, unable to believe the state of his captain, shouted in horror. W what in the hell is going on his screen, entering the ears of everyone on sight, caused the ongoing battle to halt. The Martini Pirates, who too saw the brutal wounds on Hook's body, expressed fear and disbelief. Half Half Hook, not being in a condition to respond to their cries, simply breathed as the blood continued to leak out of his body. Celestial Dragons, World Government, Mark of Slavery, Martini Hook, and walking toward this man was Smoker, who grimaced. He, now standing right in front of the fallen Hook, leaned down and asked the man in certitude, you were working for the World Government from the start. Everyone belonging to Martini Pirates stiffened upon hearing Smoker's words, as in, before he became a warlord. Aramaki, unable to believe what he just heard, whispered to his superior, Hina, Rosanate, Senor Pink, and other Marines also they wondered if they heard it wrong. Hook, looking up at Smoker with exhausted eyes, formed a hollow smirk. It's too late to hide it, I suppose. Hook could tell. Based on his state, he didn't have much time left. Raising his gaze higher and staring at the sky that returned to a clear and sunny one, Hook reminisced, at the age of five, I was enslaved. Thud, thud, thud. One by one, the Martini pirates sat down on their spot and dropped their weapons. This battle the victor has already been decided. Tormented and tortured, I desired freedom. I desired to sail in the sea and go on an adventure without any restriction. Then, on one day while I was brought down along with my master, I seized the chance and managed to escape. But little did I realize that my freedom was intended, and that I was still within their grasp. Hook's trembling hand slowly reached his head, slavery or death. I was forced to choose between two choices whether to continue living as their dogs or to die. I chose the former option, and here I am today. Hook coughed with a vivid fatigue, before chuckling, a boring story, is it not? Meeting his eyes with Smoker once more, Hook spoke up. Then, White Hunter, I suppose that I'll give you one last reward for managing to avenge your fellow Marines. Hook grinned for the first time, the one who killed Admiral Anastasia. It isn't me, but the leader of Cipherpole Aegis Zero, codenamed Piero, and his other known title is Boom. Smoker stiffened up his hook before he could finish his sentence, had his head blown up from the inside. A bomb was implanted in his head. Hina slowly whispered, which means that they've been listening from the very start. Boom, boom, boom. And that was just a start. Everyone in Martini Pirates. The heads began to blow up one by one. The blood was sprayed all over, and some weak walled marines, unable to bear the sight, began to vomit. Fuckards Rosanante, exhibiting a rage, quickly leaned down and inspected one headless corpse. He then discovered the hoof of the soaring dragon on the corpse's back, and clenched his fists so tight that they began to bleed. Boom. On four ships, every single pirate was found dead. Yet, the marines didn't exhibit joy. 
but horror instead. This was a trap smoker then realized. After all, they killed a warlord out of nowhere, and unlike the case of Doflamingo, there weren't any witnesses. The world government decided that I am a threat to them. And the reason they thought as such as Smoker clicked his tongue, Flevance. Suppressing his emotion, Smoker managed to speak up, clean up the shit. We're getting out of here as quickly as possible. Smoker placed his hand on his forehead, feeling a headache. Swaying slightly, Smoker slowly walked into the inner part of the ship, leaving the still shocked marines by themselves. Freedom. Huh. Did you realize what you've caused? Blaze, while genuflecting in front of one Den Den Mushy had his expression darkened. The Den Den Mushi, which had a white mustache attached on its face, expressed a deep frown reflecting the expression of five elders. My apologies. The Den Den Mushi spoke, such was my plan also. However, Blaze said grimly, I was being monitored for by Kuzin for a couple of days. The presence of Baird in the knockdown, and the subsequent announcement of Smoker's innocence in killing Doflamingo by the world government. Kuzan, after hearing the accurate progression of the event from Smoker's own mouth, came to suspect that the involvement of the world government in the Marine is much deeper than what he anticipated, and momentarily returned to the Marineford for his own independent investigation. Your Highness, the situation in Marine is currently flowing in a bizarre manner. Blaze then informed Smoker's act back in Sabadi Archipelago of preventing every single slave ship under Doflamingo's control from reaching the human auction shop induced a great change in the organization. The core of the younger generation, including Rear Admiral Joan, Commodore Bastille, Captain Cancer, and Lieutenant Commander Dole, followed Smoker's suit and began to willingly disrupt the balance of this world. At this rate, if Smoker were to reach Flevance and turn many Marines' attention to the case of Amber Lead Syndrome, the Marine may drift away from the value of absolute justice, with no way of return. The Den Den Mushi stated coldly, Yes, I am aware. Den Den Mushi narrowed its eyes at Blaze, Blaze raised his head up. With nothing but seriousness, he nodded, Yes, Your Highness. White Hunter Smoker, wanted only alive. One billion seven hundred million, Billy. One day, the world received the news regarding the defection of Vice Admiral Smoker, the leading figure of the Marine's new generation, who was anticipated to become an admiral in the future. Initially, they were shocked and expressed fear that a pillar of justice has turned against them. Then, upon reading the news carefully, their shock turned into confusion. The opinion split. Some praised Smoker for daring to do justice even with pressure of the world government. Some, on the other hand, criticized Smoker's brash act, saying that one man's ideal is not enough of an excuse to oppose the law of the world. Bam. And currently, in Sengoku's office, Gart was found full of rage, slamming said newspaper on Sengoku's desk. I will give you 10 seconds to answer me, of what the fucking hell this is. Garp's eyes blazed in a frightening manner. Sengoku, gritting his teeth, shouted back with an equal magnitude of anger. What else do you think it is? Your disciple, as soon as he earns the rank of Vice Admiral, goes out and kills a man affiliated with the world government. Sengoku expressed an exasperation. The Celestial Dragons and Five Elders all alike, they took Smoker's act as the sign of rebellion. Sengoku pointed his finger at Smoker's bounty poster. That bounty hasn't been discussed with us, not at all. Do you understand how ridiculous the circumstance has become? We're not in a situation to complain of his bounty, but to be thankful of the fact that he's been wanted only alive. Martini Hook is the plunderer of countless towns. Gut roared without a control. He brutally murdered many Marines. He interrupted hundreds of Marine operations. If a raising a malicious man such as him is not the justice, then what is Sengoku, in contrast to his usual calm self, seemed very close to exploding. He, opening his mouth, was about to let out another enraged remark. However, calm down, two of you. Suru, standing by their side, then spoke up with her arms crossed. Garp, I am aware that you are flabbergasted of the fact that your disciple is wanted. Sengoku, I am also aware that you are remorseful of the fact that Garp's disciple placed your son in danger. But both of you need to think critically, especially in the current situation. As two men turned to her, Suru continued for one, Smoker's destination was already decided prior to his departure. Yet, he came to encounter Martini pirates by chance in the New World. Then, a fight occurred. From this sequence of events, something seems fishy. Garp, while calming his breathing down, asked, and, by name value alone, as well as from what we've seen out in the public, Martini Hook's strength lies above that of Smoker's. In addition, Smoker's route was known to many in Marine, yet Hook's location was unknown. From my perspective, it wasn't Smoker who tracked Hook down, but rather, the other way around. Sengoku whispered with a frown, are you saying that a warlord allied with the world government attempted to kill Smoker and his division? That's the most plausible theory. And if we were to think with that as a basis, Suru closed her eyes and thought, Book received the information of Smoker's traveling route by someone in Marine. And this hasn't been the first time something like this happened. Suru revealed two sheets of paper and placed them on the table. Garp and Sengoku, gazing upon them, realized that they were the profiles of Dalmatian and Masterson, the deceased Marine officers of the past. After the victory over overflowing Sasaki, 
they were raided by the Martini Pirates. It seemed like a coincidence back then, but now that I think about it, the fact that Martini Pirates attacked them at the perfect timing, when they were wounded from the battle against Sasaki, seems too strange to be coincidental. A spy, in Marine. Sengoku, feeling a little nauseous from the current situation, sat back down in his seat. And furthermore, there is the death of Vice Admiral Saichar, said Tsuru. Sengoku, stiffening up from Tsuru's mentioning of Saichar, came to accept. Hook was the one who attacked Smoker. I'm going. Garp then said in a low tone, before turning around and starting to walk away. To where? Tsuru asked with her eyebrow raised. Garp, stopping momentarily and shifting his eyes at Tsuru, stated, To the place that I believe my apprentice will be at, Rubik Island. 1.7 billion Beely. Wanted only alive. But disregarding that, the fact that a bounty's been placed on him means an orange head man, Bayard, muttered with a light smile on his face that he's officially an enemy of Marine. Currently, he stood on top of his dock ship with his division, full ready to depart. On the left, there lied two more Marine warships, all ready to sail also. Those warships belonged to Onagumo and Tensei, the ones who witnessed Smoker's danger back in Knockdown. That little mongrel Onagumo snarled. I knew he would defect one day. Doflamingo wasn't a weak individual, but nonetheless a manageable one. However, Hook in contrast Tensei grimaced, the more we stall, the stronger White Hunter will get. The three Vice Admirals raised their hands up, ready to order their ships to depart. Just then, oi, a voice was heard from their back, interrupting their call. The three Vice Admiral turned, and came to see Bastille, a wounded man who was barely standing through the support of crutches. Where do you think you're going Dara? Bayard's eyes narrowed, judging by your nuance of speaking, you seem to be aware already. Bastille, gritting his teeth, shouted at his lungs, Smoker hasn't committed any wrong. Do you even have a strand of righteousness remaining in you? To blatantly begin the chase right after the release of his bounty poster Dara, Commodore, Onagumo, with his hands on his back, growled, have you lost your mind to exhibit such rudeness in front of your superiors? Bastille, not daring to bow, growled back, if said superiors are the mere dogs of the world government, then bang. However, Bastille's words didn't get to be completed as Onagumo shot Bastille on the shoulder with a pistol in his hand. A marine who doesn't comply to one's superior is a marine without any usefulness. Onagumo stated, rest in your bed and reflect on your attitude, Commodore. Bastille coughed out blood while falling to the ground. Finding his body has weakened, Bastille couldn't do anything but watch as three marine warships began sailing toward the distant horizon. Smoker Bastille thought before his consciousness faded away, just what is going on Dara. The weather in Calm Belt was sunny and clear, its sea below was still and unmoving, and without considering the presence of countless sea kings who harbored below, this area seemed mundane. Throughout this sea, one marine warship was found sailing at a rapid speed. On its deck, many marine soldiers stood their guard with nervousness and desperation written on their faces. And, at the inside of that ship, in commander's room, four marine officers, Smoker, Aramaki, Rosanante, and Hina were found sitting with dark expressions. On the table was a newspaper that they received an hour before, along with Smoker's bounty poster. This is ridiculous. We all know that it is. Martini pirates, they were the ones who attacked us. And after finding out that they were the world government slaves, damn it. Rosanante cursed, even if we left them alive, they would have reported the world government of how we got to know their secrets. Besides, leave them alive and let them conduct more wrongs. Wait, those wrongs are then the works of the world government UGHHH. Rosanante held his head and expressed his frustration. Hina, who was biting her lips with her hand placed on her chin, whispered, Is this the justice? Wanted and condemned for the act of punishing the criminals. This doesn't seem right. In the first place, why was the warlord system established? Hina confused. Aramaki, not speaking up, simply leaned back on his seat with his arms crossed. However, judging by the deep frown on his face, he was without a doubt in a foul mood. Smoker, who was in a deep thought, finally opened his mouth. This is the turning point. Smoker extended his hand and reached for his bounty poster. At one glance, our situation seems bleak. However, this was eventually meant to happen, with my ideal differing from the world governments. Gazing at his bounty poster, Smoker asked to his three fellow marines, What do you think of the absolute justice? Maniacal, said Hina. Stupid as hell, said Aramaki. Hypocritical, said Rosanante. Smoker was initially shocked by the reveal from Hook's death. However, he has calmed down now. Though the current situation wasn't good when looked from a narrow scope, Smoker viewed this as a chance to weaken the influence of the world government over the world. Hina. Do you remember what I said to you back then? Smoker, standing up from his seat, gazed at the outside through the small window in the room. Hina, looking at the same window, seemed to be reminiscing the long past when Smoker ate his devil fruit. I desire to save the helpless ones who are unable to do anything in front of ruthless power. Hina said with a light smile, Hina remembers. Then you must also remember, Smoker stated, when I said that justice is a set standard by the victors, 
Smoker momentarily closed his eyes and took in a deep breath. Aramaki, Rosanate, and Hina. The three of them were the ones he spent a lot of time with. And he knew that they were good people whom he could trust. So Smoker revealed his fangs the intent that he's been hiding for years. I will be blatant. I have been and still am planning to subvert the world. Smoker raised his hand up and pointed at the sky through the window. I aim to destroy the hypocritical union named the world government. This is the sole way to achieve my goal of helping the weak ones. Hina's lips quivered from a shock. On the other hand, Aramaki and Rosanante looked at Smoker with seriousness, remembering all kinds of evil doings of the world nobles that they've witnessed up until now. And here lies your choice. Smoker looked at each one of them and said, jump with me into one hellish experience, or leave this ship and claim that you were threatened by me. I won't condemn you for choosing the latter option, but know that once you step in, there is no stepping out. Upon Smoker's statement, no one answered. Instead, the three of them simply looked at Smoker with a death ban. Hina then said, Must you hear our answers to know us standing? Ha! Huh. Smoker grinned as the three of them looked back at him with nothing but loyalty. I suppose not. Walking to the side, Smoker reached out for the Den Den Mushi. Then, placing his free hand in his chest pocket, Smoker took out the white Den Den Mushi, the one that he received a year and some more ago. And upon calling, Smoker, I've been waiting for your call. A deep, masculine voice was heard from the Den Den Mushi. Smoker said in response, It's been a long time, Dragon. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.